Beneath the cloak of night, where shadows dance, there lies a hidden realm for those who crave the extraordinary. Welcome, Night Owls, to the ultimate sanctuary of the mysterious, the forbidden, and the spine-tingling. In this nocturnal haven, we dive deep into the world of cult content, where each frequency thrums with the vibrant pulse of the night. From the eerie echoes of cult radio to the mesmerizing glow of cult TV and movies, our journey is limitless. Drama, horror, thrillers, and cult science fiction, we have it all. So, night owls, get comfortable, relax, and prepare to ignite your senses for an exhilarating ride. With every passing hour, we guarantee to keep your adrenaline surging and your heart racing. Remember, the darkness is not just a time. It's a gateway to an unforgettable journey and experience. Welcome to the Cult Mania Show. The ultimate all-night haven for cult content fans. Night Owls, sit back as we deliver non-stop cult classics to illuminate your nights. Dive into endless hours of cult content designed to thrill you through the twilight hours. Night Owls. If you enjoy the night's ride, then subscribe and support us to ensure the magic of the night never fades. Join us, and let's keep the nocturnal madness thriving together. Welcome to the Cult Mania Show, where every shadow tells a story, and every night is a new adventure. see the man before who said he was O'Hearn's lawyer? Well, uh... But go ahead, speak freely. This is Mr. O'Connor, the Department of Justice. No, sir. I never saw Mr. O'Hearn's visit before. What did he look like? Well, medium, right? Tall. And he had a briefcase in his hand. <laughs> well, you see, Inspector, all I have to do is look for a man of medium height, tall, with a briefcase. Everybody in that jail must be deaf, dumb, and blind to let a thing like this happen. You can go. 
That gang's been knocking over small banks all over the city. I arrest one of the mob, get him identified. I put him in jail, and some killer walks in and murders him. Fine breaks I get. <laughs> Your blood pressure, Inspector. Now, what do you want? The mayor calling. More grief. Yes, Macy speaking. Yes, but I realize the light this puts the department in, but I'm doing everything that I can, but now I've got him on my neck. What's that? That's the report I received on the bullet they dug out of our hand. It's a 38 caliber automatic manufactured by Royal. We should have somebody check with the Royal people, then cover all the pawn shops in town. I want all the information I can get. What else can I do for you, Mr. O'Connor? Nothing, nothing, Inspector. Your department, if you'll pardon the observation, have been a trifle overzealous. Listen, Mr. O'Connor, you're from the Department of Justice. You've been after these bank bandits for weeks. You find O'Hearn is one of the gang. I pick him up. And I'd have made him talk, too, if this thing hadn't happened. That's just it. What else could you expect? I didn't ask you to pick up O'Hearn. See, you work one way, Macy. The Department of Justice works another. I'd have been able to find the men higher up if you hadn't jugged O'Hearn. They didn't dare let him talk. Crack this gang wide open. Why, he oh, can't get away with this. It'll cost you your job. Listen, you can't get away with this. Nobody in the United States can get away with it. We picked him off a train coming in from Frisco. Frisco? Certainly. I was getting off a train coming in from Frisco, minding my own business, and what happens? Forget it. Go ahead, see what you can do with him. Nope. Won't do any good now. He's your man, Inspector. You were O'Hearn's lawyer? Not this time. I was in Frisco on a case. Check on that. Yes, what sort of a case? A Chinaman by the name of Yang Fu. Shot his mother-in-law. Check on that. Did O'Hearn call your office? No, sir. Then who did O'Hearn call? <laughs> Maybe that was the Marines. Check on that. Get him out of here before I lose my temper. Hold him as a material yes, witness. Yeah, well, the United States will pay for this. You can't get away with this junk. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't get you. You wanted that lawyer picked up? Certainly, before you grabbed O'Hearn. Now that O'Hearn's dead, I can't do any good with his lawyer. All right, all right. Where do we go from here? Well, that, Inspector Macy, is for me to find out. So long. Hello. You look like the breakup of a hard winter. <laughs> do I? Yeah. Well, I feel like it. Move over, will you, Bobby? I couldn't keep my mind on driving after this mix-up. Why, what happened? I'll tell you. Well, we'll just about have time to meet Kay if you'll step on it. Where to, the airport? That's right. Macy's destroyed every lead we were working on. Brakes fixed. He stopped too short. Put it on the cop. Big lug. Hey, I didn't know you two were in town. Look who's here. Well, if it isn't the old candid photographer himself, how are you, Bob? Oh, I'm all right. Hey, look, the plane's in. Some of the fellas down at the office told me the Mogul of India was coming in. Thought I'd get a picture of him. <laughs> That's me, always on the spot. Hello? Yes? Hey, mister. No. I want to take your picture. I don't want my picture. Yeah, yeah, right here the against the wall. Uh, look, look, well, look. Don't go away. Wait here just a minute. Oh. Hey, what's the big idea, you... Darling, I'm so glad to see you. Hello, kid. I'm glad to see you, too. It's been ages since we've been together. <laughs> Seems like it, doesn't it? And you must be Bobby Reynolds. Alan's written about you so often. Surely not Alan. You mean he put that in writing? Oh, I may have mentioned it once or twice. <laughs> and now I want you to meet a friend of mine, Mr. Jerome Turner. Jerry, this is my brother, Mr. Alan O'Connor. How do you do, Mr. O'Connor? How do you do? And here's a 
My co-worker, Miss Reynolds. How do you do? How do you do? And what do you think? He's an author and he's going to write for the movies. What, no acting? Well, uh, not yet, but you never can tell. He was awfully nice to me on the trip. I've asked Miss O'Connor to have dinner with me tonight. And I thought possibly Couldn't that... we all have dinner together, Alan? Just a sort of celebration in honor of our all being together or something. I guess we could. What do you say, Bobby? Anytime you mention the word eat, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's fine. I don't care what you say. I don't want my picture taken. Mister... I don't want my picture taken. It'll only take a second. I'll, I'll have it set up here in a minute. I, I tell you, I'm not from India. I came from Jersey City where I got a fish marker. But I tell you, the desk oh, oh, Hey, oh, hey, oh, upstairs! Oh, oh. Help! Help! What's the matter, Bob? Having some trouble? Oh, that man. He says he's not the mogul. Who is he? Isn't he cute? <laughs> Don't you call him cute. I saw him first. This is Bob, the candid photographer, and this is Kay O'Connor, Alan's sister. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my poor Bob, the world's greatest ladies' man. <laughs> Some of the boys back east told me about it. Said it's one of the show places of Hollywood. Do the stars come here? I don't know about that. You see, I wanted to come here for atmosphere. Any line on the man who shot O'Hearn? Not a thing. The whole gang's to clear again. That leaves you right where you started from. Yep. Macy destroyed the whole line we were working on. Oh, well, let's forget business for a while. They make a cute couple, don't they? That sister of mine is a sweet kid, isn't she? Mm -hmm. She certainly is. It must be terribly thrilling to be a writer and get to go to all sorts of places after things to write about. Yes, I have been in a few tight places. Tell me about them. Some other time. You see, right now, I don't want to do anything but talk about you. Will you pardon me for a moment? I have a telephone call to make. Hurry back. I will. Isn't he wonderful? Now look, sweet, I don't want to spoil your fun. Oh, I know what you're going to say, and I won't let you. I know he's a stranger, but I like him. And there couldn't be anything wrong with him, so there. And that's that. I give up. <laughs> Hello, Carlotti. Hello, McGurn. When did you get in town? This afternoon. Nice little place you've got here. Thanks. Who are the people you with? Friends of mine. Make friends quick, don't you? Look, Carlotti, you brought me out here to do a job for you. What I do or who I talk to besides that is none of your business. All right, all right, skip it. As you've probably noticed in the papers lately, somebody's been knocking off a few little banks out here. Yeah, I did read something about it. We were getting tired of messing around with pin money. We want to expand a little. That's why I sent for you, my girl. Okay, I'm here. What's on your mind? Have you ever been in Lone City, Nevada? No, it's a small burg up in the desert, isn't it? Yeah. It's a small burg, all right, but it's all set for a big take. There's a WPA camp up there. I've been working on the Grand Tunnel. I had one of the boys up there getting the layout. There's a $40,000 payroll coming in there, July the 10th. What are you going to do about it? The only place they can keep that money overnight is in the post office. Yeah, they got a jail, a post office, and a store all hooked under one building. Well? I say, listen, any stoop can pick the lock on that jail. 
Say, you seem to know all about it. Sure, I'm the guy that did the chugging up for Joe. I was tossed into that jug a few weeks ago for being, oh, was it Joe, a vagrant? Yeah, that means a tramp. You see, the sheriff don't like tramps. Won't let them stay in town, except overnight. And they have to spend that in jail. I see. Then all we do is get picked up for vagrancy. Yeah. See you later, Carlotti. <laughs> Here comes your author, kid. Sorry to have been so long. It's all right. Hello. How about giving me a break, Bobby? Some people are always looking for trouble. Well, I can handle it. Come on. I wonder. <laughs> Got us all bottled up for the night? Sure. Can't nobody get in or out without being stopped. Well, good. I'm mighty glad you fellas are helping me out tonight. You know, I wouldn't feel so good having to look after all that money in the post office by myself. You don't need to worry. It's just safe there as it is in the state bank. Folks are going to be feeling mighty good around here in the morning when they start to paying it all out. <laughs> Boy, this ought to be a cent. I told you so. <laughs> Oh, hello, Sheriff. Thought you were going to forget us. Well, it's again my principle to be feeding tramps. But human beings is human beings, and human beings has got to be fed. Here's some grub for us. Oh, thanks, Sheriff. Hey, yeah, you're a good scout after all, Pard. Don't call me, Pard. I ain't no partner to any dead burn big ranch. Go on, eat that grub, and I'll be seeing the two of you in the morning. Okay, Sheriff. Pleasant dreams, Pard. <laughs> Tell the boys back east about this. They'll never believe it. What did I tell you? Well, 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 huh? That's the first time in my whole life that I've ever seen two tramps take the trouble to wash themselves. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Pard. Uh Here's your breakfast, and I told you not to call me part, didn't I? Oh, thanks for the grub, Sheriff. Well, I guess I've got to be letting you two tramps out this morning. How'd you sleep last night? Oh, swell. Fine, fine. Huh? That's funny. You're the first ones ever did. You know, I've been wanting to change these mattresses here for the last two years. Must be awful hard and lumpy, ain't they? Oh, no, they're all right, sir. Oh, yes, they are, too. Oh, no. Just look at them there bumps. How is yours? Oh, perfectly okay, Sheriff. Perfectly yeah, okay. Yeah, but it's the same way. It lumps all over it. You know, I'm going to change them mattresses right away. Every man's entitled to a good night's sleep. Oh, Sheriff, those mattresses are all right. Really, they are. If we could sleep on them, anybody could. By the way, when are you going to let us out of here? Well, you're free now, young fella. But just go on and eat your breakfast. Oh, thanks, Sheriff. Then what happened? Well, I, 
took a turn around the post office about midnight and found everything all right. Then come on back here to my office and sit down in my chair and I, well, I guess I kind of, kind of dozed off after that. When did you first notice the money was missing? This morning. After I let them two tramps out, I took a look around and, and it was gone. Was this cell door locked? Well, certainly. Like I always leave it. You lock that in the outside? <laughs> Well, it's good those two fellows is in jail last night. They're the only two people in town that had a perfect alibi. Exactly so, Sheriff. They had a perfect alibi. You notice these scratches around here? Why, a child could have picked this lock. Watch, and I'll show you how they did it. There. Well, I'll swan. Hmm. You see, Sheriff, it was a simple matter for them to pick their way out of here get the money in the post office, come back in the cell, and lock themselves in again. And as you say, they had a perfect alibi. They were safe in jail all night. Yeah, but how was I to know that? I remember asking them how they slept last night and going over to feel their mattresses. I thought they'd look kind of hard and bumpy in places. Of course, that couldn't have been the missing money. See, maybe it could at that. Well, what happened to them after that? Well, I drove them out to the edge of town because they couldn't get by the guards. And I give each one of them a buck apiece and told them to beat it and never to come back here again. Don't worry, they won't. You got any trace of them after that, officer? No, sir. They just seem to disappear the thin air. All right, all right. Well, let me know in Los Angeles if anything new turns up. I will. So long. You're positive you saw the couple pick up those two tramps? Sure. I had to go to Lone City for butter and eggs. I seen them with my own eyes. Thanks, Mac. That's all. Hello, kid. You find anything? I think so. A man and woman who rented a cabin here last night picked up a couple of hobos this morning coming from the direction of Lone City. Hmm. Those hobos couldn't have robbed the payroll. They didn't even look like they had car fare home. Notice their license number? Didn't have to. I always keep a record in my book. May we see it? Sure thing. Which cabin did they take? That one over there. Mind if I take a look around? No. I ain't cleaned it up yet if you're thinking of renting it. <laughs> Maybe some other day. There it is. Biggest life. Oh, fine. Wait a minute, Natal. I copy that down. Mr. and Mrs. Charles Endicott. Los Angeles. California. 7W7816. Get all the information? Yes, everything. Thanks very much for your help. We may drop around again someday. Our rates are cheap. Two dollars a night, clean sheets every day. <laughs> Thanks, I'll remember that. Come on, Bobby. Goodbye. Thank you very Bye. much. Goodbye. Goodbye. I got a pretty full description. See, I found something interesting myself. Look at that. Club call. Why, that's the place we were up the other night. You're a smart girl. Quiet, G-man. Carlotti? Sure, I know the place. But it never occurred to you that several thousand people go in and out of that club? That's right, Inspector. But does it seem logical that people frequenting expensive night spots and driving a big car would stay overnight in a cheap auto camp and pick up tramps along the way? You were asking me? I don't know. Well, it's a lead, that's all. Oh, what about their license number? We'll have a check made on that in no time. Anything else, Mr. O'Connor? Yes, one thing more. The bills used in that Lone City payroll were new and came from the Federal Reserve right here in Los Angeles. I've issued a general order to broadcast the serial numbers. Good. Then all we'll have to do is wait till one of them shows up. I sure hope it's the same mob that I'm after. I'd like to get my hands on them. You might. You don't work too fast. Good morning, Mr. Carlotti. Hello, Curtis. How's the banking business? Fine, fine. How's business with you? Couldn't be better. Will you check this over, please? There seems to be something wrong. All right, leave it here. You'll find quite a large deposit there. I'll pick up the passbook later. I'll attend to that. Say, I got a report on that Cadillac. The license plate is 7W7816. Belonged to the health commissioner. He reported it stolen a week ago. 
Say, if this case gets any screwier, you can look for me in the bug house. the Second National Bank and lay down a smoke screen. Oh, if I could just get... I'll take it. Hello, Inspector Macy's office. Fine, I'll be right out. Now what? They've got the Cadillac. What happened to the men in this car? Uh, ask him. He knows what it's all about. What's your name? Right. What do you know about this car? How many times do I have to tell everybody? I'll write it down next. You'll cut out the white scratch. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Tracy. I'll take care of this. Now, do you mind telling me what happened? Well, I own that farm over there. I was out back doing some work when I seen this here car drive up and three men jumped out of it. Where did they go? Well, my old Ford was in the lane, and before I knew what had happened, they snapped off the license plate, jumped in, drove away. How long ago was that? About a half hour. You sent out an order to pick up that Ford? Yes, sir. What did they look like? I don't know exactly, except one had a beard, and the man in the back seat was fat and wore a tweed sort of suit. What did the driver look like? Driver? Well, he was a little short fella, about five feet four. Well, thanks very much. Tracy, better take that car back to headquarters and go over it for fingerprints. Sure. No prints at all? No. We've been all over it, and there ain't a fingerprint on it. Well, that's a great help. Thanks, anyway. You're welcome. Hello, G woman. You going somewhere? Looks like we're up against the old blank wall again. Yeah. What'd you find out about the Carlotti lead? Nothing much. I was afraid of that. Well, where do we go from here? Search me. Try to reach those pedals, Bobby. I can't. Can you move that seat up? Nope, this is as far as it'll go. How tall are you, Bobby? Five feet four. Why, what's on your mind? Well, that farmer took a lot of pains to tell me the driver of this car was a little guy about five feet four. He couldn't have been. Look, I can't even reach these pedals. Yes, I see. Bobby, I've got a job for you. What is it, General? I want you to go out to that farm and see what you can find out. Tell Grimes, that's the old fellow that owns the farm, that you're a reporter. And listen, get me some photographs. Autographs? Never mind. <laughs> and I'm going to have every person that Second National Bank checked over. There was inside help on this robbery somewhere. Maybe we're not so bad off after all. Let's hope you're right. You're from the Hanson Burglar Alarm Company? Yes, sir. You were called here yesterday to check over the alarms? That's right, sir. Who requested the checkup? I don't know. I was told at the office to come here. Anything wrong with them? The alarms were in perfect condition. Nothing wrong with them. All right. Do you mind waiting a few minutes? Yes, sir. Mr. Harrington, do you know who ordered that checkup? I didn't. It must have been Mr. Curtis, our head cashier. He looks after such matters. Could you ask him to come in, please? Tell Mr. Curtis to come in. You're positive that repeated efforts are made to sound the alarm while the holdup was in progress? Certainly, Mr. O'Connor. A number of our employees tried to sound the alarm, but it didn't work. You wanted me, sir? If you please. Yes. Did you ask to have the emergency alarm system checked up? Why, yes. Why? Was there anything wrong with it? 
No, it's a procedure I follow at this time every month. Just a precaution. All right. Mr. Overman would like to speak to you a moment, sir. Send him in. Is that all? Yes, thank you. This is Mr. O'Connor of the Department of Justice. Mr. Overman, our head bookkeeper. How do you do? Mr. Overman, my investigation here, I've run across something that seems rather funny. What do you mean? Well, we know the burglar alarm system refused to work. But I happen to have discovered that there were two men here yesterday checking it over. That's what puzzles me. There's never been two men on that job before. Never? Not to my knowledge. The first one was this man here who comes every month. But the second one I never saw before. Do you know anything about that? No, sir. I was the only man from our office that was sent here yesterday. Could you identify that second man if you saw him again? Yes, I think so. Well, I guess that's all for you two gentlemen. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Not much to work on, Mr. Harrington, but we'll do the best we can. A fine kind of a detective you turned out to be. I hired you two months ago to get me a divorce. You need to get me that divorce. As you promise, or I'll come back here and I'll take you apart. I'll tear you to pieces. So it's you. Well, you see, I sort of got the idea trailing around with you and Alan to open up a private detective agency on the side, but, but it ain't turning out so good. Uh-huh. Go on. Oh, I took some of them correspondence school instructions, and now I got myself in Dutch on a couple of blackmail and beach of promise cases. You know, this private detective ain't what it's cracked up to be. What about your job in the paper? Oh, I just uh, do, do this at night. Look, come here. I got this fixed up if I ever get in a tight place. Oh. That's, that's how I that's that's how I get up with my customers. <laughs> hey, listen, I forgot. <laughs> Sometimes I have a little trouble getting it stopped. <laughs> Looks like you're trying to make it tough for yourself. <laughs> my mistake. <laughs> oh. I forgot. <laughs> that's my trick rug. I get it. You're starting to be a halfwit. <laughs> Isn't that a dandy? That won't hurt you. Get me out of this thing. Oh, the nutty ideas. <laughs> My mistake. You're not studying to be a halfwit. You've got a diploma. Oh, good. Skip it. How would you like a real job detecting? What'll I do? Just get your camera and come with me out to an old farm. What's that? Bees and spiders. You like them. Oh, boy. Oh, oh. Hurry up. O'Connor? Well, I've got something. Yep. Right in the bag. Come over to the office tonight, and we'll have this case broken higher than a kite. Yeah, about nine o'clock. So long. I... There's nothing to be afraid of. I hope. Come on, let's take a look at the barn first. Get off the stilts and try walking on the ground, will you? Bobby, let's get out of here. Shh, be quiet. But I'm scared. 
No wonder that farmer's board was never picked up. There wasn't any. What do you mean? Look. Those tire marks were made by a big car. Take a picture of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hurry up. Hurry up. Bobby, let's get out of here. I'm not myself tonight. Yeah, I've noticed the improvement. There's just one more place I want to look at. Where? The house, Rembrandt. Come on. Oh, now I know I'm sick. Call a doctor. Get the fingerprint men and the photographers. Yes, sir. happens once is a chance. When it happens twice is a certainty. Come on, let's get out of here. Hurry up. I'm coming. Well, Doctor? Killed instantly. Mr. O'Connor. Yes? Found these clipped together in his pocket. Suppose they mean anything? like Overman doesn't usually carry around a couple of $50 bills with him. I'll keep these for the time being. They'll stand a little studying. I'll have to take the bodies down to the morgue to uh, get the bullets, Mr. O'Connor. Give me a full report, will you? Yes, I will. Find anything, Doc? Nothing yet. Come in. May I sit down? Sure, make yourself at home, kid. I just heard about Macy. I'm so sorry. Yes, they got Overman, too. They'll certainly stop at nothing. Macy must have had them dead to rights. That's why they had to get him out of the way. It's the only way I can figure it. You, you mean to say they come right in there and, and... That's right, Bulb. You're not safe anywhere these days. Well, I'm gonna be safe. I'm going home. Well, don't forget to close the door. What did you find out? That farmer's name should have been Baron Munchausen. Why? Because the honor he gave you was a phony. What do you mean? We found the tread marks of a big car in the barn. You'll never pick up that Ford because he didn't own one. And the rest of his story was just as reliable. Looks like it. You know, he must have left right after you because by the time we got there, the place was deserted. Did you find anything in the house? Plenty. Take a look at this. Carlotti's again. That's the second time we've gotten a lead to that place. Carlotti's. That's our spot. Where'd those 50s come from? Oh, found them on Overman, the bank clerk. I was just checking your numbers here when you came in. Anything wrong with them? Not much. Only the serial numbers are exactly the same. Can there be two bills with the same numbers? Not a chance in the world. Look. L1967840. L1967840. Notice anything queer? Why, no, not at first sight. Oh, here, look more closely. These numbers are among those listed here in the Lone City bills. Only the serial letters are different. Why, they must have been changed. Sure. 
This B could have been changed from an L, and this Q at the end of the letter must have been changed from an O. A neat bit of embroidery, I'd say. It's one of the most masterly jobs of counterfeit engraving I've ever run across. Then Overman must have found them and was going to show them to Macy. Certainly. If Overman had them, then they came from the Second National Bank. Say, maybe they'll be after you now that you've got those two bills. <laughs> yeah, maybe they will. And that gives me an idea. But what about Carlotti's? Where does that fit in? That young lady is what we're going to find out. And that's your problem. Now listen to me. I could give you a dozen other reasons, Mr. Carlotti, why you need a publicity agent. But I don't need a publicity agent. Look, I've been in the newspaper game for years. I know all the ins and outs from A to Z. You may not realize it, but you're an important man in this town. Think so? Sure. But the public want to know more about you, about your club. This is the age of publicity. And what are you doing about it? Well, I... Nothing. You've got a measly little sign outside. Now, if you'll only give me the chance, I promise that every time anyone picks up a newspaper, you'll have a new friend and a new customer. What made you quit the newspaper racket? Oh, I'm so sick and tired of it. Either you're on your feet or behind a typewriter 24 hours of the day. And for what? Naturally, I want nice things just as well as any other girl. Oh, I see. And you expect to get these nice things by handling my publicity? I know it. If you'll only give me the chance, and if after two weeks you don't like me, well, you just don't like me, that's all. Suppose I think it over and let you know. Thanks, Mr. Carlotti. I won't move two feet away from my apartment until I hear from you. You'll hear from me. Fine. Au revoir. Bye. Hey, we don't want that gal hanging around here, Joe. Shut up. Let me have the city desk, please. Since when are you telling me what to do? Hello, Morell. This is Joe Carlotti talking. See, there was a girl just in here looking for a publicity job. Bobby Reynolds. Said she'd been working for you. You worked for me about eight months. Smart girl, all right. Okay, Morell, thanks. The trouble with you, Duke, is you take life too seriously. She'll be using that back office, so I'll have it cleaned up. Well, you're the doctor. Well, what do you think? Obviously, one of those bills has been altered. But it's the cleverest job I've ever seen. You sent for me, sir? Yes. Overman had these two bills in his pocket when he was killed. We think they came from this bank. Can you throw any light on the matter? Why? Why, these two bills have the same serial numbers. Yes, we know that. But can you give us any idea how Overman got them? No, he said nothing to me about it. Well, I guess that's all. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. You see, it was just an accident, Mr. Harrington, that whoever altered this bill just happened to hit upon the identical letters and numbers of another bill. I don't suppose there's any way to check up on who deposited these. I'm afraid not. Well, that's that. <laughs> just the same, I have a hunch these two bills are going to break this case. Well, let's hope so. Good day. Jerry, it's the grandest show of the year. The loveliest flowers, the kind you never run across back east. Will you go? Hey, I'll be glad to go. I tell you, this federal man's got dynamite in his hand since he picked up those two bills. Why didn't you watch the numbers when you changed them? How could I? It was just an accident that the two showed up together. Now we are in a fine mess. We can't go after the whole Department of Justice. No. Overman discovered them in your deposit when I credited your account. He also found out that I held it over for a couple of days to change the numbers. And this federal dick, O'Connor, suspects that... What was that name you said? Whose name? That federal dick. O'Connor? O'Connor? Alan O'Connor? Yeah. Sure thing, dear. Out there. Goodbye, sweet. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Say, are you crazy? I may be crazy, but if you want those bills, I'll get them for you. I guess maybe I am. Telephone, Mr. O'Connor. All right, thanks. Hello? Yes? We want those two bills, O'Connor, and no monkey business. Either send them general delivery to James A. Clayton, C-L-A-Y-T-O-N, or we'll get your sister. Trace this call, quick. And listen. Don't have the post office watched. 
or it'll be just too bad. Hello? Hello? What's the matter? We're getting hot. That was a warning to drop our investigation at those two bills or they'll get K. K? Well, they won't get K. Or the bills either. Well? The call came from pay station out of town. No way to find out who made it. Hmm. Bobby, you and Tracy get over to my apartment right away. Be careful that nobody sees you. You stay there in Kay's place. Tracy, get a couple of men to escort my sister over to Miss Reynolds' apartment. You stand by and watch my place. Right. I have a hunch they'll walk right into this one. I'll see you later. Okay. I'll get there as quick as I can, Bobby. Well, Bob, you better go with them. Wait at Miss Reynolds' apartment with Kay. What'll I do there? Try tap dancing. Yeah. What? Go on, get going, get going. Look here, Kay. Come here. Come here, sit here. Sit here. Now, 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 put your arm up. That's it. Smile. Smile pretty and hold it. Don't move, Kay. Oh, boy, that looks better than Whistler's sister or mother or whatever it was. Now, don't move. Show your personality. Your teeth. Oh, beautiful, magnanimous. Oh, that's gorgeous. Beautiful. Now, hold it and I'll count three. One, two, three. Oh, Kay, what do you think we'll make? Well, I have to answer the phone. Hello. Oh, hello, Alan. Hello, Kay. How's everything? Are you free? Well, don't worry, because nobody knows you're over there. Oh, I'm not afraid, Alan. I'm having the time of my life with Bob. He's so cute. It's you and Bobby I'm worried about, though. You're taking all the chances. Well, never mind about us. You stay right there in Bobby Reynolds' apartment till I come and get you, understand? <laughs> sure, it's all right to take pictures. Hey, goodbye, sweet. You men already? Sure, a fleet couldn't get into this building without us noticing it. Good. Well, I don't think they'll try anything until they find out I didn't mail those bills. We'll get going. Right. You scared, G-woman? Why, of course not. But now I know how a piece of cheese feels waiting for a mouse to pounce on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, sit tight. Bye, Bobby. Good luck, Alan. Now, give me your right hand. Oh, holy smoke. Kay. What do you see? Oh, boy. <laughs> a strange man is coming into your life. You're right about that. <laughs> But he's no stranger. I think I'll call him right now. Get me Gladstone, 7161. What are you going to do? You can't do that. You know what Mr. O'Connor said. What harm can it do? Alan knows him. Yeah, but... The, the, May the... I speak with Mr. Turner? You got me saving up for a two-week nervous breakdown. Well, hello, Kay. How are you, dear? Bored to distraction. Cooped up in an apartment all evening because of some silly kidnapping threats they sent my brother. Yes. I can't stand it any longer. I'd love to go out for some fresh air. Why, sure. Nothing would please me better. I'll be right over and take you for a little ride. Here's that report you wanted worked up. Thanks. Let's see, Andrew Butler, William Barton, Leon, here we are, Leon Curtis. Born in Serbia, 1889, came to America in 1925. Changed name to Leon Curtis, real name Leon Schwartz. Trade, master engraver. Employed by Second National Bank as cashier. Present address is 439 Hope Street, master engraver. Then Curtis could have changed the letters on those bills. Perhaps he was the inside man on that robbery. Call a squad car, will you meet me out front as quickly as you can? Yes, sir. What hit me? My head. Give me some aspirin. Uh, 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 give me, give me an outside line. Hello. What? When? I'm not sure. I just woke up. They came in and grabbed Miss O'Connor and, and clucked me on the head. But how in the world did they ever find out where she was? I don't know. She did call a friend and invite him over. 
Who was he? What was his number? She didn't say. I was only trying to entertain her when she grabbed her pocketbook and called some number. Here it is. It says, Jerome Turner, Gladstone, 7161. Say, if you're coming by this way, will you bring me something for the bump on my head? Wait till it gets as big as an egg and then hatch it. It hurts. This guy McGarren operates too fast to suit me. I told him to lay off that girl, but it's too late now. Well, maybe we better lamb out of town. Pipe down. When I want your ideas, I'll ask for them. See who it is. Well, they're right on our tails. All right, slow down. We'll take it easy. Now, what's it all about? Well, I just got in my place and I heard men coming down the hall. The house manager was with them and I heard him say, this is the place. Well, keep your shirt on. They haven't caught up with you yet. Barney, fix him something to steady his nerves. All right, go on. There isn't much more to tell. I climbed out the window, up the fire escape to the roof and jumped across to another building and I didn't stop going till... Well, here I am. That was a very smart stunt. If they'd followed you here, we'd all be in a jam. The best thing we can do is to get out of here as quick as possible. Barney, pull my car around to the side entrance. I'll meet you both there later. You two go out this way. I'm going to give you a ring. I thought of giving up hope of ever hearing from you. Well, I've been awfully busy. Say, you look kind of down the mouth. Why shouldn't I? I counted so much on getting that job. Then what makes you think he won't get it? Then I'm hired? Sure, why not? Boy, that's the best thing I've heard today, mister. By the way, have you ever been to Vancouver? No. How would you like to go there with me? You know, just for a start up. I don't get it. Well, I'm leaving tonight to pick up a dance team and an orchestra. And I thought, you know, maybe you might like to go along. Why, I'd love it. Would you? Well, we're driving up the coast. When do we leave? Right now. But I, I can't go in these clothes. Uh... Why not? You can pick up what you need along the way. All right. But this is a little sudden. Well, we'll only be gone a couple of weeks. Do you mind if I call my mother and let her know that we're going? No, but make it snappy. I have some people waiting. This isn't Harry, it's Bob. Uh, this is Bobby. Tell Mother I'm going away for a few weeks. Tell whose mother? Yes, dear. I'm going away with Mr. Carlotti. Carlotti? Holy smoke. Listen, Bobby, you can't... Of course it's on business. That's a fine way for a brother to talk. Look, I ain't your mother and I ain't your brother. I don't know what you're talking about. Say, you ain't been drinking, have you? Why, of course not. Listen, darling, you tell Dad not to worry about me and I'll call him later. Yes, dear. Goodbye. And be a good little boy. You go ahead and engage a room. I have some business to attend to in the neighborhood and I'll see you later. All right. So long. I don't like the idea of bringing that girl along, boss. Oh, forget it. Drive up. All right, all right. Then what happened? Well, Mr. O'Connor, all of a sudden she goes over to the telephone and calls this fellow Jerry Turner. Half an hour later, there's a knock on the door. I answer the door and he's standing there with another guy. <laughs> I goes over to shake hands with this Turner bird and boom, he socks me one. Yes? A swell guy. Well, well. Then after a while, I get this call from Bobby. And she's stiffer than a gangplank. You must be out of your mind. Now look, Mr. O'Connor. When anybody mistakes me for their mother, she must be drunk. Listen, Bo, how long do I have to wait before you tell me what happened? But you won't give me a chance. All right, dear Bo. Nice, Bo. Sit down. Now, come on. Tell me. Tell me in your own words. Yeah, then Bobby said to tell my dad that she's gone out of town with Mr. Carlotti. Who did you say? Carlotti. Carlotti? 
I should have known better than to leave you here. I started to give it to him, but he hit me on the back of the head when I wasn't looking. I'll take it. Hello? Yes. Bobby, where are you? Wyandotte, what are you doing up there? Carlotti dropped me off here, said he'd be back later. He was with two men. Good. Wyandotte's on the way up to that farm. It's my hunch that's where they're going. And it's my hunch you'll find Kay at that farmhouse. What do you want me to do? Listen, you stay right where you are. I'll be there within an hour. Carlotti shows up, you keep him there. Right. You stay here. Oh, please, Mr. O'Connor, you can't leave me out now. Stay here. Oh, I'm, I'm going along. Hey, Carlotti. It's Carlotti. I wonder what he came down here for. Maybe he likes the sea air. Hiya, boys. Hey, what's up? Plenty. I came after that dough from the bank. And I'm clearing out of town until this thing blows over. Well, how about the O'Connor girl? She's McGurn's worry. I didn't know he was going in for that angle when he said he'd get those bills back. Not that he got them back. Listen, Carlotti, get your dough and clear out of here. If that's what you came out here for, I'll take care of my end of it. Get the money, Duke. All right, Bob, I'm going on out to the farm. You wait here with Bobby till I get back. Who, me? Nothing's going to happen to you. Now go on up and hide in the corner. All right, John, we can go. Curtis, get rid of that engraving equipment before you leave. I sure will. Now the rest of you can clear out as soon as you like. Hey, did I go with you to Vancouver? No, I got other ideas. I'll meet you there later. Who is it? It's me, Bob. Where'd you come from? Nothing for you to be afraid of. Mr. O'Connor sent me to take care of you. That's a great help. Yes, sir. He went out to the farm. He knew I could handle things. <laughs> oh, oh. All right, boys, you've got your instructions. Just be careful with your guns. My sister may be in there. See what we can find, Tracy. Get going. Yeah. That's it, Mr. O'Connor. Did you get Carlotti with him? No, he isn't here. Well, I think I know where to find him. Take this man down to headquarters. I'll get there as soon as I can. All right. You come with me, Kay. I remember the time when I was really up against it. It was during the World War. Tanks in front of me. Machine gun nests on the left. Enemy on the right. But I wasn't afraid. No, neither was the enemy. No, sir. Do you know what happened to me? Yeah. 
You got killed. Yeah, I got killed. Uh... I wonder what's keeping Alan. I hope he didn't get into trouble with that Carlotti bunch. Did I ever tell you about the time when I shot... you were asleep. I guess I was too excited about the trip. We'll have a couple of drinks and start it off right. Swell. I'll get some glasses. Oh, no, don't bother. I'll get them. But, uh... Perfectly all right, I'll get them. Business all wound up? Mm-hmm. Nothing to hold us up any longer. Well, here's to a big time in Vancouver, with nothing to worry about. Or is there? On second thought, we're leaving right now. All right. I'll get my hat and bag and gloves and things. the smart little girl that wanted to be my publicity agent, huh? You won't get out of this, Carlotti. Too bad you'll never get the chance to turn me in. You haven't got the nerve to shoot. You never made a bigger mistake in your life. This'll be something for the papers, but you'll never write it. Bobby, are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. I must say you have the knack for getting places just in time. Well, the next time you go away with a strange man, you get a requisition. Do you hear me? Uh-huh. What hit me? Poor Bob. Are you all right? Twice in the same place. That's not fair. Come on, now. Let's make a picture. All right. Come on, Bobby. Okay. How's Boy, that? Swell. This will make an exclusive. Come on, now. A nice long kiss. A what? You tell her, Alan. I'll show you. Are you all set? All set. Here we go. One. I know, and they have a right to find out. But I don't care if they never find out. What do you think of that? All right, we will find out. Still! Wow! This is a little Hold them, Yale. Wait till this hits the front page. What's more there, you two? Well, what do you say, Bobby? Shall we give them a break? Well, I guess we'll have to. <laughs> Anything to apply. But Miss Doris phoned twice. She wants you to come upstairs to the party. Should we go to Doris's party, Horace? My last evening in New York? I'd rather spend it here with you. Neil, don't forget, we'll be expecting you later. All right, Leo, I may drop up for a while. Good. 
Hello, Jenny. Good evening, Mr. Neal. Why, it's Neal. Oh, congratulations. We love the play. Any news? No, not a bit. I was just wandering around like a stray cat, and I thought you wouldn't mind if I dropped in for a while. Why, of course. Oh, Neil, this is Mr. Barker. This is Neil Kennedy, who produced the play we saw tonight. Oh, yes. I'm glad to know you, sir. How do you do? Well, sit down, Neil. I'll have Jenny bring you a drink. Now, there's an idea. I'll see. I haven't had one tonight. Well, we'll fix that. I'm having Jenny mix a drink for you, too, Horace. If you don't mind, Elsie, I think I'd better run over to my room and see if they've been able to get that message through for me. Oh, must you go? I think I'd better. I've been trying to get a long-distance call through all evening. Why don't you call from here? I don't want to bother you folks with my business. <laughs> well, goodbye, Mr. Kennedy. I certainly wish you success with your play. Thanks. If I find that I have to leave in the morning, would it be all right for me to come back for a few minutes tonight? Well, of course. But I hope you won't have to go. So that's Mr. Barker. Yes, that's Mr. Barker. I've been hearing about him. Have you? Where? Jenny, I've called up several times lately, and every time Jenny told me you were out with Mr. Barker. Well, I suppose I was. I'm sorry to have missed you, Neil. How do you think the play went? Oh, I think they loved it. I'm sure it's a hit. Well, if it is, I've got some good news for you. That's what I came to see you about. I've got another play I'm going to do, and there's a swell part in it for you. I'm sorry, Neil. I'm afraid it's too late for me. I'm going to leave the stage. And that means you're going to get married. Good evening, over. Good evening, Mr. Nichols. You're quite a stranger, sir. Yeah, good evening, Jenny. Good evening. Why, it's Jim. Why, Jim, I didn't know you were in town. You know Neil Kennedy. Why, of course. How do you do, Neil? Mr. Nichols. When'd you get back, Jim? Why, it's a day. Didn't your maid tell you I phoned this evening? No, she didn't. Why, she told me you were at the theater. Yes, I was. It was the opening of Neil's new play. Oh, really? Good. Well, how'd it go? The jury's still out. I'm waiting for the verdict. <laughs> I see. Well, don't you think that we ought to have a little drink to wish him luck, Jim? Why, indeed I do. <laughs> Although it's strictly against the doctor's orders. They'd be quit smoking altogether. Oh, that's tough, all right. Yes, it is. Especially the smoking. I'll miss that a lot more than I'll ever miss the drinks. Still, I hate to think that this will be my loss. Well, I know how you feel. I'm always sorry when it's going to be my last. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's hoping you have a success. Thanks. Cheer up. Well, I'll be on my way. Well, good night, Neil. You going back to the theater? Oh, I'm going home now and kick the ticket brokers off my doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, dear.
You must speak to Jenny about not giving you my message. Yes, I know, Jim. I'll speak to her about it. Don't be upset about it. It's quite all right. Well, how's Norma? Why, she had a slight temperature this morning when I was at the hospital. She caught a little cold. I asked Miss Henderson to call me here about this time to let me know if she was sleeping all right. Oh, thanks so much, Jim, for the fruit and things you sent her. <laughs> Did she like them? She loved them. Well, you go to the theater with Neil tonight? No, Jim, I didn't. I went with... with a man I met just after you left for Washington. Oh, yeah? Well, who is he? Well, his name is Barker. Horace Barker. He's from Detroit. I want to talk to you about him, Jim. Uh, what is it? He wants me to... To marry him. He wants you to. Well, well, what kind of a man is he? I wouldn't know how to explain him, Jim. I think he's splendid. I'm more in love than I ever thought I could be with anyone again. Well, that's all there is to it, Jim. I do love him. I see. Uh, are you going to marry? I want to. Well, there's nothing else to be said, is there? Oh, Jim. I'll never forget how good you've been. And all the things you've done for Norma. I haven't done anything for Norma. Oh, for you, my dear. But I haven't wanted to. And if, if anything should happen, you should ever need me, I want you to know that I'll do anything I possibly can for you. Well, I think I'll go now. Jim, you look ill. It's all right. I'm just tired. I wonder if you'll have Jenny make me some coffee. About the only stimulant left to me. I'll get it. Thanks. Oh, I'm so sorry this had to happen tonight, Jim. When you're not feeling well. Oh, I should have realized, I suppose. It was bound to happen sooner or later. Only sorry that I couldn't marry you myself. You know, nothing would give me greater happiness. In fact, I, I talked to my wife only today. I thought she might give me my freedom. Or something had come up which made me think that, well, she might want her freedom. But no. Oh, uh, by the way, there's something here that... No, no, please don't. I'm all right. Jim, you better lie down for a while. The coffee's ready, Miss Alfie. Yes, that's all I want. It's nothing serious at all. I've had these attacks before. They don't last very long. You know, if you don't mind, I, I think I will lie down for a few minutes. Yes, do, Jim. Just a minute, Jim. Please sit down. Oh, answer that, Jenny, will you? Yes, Miss Alfred. Hello? 
Oh, yes, Miss Henderson. One moment, please. Thanks. Oh, don't you want some water with those? No, no, thanks. This will do. It's the nurse, Miss Elsie. All right, thank you. I'll be right back then. That's all right, Jenny. All right, Mr. Nichols. Thanks. Hello? Oh, yes. Oh, thanks so much for calling. Oh, is she awake? Yes, of course. Yeah, you are, dear. It's your mother. I'm feeling fine, Mother. I wiggled my big toe today. I love you so much, Mother. You're coming to see me tomorrow? Could you stay all day? I'm so glad. Nurse woke me because she had a rummy with nasty alcohol. Mother, will you sing something for me? Darling, Mother, tomorrow I'm going to wiggle my big toe for you. Good night, Mummy. Good night, darling. Good night. That was normal, Jim. 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 Jenny. Jenny. Yes, Miss Elsie. Mr. Dickles is ill. He's terribly ill. He's hot, I think. Get me the ammonia, quick. Call the doctor. Oh. 
Elsie, what's happened? Oh, Leo, it's Jim. He's... He's dead. In there. Happen. Oh. <laughs> was it? Was it a heart attack? Yes, it, it must have been. I knew that his heart was. Oh, couldn't there have been, have been some some mistake? Oh, he can't really be dead. Oh, Elsie, I'm I'm afraid he is. Oh. <laughs> did you did you send for a doctor? I, I just sent Jenny for one. She was going to call him when. I was afraid he'd call the doctor then, Mr. Bergman. He'd call the police. That is so, isn't it, Leo? They would call the police. Oh, Ben. Oh, Leo, what can I do? It'd be so terrible. Oh, not only for me, but for him, too. And his family. He has a family? Yes. A wife and child. It would be... A rotten mess. You must do something. Dr. Brewer, sanatorium. Oh, yes, Mr. Bergman. Yes, the doctor's in the building. Uh, I'll call him for you. Just one moment, please. Oh, hello, Gruel. Leo Bergman speaking. I want you to do me a favor. A man, a friend of mine, has suddenly been taken ill. I want to bring him around to your place and have him taken care of. Seems to be a heart attack. All right, thanks. I'll bring him right over. He's going to be all right. We'll take him to Dr. Gruel's. He runs an exclusive sanitarium. If we make it worth his while, he'll have it appear that Nichols died there. An excellent idea, Leo. And uh, Ben, <clears throat> we'd have to have the car waiting for us at the door. Uh, Jenny, go downstairs and find my car. It is parked uh, on the side door. See, see the chauffeur brings it in front of opposite the door right away. Leo. Yes, Mr. Oh, uh, Jenny, um, have the porter be sure that the side door is open. Just tell him that we want to take somebody out quietly. Too much drinking. And here. All right, that. Mr. Bergman. Ben. Oh, uh, what's the matter, dear? Did I frighten you? you now. But I've got to leave tomorrow, Elsie. Well, couldn't I see you tomorrow? In the morning? I was afraid we wouldn't have a chance in the morning. I didn't want to go without seeing you. Oh, no. I, I didn't want you to. 
That's why I wanted to have a talk with you tonight. You know what I want to say, don't you, Elsie? I want you to marry me. Oh, please don't ask me tonight, Hollis. Darling. Oh, Hollis, I... the whole house? No. <laughs> Good heavens, that man's dead. Oh, yes. Yes, he's dead. Oh, Jim. He's dead. Oh, Jim. Jim. Elsie. Jim. Elsie, come. Get control of yourself. Get control of yourself. Oh. What's going on here? This man, a friend of ours, has just died here in Miss Manning's apartment. He's died here? What are you trying to do? As you see, we are trying to take him away. Take him away? Well, you can't do that. You can't move a dead body without its being investigated. It will be investigated. There'll be an inquest, but at the sanitarium where we're taking him instead of here. All we're trying to do now is to avoid any unpleasant publicity. Oh, Horace, please let them go. But you can't possibly... Oh, let them take him away. Thanks, Albert. Yours. Oh, how's things, Eddie? Very slow. Nothing ever happens here anymore. No, no. That's the worst you get. A drunk once in a while, and always somebody to take him out. Where was he when he died? In there. Elsie, I've got to know. Who was this man? Now, I don't want to know anything except what you tell me. Was he married? Yes. Were you in love with him? Oh, I thought so once. But tonight, I told him that I'd met the man I really loved. Oh, Horace, you must understand. If it hadn't been for Jim and the things he was able to do, Norma might never have lived. I don't know much about you, Elsie, except what you told me. There might be other things. You have a right to feel that way about it. What seems so strange is that it's not the way I feel about it. It's the way I've always imagined I would feel, but I don't. Of course, it was a shock coming in here and seeing a thing like that and realizing that even that somehow, well, it hasn't changed me. No matter what's happened, I don't seem to feel any different about you. What I'd rather do than anything in the world is just to take you and Norma and take care of you all your lives. I love you, Elsie. I love you, too. You think you'd be happy with me? I know it. I won't leave tomorrow. I'll stay here. We're going to be married. Now, you want to get out of this apartment right away, oh, tonight. Oh, yes, yes. Is Jenny coming back? Yes, any minute now. Well, when Jenny comes in, we'll have her move you into another room for the night. And I want to get in touch with Kent on the phone right away and tell him that I'm not coming tomorrow. 
Do you want me to stay here until Jenny returns? No, it isn't really necessary. All right. I'll be back. Now, you're going to be happy, aren't you? Happier than I ever hoped. Did you pack everything I need for tonight, Jenny? Yes, Miss Elsie. But the bellboy will be waiting for you with a key at 5A. I'll be down just as soon as Mr. Barker gets back. All right, Miss Elsie. Is this Miss Manning's apartment? Yes. I would like to see Miss Manning, please. Who is it, please? You tell her, please, that I wish to see her. I am Dr. Gruel. It's all right, Jenny. Come in, Doctor. I'm Miss Manning. Do you want me to go now, Miss Elsie? Yes, please, Jenny. So, you are Miss Manning? Yes, Doctor. Well, I was just returning from the theater when Mr. Bergman and Mr. Ayub brought a man into my sanatorium. Yes. They told me they brought him from your apartment. Yes, Doctor, what is it? Is there any trouble? Trouble? Why, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was afraid you'd come because something had gone wrong. No. Everything is all right so far. That is what I came to see you about. Well, do sit down, Doctor. Thank you. Please. So far, as I said, there is nothing for us to worry about. But naturally, there will be. Oh, yes? When Bergman telephoned me, he told me the man was suffering from a heart attack. That is uh, what you told him to tell me, wasn't it? Well, yes. But after they got him to my place, they told me the man was already dead when he telephoned. Yes, he was. Well, even that would have been all right. That would have been easy enough to arrange. And would have saved suffering and embarrassment to innocent people. So I was glad to do it as a favor to Leo. Certainly a pardonable favor. But uh, it was something different. Very different. When I found that the man had not died from a heart attack. It wasn't his heart? It wasn't his heart. He died of poison. So, of course, there, there might be trouble. Poison? Why, he couldn't have. But he did. His death was caused by a dose of nicotine. Nicotine? An alkaloid derived from tobacco. One of the most deadly poisons known. Why, Doctor, that's impossible. How could he? That is what I came to find out. He did not take it himself, did he? Deliberately? He did not commit suicide. Oh, no, Doctor. I didn't think he did. Then someone gave it to him. Well, what do you mean? Obviously, he was murdered. Well, I don't know what your object is in coming here to tell me such a thing. But I do know this. It's not true. I have enough evidence to make me pretty certain that it is a case of murder. 
an unusually skillful and subtle murder. A murder that would have probably even never been suspected, if it were not for the fact that I do not smoke. You must be insane. <laughs> do you know that uh, I think I am not insane? The man lying dead over there in my sanatorium did not use tobacco either. Had he been a smoker, the odor would have been about his clothes. There would have been cigars, cigarettes, or traces of them in his pocket. So you see, what I meant when I said that the nicotine poisoning might never have been suspected had it not been that I do not smoke. It made it much more easily possible for me to detect the odor of tobacco upon his lips. But that's absurd. In itself, it might not be conclusive evidence, but I found uh, other indications of nicotine poisoning in the uh, contracted uh, pupil of the eye, in the condition of the blood. Of course, these symptoms uh, might have been caused by heart disease. All of the symptoms, that is, except the odor of tobacco. That could only have been caused by nicotine. But you haven't any evidence except the odor of nicotine. There are various kinds of evidence. Symptomatic evidence, which first aroused my suspicion in the case. Chemical evidence, we will soon have that. My assistant is having a specimen analyzed. Postmortem evidence, well, for that we will have to wait. And uh, circumstantial evidence. Suppose we take up the matter of circumstantial evidence. Sit down, please. Now, he died here in this apartment, didn't he? He took the poison while he was here. You were alone with him, is that right? My maid was here. <laughs> but she had no motive for killing him, did she? Motive? Why, of course not. But you did have a motive. Well, what do you mean? This is uh, what I found in the pocket of his coat. You see, it is a copy of his will. And uh, one of its provisions is a bequest to Miss Elsie Manning. That is you, isn't it? $200,000. I don't know anything about this. He never told me. <laughs> you may be able to make the jury believe that, but... There is no use trying it on me. A jury? It's about time we get together on this, Miss Manning. I did not come here to turn you over to the police. I came here to help you. That is, if I find it uh, profitable. So that's it. You're only trying to frighten me. I'm going to call the police. The number is spring 33100. Three, Call anyone you like. I thought so. But I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it. All right, then you didn't do it. But somebody did. The police will have to find that out. Unless I get paid for my services. $100,000. You I... can raise that on your share of the will. I don't know anything about the will. I don't believe it really can be his will. I will give you a few moments to get your story ready for the police.
She had the coffee? Yes. You had coffee with him? No. The telephone rang and I... Doctor. Yes. He did take something else after the coffee. As I left the room, he was taking his medicine. Medicine? That's the medicine he took for his heart. You see, he'd had a severe attack. Why, doctor, that must be where he got it. The poison, if he was poisoned, as you say. He must have taken an overdose. An overdose of capsules that size? If you want to make that theory plausible, you should have removed some of the capsules from the box. It's a new box. It is full. Only one capsule has been removed. But there could be a mistake. You may be mistaken about the kind of poison. They put strychnine in heart medicine, don't they? I could have been mistaken about the kind of poison. I'm afraid not. It was nicotine, all right. And you probably just bought a bottle of that common insect spray used in gardening. Nicotine in concentrated form. One of the quickest, surest, deadliest poisons known. Oh, how could you think of such a horrible thing? You don't have to act for me, Elsie. As a matter of fact, I think it was a very clever piece of work. If it was done, I'm not guilty. Oh, please believe me. But even though I'm innocent, if you go to the police and accuse me, you don't know how terrible it'll be for me. I have a daughter. She's ill. If this should happen to me, I... I don't know what would become of her. Save that for the jury, but I do not think it will save you. Poisoning is not very sympathetic. But I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it. All right. I will put these back where they came from. And nothing is to be disturbed until the police come. You know, Miss Manning, you are either a fool or you have something in your head that uh, I know nothing about. But I do not think you have. And I am sure you are not a fool. You probably figure that if you hold out, I will come down in my fee. But I am not coming down. Mrs. Nichols, please. Uh, Dr. Gruel for you, Mrs. Nichols. He says it's very important. Very well. I'll speak to him, Anita. Yes? Yes? Yes, this is Mrs. Nichols. Mrs. Nichols, your husband is very ill. I am the physician in charge. Uh, could you come at once to the Strathmore apartment in 54th Street? Yes, apartment 6E. And Mrs. Nichols, prepare yourself, because it is quite possible that you might not see your husband alive. Why, yes. Yes, I can come in a few minutes. My car's still at the door. Yes, thank you very much, Doctor. Are you going to tell her that I killed him? I am going to tell her that you killed him. Oh, Doctor, you mustn't. You mustn't accuse me of this. If it's only the money, I... That's all it is. But I must have that money within 24 hours. But I haven't got it. Perhaps it is just as well I call Mrs. Nichols. I can get it from her. Without it costing her a cent. It will be the money left you in his will. But my fee, instead of going down, has gone up. I want it all. 
Oh, all right, take it all. I don't care. But I didn't kill him. All right, then. You didn't kill him. Nobody killed him. And if this goes through, he... He died of uh, heart disease. Mrs. Nichols was just leaving when I called. She ought to be here in five minutes. Doctor, do I have to see her? Couldn't I go out until she's gone? Perhaps I had better see her alone. What is in there? A small kitchen. And my maid's room beyond. No other entrances besides uh, this one? No. All right, then. You wait in there. I had better go to make sure about the entrances. I think it's better for me to wait here. Very well. I won't be long. Mrs. Nichols? Come in, Mrs. Nichols. You're the doctor that telephoned me? Yes, Mrs. Nichols. You said that my husband was ill. Where is he? He is at my sanitarium on Riverside Drive. Why'd you tell me to come here? I think you had better sit down a few minutes. Please. Mrs. Nichols, your husband is dead. Was it his heart? Yes. I'd been expecting it, of course. Sometime. The terrible shock. I am sorry, Mrs. Nichols. Oh, I must go to him. Take me to him at once, please, Doctor. I think you had better wait a few minutes, Mrs. Nichols. There are some circumstances connected with his death that I would like to discuss with you. What do you mean? The reason I ask you to come here is because this is where your husband died. What is this place? What was he doing here? This isn't the home of... Elsie Manning. Was she with him when he... When he died? Yes. Where is she now? She is not here at present. Mrs. Nichols? This is where your husband died.
Thank you. So you see, Mrs. Nichols, there is a chance for very unpleasant consequences for everybody concerned. If it became public, if the newspapers got a hold of it, it would be disastrous to Miss Manning. And I don't suppose that you want any such publicity. Naturally. That's why I came here. I thought I could help you. What do you mean? Well, I could certify that your husband's death occurred in my sanatorium. Why, well, yes, Doctor. Could you do that? Yes, I could do that, but, well, I, I would be placing myself in a very dangerous position. And I cannot afford to take that chance unless I am well paid for taking it. I see. You expect me to pay you? Well, before we go into that, there is something I would like to show you. It's a copy of your husband's will. Where did you get it? I found it during the course of my examination. I want you to read uh, this paragraph, please. Well, the situation is this. Miss Manning is willing to pay me her entire share in the estate for my services in this manner. $200,000. But uh, I must have that money within 24 hours. You see, the certificate of death must be filed by that time. And before it is filed, I must have the money or its equivalent in my hands. Miss Manning has not got it. So what I want you to do is this. I want you to advance the money against the claim Miss Manning has on the estate. <laughs> do I make myself clear? Do you understand what I mean? It's all been such a shock, I... I really don't know what I ought to do. Well, it should not take you long to decide. You do not want scandal without it costing you a cent. The money you will advance is Miss Manning's. $200,000 is a large sum, Doctor. What is your name? Gruel. Dr. Gruel. It seems so strange to me that you would be willing to pay it. An actress, isn't she? Doesn't seem that she should be so terrified at having the story in the newspapers. She has a child, a little girl who is ill. And it is for the sake of the child that she is willing to make this sacrifice. I see. I just want to make it clear, Doctor, that I'm taking no part in this, except to advance Miss Manning the money due her when the estate is settled. But use Miss Manning makes of that money is no concern of mine. If she wishes to pay it to you, it's entirely her own affair. But you understand I am to have that money within 24 hours? Yes. I'll see my lawyer in the morning and give him his instructions. Is that satisfactory? Perfectly. Dr. Gruel. Mrs. 
It's all right, Miss Manning. Everything is all right. I can't go through with this. I've been so terrified, I haven't realized. If he was murdered... Miss Manning, please. I... I'm not going to help you hide it. What does she mean? Mrs. Nichols, Dr. Gruel says your husband was poisoned, and he accuses me. So that's why she was willing to pay you $200,000. Mrs. Nichols, I don't know whether your husband really died of poison or not. Dr. Gruel says he did. And I believe he really thinks so, and that I killed him, but I didn't. Now I'm going to do everything in my power to help you find the person who murdered him. She did it all right. I can't tell you what it means to me to go through with this. But I know now that it's the only thing I can do. I could never rest if I thought Jim had been murdered and I had helped to hide his murderer. Why, if I paid this money to Dr. Gruel, I'd be doing a thing that would stamp me forever as guilty. It's a serious thing, Doctor, to charge a person with murder. It is not my position to charge anyone with murder. All that is necessary for me to do is to report the matter of a suspicious death to the police, which with uh, your permission I am going to do. Wait, Doctor. You must be very sure of what you're doing before you do that. You say he was poisoned. What exactly did cause his death? Nicotine. But isn't it possible that your diagnosis might be wrong? But even if it wasn't, what evidence have you that he had this evidence? Jim died here. And if he did die of poison, the only thing I can think of, the only possible thing that could have happened, is that there must have been something wrong with his medicine. What medicine? I'll show you. That is what she is counting on for her defense, but it is the most damaging evidence against her. It's not there. Did you take it? So, you got rid of it, eh? I got rid of it? Why, what possible chance had I to get rid of it? And why should I want to get rid of it? It may contain the very evidence I need to prove my innocence. Oh, no, Dr. Gruel. That box was on that table in there when you sent me out of this room. No one's been here but you. And Mrs. Nichols. Was she in that room? Yes, she was. You killed him. How dare you say such a thing? You know it's true. When I couldn't find this box, when Dr. Gruel said that he hadn't taken it, I knew you had it, and I knew why. Why did you take that box, Mrs. Nichols? It belonged to my husband. Why shouldn't I have taken it? She took it because she knew the medicine in it had been poisoned. I took it before I ever dreamed he'd been poisoned. Oh. I took it when I was in there with you, Dr. Gruel. You said it was his heart, and I still think it was. An autopsy will prove that he was poisoned. Dr. Gruel. My husband was under the care of a physician. Of course, you know under those circumstances, if he died of heart failure, which no doubt he did, an autopsy will be unnecessary. Yes, I know. Whoever killed him was probably counting on that. What do you mean? I mean, I am not sure that Miss Manning did it after all. Of course, both of you had the opportunity. 
I didn't have the opportunity to put poison in his medicine. I never even saw the box before. And how did you know it was his? Well, I... I knew he was in the habit of taking medicine from a box like that, yes. You knew this box. Oh, Dr. Gruel. You said that nicotine could be bought quite readily. Yes. In a common spray used in gardening. I never had a garden in my life. But you have. You have a garden in Westchester. I often heard Jim speak of it. And greenhouses. Why, if you... If I had a motive for poisoning him, you had a thousand times stronger one. He left me two hundred thousand dollars. He left you two million. Besides that, he stood in the way of someone you were interested That's in. That's not true. Miss Manning, let me have that box. We will see. Perhaps uh, only one of the capsules was poisoned. The one he took. If she'd only poisoned one of them, she wouldn't have taken the box. However, I will handle these very carefully. There may be fingerprints. <laughs> Whoever did this did not intend that the investigation should reach the fingerprint stage and might have been a little, <laughs> a little careless. Nicotine. And you'd let me die for it. Now I'm going to call the police. Stop her, Dr. Manny. Dr. Gruel, you said you were willing to take a risk for $200,000. I'll pay you much more than that, if you'll help me now. You confess. No, I've not confessed. There's just one thing in all you said about me that's true. There is someone I want to marry. But if this comes out, it'll ruin all my plans. Everything that makes life possible for me would be gone. That's why I'm willing to pay. Miss Manning, if we go on with this, it will mean humiliation and exposure for you, too. Miss Manning, you are not yet clear of suspicion by any means. Why not consider what she says? It seems such a horrible thing that anyone could have killed Jim. But I'd never consider helping to cover it up, even to save myself. But even if I were willing to, even if I'd let this go on as you ask, you know and I know that Dr. Gruel, if you paid him enough, would do anything you wanted him to. Then, if the facts of Jim's murder were ever discovered, I could always be accused. Dr. Gruel, no one knows the truth about what happened here tonight, but you and Miss Manning myself. Is that true? No one. If those capsules are destroyed, and we can testify that it was Miss Manning who destroyed them, then if anything ever arises, it will be Miss Manning who will be tried for murder. You couldn't do a thing like that. You do it because you're guilty. I do it to save my life. Miss Manning will accuse you, you know. There will be an investigation. There's nothing that can hurt me in any way. That box. It will be easy enough to destroy the capsules. In that case, Mrs. Nichols will be in a far stronger position. A loyal, dutiful wife. She had no apparent motive for killing her husband. No one will believe that she did. On the other hand, Miss Manning profited by his death. Miss Manning, why don't we settle this? By destroying the capsules and having me report the death as due to natural causes. I can't do it, Dr. Gruel. I'd never have another peaceful moment as long as I live. Is uh, that final? Oh, please, Doctor. 
Give me a little time. I want to think. Look out, she's trying to get away. What good did that do her? I don't trust her, Doctor. Just a moment, Mrs. Nichols. After all, what can she do? Horace, come quickly. Now, Dr. Gruel, if you try to destroy that box, I have a witness. What is this? Jim didn't die of heart failure. He was poisoned by his medicine. And they are planning to destroy the evidence and accuse me. Just one moment, Miss Manning. That is not entirely correct. Mrs. Nichols has suggested such a plan. That is true. But I had not consented to take part in it. You uh, run the sanatorium where they took the man? I do. You say the man was murdered? I have reasons to believe he was. And uh, that box contains the evidence that he was poisoned? Yes, it does, Horace. Give it to me. On what authority? Dr. Gruel, give me that box. Were you... Were you addressing this man as Dr. Gruel? Why, yes, Leo. Why? This man is not Dr. Gruel. Who are you? What difference does that make, Miss Manning? It might make a lot of difference. Just my luck, when Elsie needed me, I wasn't home. You sure everything's all right, Johnny? Sure, Mr. Deal. But she delayed terribly long coming down to the new apartment. Please, Horace. Don't be a fool. Perhaps you do not fully understand. This is a serious matter. Yeah, what's the idea, Elsie? What's the gag? What are you doing here, Mr. Maitland? Why the trick dialect? What? Do you know this man, Neil? Yes, this is Police Inspector Maitland. What are you trying to do? Well, I guess there's no doubt now as to who did it. Kennedy, the two men on the stair landing, have them come in. Miss Manning? I hope you'll forgive my professional deception. Dr. Gruel told me of the suspicious death of Mr. Nichols. What I did here tonight was merely my way of finding out beyond a question who was guilty of the murder. I was fairly sure, but not positive. There were many strange circumstances until Mrs. Nichols, hearing my name, made a run for that window. To headquarters. There's a man waiting for her downstairs. Take him along for questioning. Her coat's in that room. Love of Mike, give me a cigarette. <laughs> I thought for a moment you were going to spoil everything. <laughs> well, no harm done. Of course, Miss Manning, you understand. We'll need you for... Au revoir. Miss Elsie, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Au revoir, Monsieur le Docteur. <laughs> hey. 
Have you forgotten we're moving tonight, Miss Elsie? <laughs> <laughs> Then he ended with, uh, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you must save this unfortunate boy. Just because the district attorney has proven he has done wrong once does not mean he has lost his soul. Hold? <laughs> Hold soul, he yelled as quickly as he could, but the damage had been done. Then Dad got up and in his inimitable dry way remarked, our worthy colleague seems to think he is running a golf school. And from the way the truth has been knocked about by his witnesses, I'm forced to agree. However, I am afraid that, since eloquence is the only thing that could possibly save Pedro Despier from justice, my worthy colleague, the attorney for the defense, has flubbed his drive and lost his sole hold. <laughs> well, it was all over then but the shouting. Mr. Pedro Despi was convicted in a couple of hours. Much to the credit of my honored father and the next governor of the state, Mr. John Manson Clay. <laughs> More coffee, Jack. No thanks. Cordial, free walk. I want to speak to John about Lem Wheeler tonight and I prefer having a clear head. And offer a more logical argument than the last time. You'll come to see it my way yet. Maybe. But it'll take a lot of talk. Lem Wheeler's a friend of yours and of mine. But that stock deal of his was crooked and he ought to be sent up. There are some hundreds of old men and women who saw their entire life savings flying through the window. Sure, no, 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 no. That's all I hear around this place. And now you, Jack King, of all people bringing up that subject, after the perfectly beautiful dinner I fed you. <laughs> Forgive me. I wanted to speak to John about Lem. Uh, that was really why I came tonight. Oh, really? I thought it was I. No. Although you're the reason for my never having married, I came tonight to talk with John. All right. Talk to him. Oh, Bob. Yes. Would you entertain your old mother? Why, I'd love to. Say, Jack, if you're going to go into a conference with Dad over Old Lamb Wheeler, you'd better hurry, because he's taking Mother Theater tonight, you know. No, I didn't know it. Yes, a big night. We thought perhaps you'd go with us. Sorry, I can't. I have an engagement. Ah, Flossie of the Follies, huh? No, Tilly of the Toilers. A meeting of the Labor Committee at the New Amsterdam Club. I think he's lying. Probably. You know, them brunettes ain't to be trusted. Oh, and besides, they do say that... Be kind, dear lady. What? That there's a certain well-known actress. There are many well-known actresses. Oh, but not as well-known as this one, around 68 Washington Square. Uh-oh. To me, that had all the earmarks of a nasty crack. It's the office, Mr. Clay. It's Mr. Wordsley. Oh, out again? All right. Thanks. Hello, Steve. All right, I'll attend to it. Yes, I'll be right down. And there you are. Meaning no theater? I guess you don't even have to ask me. It's the Nate extradition case. You forgive me? Oh, I suppose so. But I'm getting a bit fed up. Poor abused Mater. Listen, fair one. We let the lady of my heart go hang, and you and I'll hit all the high spots and let the lawyers and law go hang. Not tonight, little one. You're much too young. Oh. But then if Lothario Jack were to volunteer... What would happen to the labor situation at the Keene Company Steelworks? Or Tilly the Toiler. We can all go to blazes. I'm going to stay home and read Boccaccio. Sorry. She's four flushing. But the only Italian she knows is C.C. and Michelangelo. And maybe the fruit man down at the corner. Be late. Three or four o'clock. May not get home till morning. Uh, 
I'll drop you, Dad. I'm going over to Peg. All right. Will you let me off at my club? I'll sit in the rumble. Oh, come inside with us. We've lots of room. I'm sorry I have an engagement. It really is important. Oh, I dare say. Goodbye, Jack. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, Jack. I can't go into Lem's case with you tonight. Would you mind dropping down to the office in the morning? Anywhere you say. But I would like to go over his case with you. Will you come loaded for bear? I will. Good night, Esther. Good night, Jack. I'll see you in the morning, darling. Bye, Mom. I won't be late. Any messages, Drugger? Yes, sir. Miss Weston phoned. She said she'd be able to keep that appointment with you after all. She said you would understand. Very well. I won't need you anymore tonight, Drugger. You understand? Perfectly, sir. You're very adequate. The first duty of a gentleman's man is always to remember, to forget. That'll be all. Be here in time for breakfast in the morning. At ten. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. I thought I told you never to come here without letting me know first. Why, give me a key, my love. Suppose someone had been here when you opened that door. Tilly the toilet, for instance? Don't be a fool. Oh, I am somewhat of a fool, aren't I? But not fool enough to swallow that story about the business meeting. Not after all that gossip I picked up. Esther, listen to me. Ah, uh, don't lie, Jack. You lie very badly. To me, anyway. But I tell you, I... I have... know you're expecting someone. A business associate. A tall man with long black whiskers. Or are they red? Tell is his name. At times, you're exasperating. Oh, you should know, my love. You've seen me in all my moods and tenses. The present one is not at all becoming. Oh, I know. It's my dress. I'll slip into something more restful. I'll slip into these. You've always liked them. Mister, I want you to go home. What for? Didn't you hear John say that he wouldn't be home until the small wee hours? Oh, if anybody should drop in here, you can introduce me as your cousin Annabelle from Minneapolis. Does Tilly know that you have a cousin Annabelle from Minneapolis? Don't be ridiculous. Oh, don't let's quarrel. I have no idea of leaving here until I've seen Tilly. 
I've heard so much about her. I want to meet her. You're acting like a perfect fool. Oh, but I always was. Principally about you, my dear. You'll not get away with it. I won't be hounded. Anybody who wants to call will call in person. You're quite capable, aren't you? I'm capable. Capable of most anything. And make no mistake about that, Jack. You're positive there's no other way out. I must go to Washington. Uh, yes, sir. You know those District of Columbia rulings? Nate's case is slated for tomorrow morning. If it comes up, you'll never get him up there. I'm afraid you're right. Well, there's no one in the office can handle the extradition. I'm sorry, Chief, but I'm afraid you're going to have to hop the next train. All right, Simon Legree. Thank you. Jack's not at the club. They say he just dropped in for a moment and left. Tries a pardon, will you, Bob? Oh, uh, largely. Yes, sir. Well, uh, take care of the Sarah Mann's case and look into the Lem Wheeler matter further. I don't want to be rough on him, but make sure that things are as bad as they seem. He's an old friend, and while I'll prosecute, I don't want to persecute him. I understand, sir. All right. Thank you. They can't get Jack's apartment. They say his phone's out of order. That's too bad. He doesn't live far from Peg. I'll drop over and tell him if you want me to. Will you do that, Bob? Tell him about this Washington matter, and I'll see him the day after tomorrow. And uh, break the sad news to your mother. Well, that won't be so hot. You know, you were supposed to go to that musical tomorrow night. She sort of had her heart set on it. Well, you'll have to unset it. Well, okay, Governor. Take care of yourself, and bring home the bacon. I'll get Nate extradited if it can be done, but I don't know. Come on, Steve. Bye, Bob. Oh, uh, what about your clothes? I got a bag pack. We'll change on the train. I'll see you in a couple of days. <laughs> Come on, Governor. Great boy, Bob. <laughs> yes. Has he passed the state bar examination yet? Yes, he has. Well, if he's anything like his father, he'll make a great lawyer. Are you telling me? I couldn't expect it to go on forever. It just isn't in the cards. And besides, you have a husband. Darn decent chap. I've felt pretty low down at times. And what about your son? What if Bob should find out? Bob is not my son. What? He's John's son by his first wife. She died when he was born. We were married a few months later. On a rebound, I suppose you call it. John had some foolish idea about his son having a real mother's influence. It brought him up to think that I was his mother. A mother's influence, eh? So don't moralize to me about my duty to my family. It's a bit thick. Very well. If you prefer my being frank, we're through. I'm sick and tired of the whole mess. I never gave you a vow of constancy. And besides, there is someone else. How's that for simplicity? Most concise. Clearly and ably expressed. It would do credit to John. I was always noted for my clarity. I don't know. 
Somewhere, anywhere, for a while. Nathario flees. Out of the city and out of her life. Exactly that. Make it more like a French novel, Jack. What in the world are you doing here? Hello, Bob. Where's Jack? He's not here. Well, how did you get in, then? Well, I, uh... uh... Mother! No, I told him like that. Well, this is yours. What's it doing here? What was there between you and Jack? Answer me! Tell me! All right, Bob. I'll tell you. I loved him. And he said we were all through. That he was going away and I... Killed him. Oh, Mother. I think of poor Dad. Oh, you won't tell him. You won't give me up. No, no, of course not. But you've got to get out of here right away. Dad said, I've got to go. Wait a minute. Did anyone see you come up here? No. The elevator man? I didn't use the elevator. I never did. Oh, Bob, let me go. Wait. We've got to get all of your things out of here. Everything. Oh, I never thought of that. We've got to get them out of here right away. Can you remember them all? I think so. Good. Put them in a the bag. You got everything? I think so. You mustn't think. You've got to be sure. Yes, I'm sure. Oh, come on, Bob, let's go. Wait a minute. You can't go out the front way. Isn't there a service entrance? Yes, through the kitchen. This way. Here now. Go downstairs quietly and don't let anyone see you. Slip out the back entrance and take the subway. Don't take a taxi. But aren't you coming? I can't. Not now. I've got too much to do. What do you mean? Fingerprints to clean up. A motive to establish. I've got to make it look as though Jack caught a burglar and was killed by him. Oh, Bob, I'm so afraid. Oh, I don't doubt it. But pull yourself together. We'll put it over. Come now. Mr. Clay. Hello, Druggett. What's happening, sir? 
Why, uh, Mr. Keene just stepped out. He, uh, was just playing a little joke on him. A joke? Oh, I see. He asked me if I saw you to tell you he wouldn't need you anymore this evening. Yes. He told me so himself. He must have forgotten, sir. Excuse me. Joke, eh? Well, don't you think you've carried it rather far, Mr. Clay? Oh, Sam, and you two gentlemen, come in here, please. What is it, Leo? Will you please look in the bedroom? You killed him, sir. Did I? Leo, have you phoned to the police? No. The phone is smashed. You'd better run down the corner and see if you can find one. How did it happen? I don't know, sir. I came in and found Mr. Clay mussing up the furniture. He said he was playing a joke on Mr. Keene. A joke? Yes, sir. Then I went into the bedroom, and I found Mr. Keene lying on the floor, dead. But I... Daddy Clay. Hello, Peg. Did you see Bob? He wouldn't see me. He sent me out a note, though. He wants me to break our engagement. Said the notoriety must be killing me. And? What do you think, Daddy Clay? Good girl. Perhaps he'll explain to you. He hasn't yet. I don't understand it. Perhaps he can't explain. What do you mean, Mrs. Clay? We are all adults. I see no reason for beating around the bush. What could have been his motive? You mean there was another girl? I didn't say that, Peg. You know, even if he told me that himself, I don't think I believe him. Bob should consider his father. As district attorney, it's his duty to prosecute. Yes. But I've resigned. You're going to take up his case yourself? Defend him? Of course I am. He's my boy. I know him. This morning, I'll get the truth and the whole truth from him. As soon as he knows he's not talking to the district attorney, he'll tell me everything. His tongue was tied before, eh, Mother? Yes. Yes, of course. Well, excuse me, Mr. Clay. Bob is outside. Have him brought in, Steve. Yes, sir. I think you two better clear out. Bob and I have some business to transact. Oh, but I think we should stay. I think we should hear what Bob has to say. No, dear. I think Bob would rather talk to me alone. All right.
Hello, Peg. First time I ever remember you having to be dragged anywhere to meet me. Well, aren't you going to kiss me? Listen, Bob. You haven't told anyone yet whether you did or did not kill Jack. The papers have built up quite a case, but they're only the papers. I want you to know, dear, that whether you did or did not, nothing is different between us. It's like you, Peg, to say that. You're that kind. Thanks. I, I guess you'd better go now. Come on, Peg. I'm afraid you're in for a good grilling with your father. Don't worry, Mother. I'm not afraid of Dad. Good morning, Mr. District Attorney. Call me Dad, son. All right, then. Good morning, Dad. Sit down, Bob. Thanks. Now then, open up. To whom? You or the district attorney? I'm no longer the district attorney. I don't understand. I resigned this morning. But you... You didn't think that I'd find myself in the position of prosecuting you, did you? Oh, Dad. You must remember my boy, you're a clay. The clays always stick together. But your prospects, the governorship. What in thunder have my prospects got to do in this mess? We must consider you, reality. My prospects don't hold any weight in that balance. I see. That makes it just a little bit tougher. Just the other way. It simplifies everything. I'm not a half-bad lawyer defending you. I'll make some of these boys around here sit up. Now then, first of all, did you or did you not kill Jack Keane? You know the evidence. What do you think? I think you did. Well then, that's only the beginning. Why did you kill him? Come on, answer my question. If I did kill Jack Keene, the motive was something I can't discuss. Not even with you, Dad. What? I'm sorry, Dad. That's the way it is. I never heard of such a thing. How in blazes do you expect me to defend you? I don't know, I'm sure. I told you it was going to be tough. Son, you're mad. Perhaps that would be a good defense. But don't I'm you... sorry, Dad. Outside of your mother, you're the only thing on earth that I care about. I've held you on my knee. I've nursed you when you were ill. One time you nearly passed out with typhoid. I prayed a little then. We've been hunting and fishing together and we've had a lot of fun. Lots of times I've been mighty proud of you. Bob, Whatever your motives were for killing Jack, tell me. No matter how low down and shameful you think they were, trust me. Tell me. I have nothing to say, sir. But why? In heaven's name, why? Bob, it's I, your old man. Surely there's nothing you can't tell me. You know that.
You're trying me too far, son. How can I defend you if you don't confide in me? I don't know. Perhaps it would be better if you didn't. Bob, you listen to me. I told you I'd resign, that I was no longer district attorney. Well, that is true. But that letter has not yet gone to the governor. If you don't confide in me, if you don't let me help you, if you don't tell me the truth, you'll find me on the other side of the fence. I'll get that letter back from Wordsley. I'll prosecute you. I'll send you to prison. All right. Go ahead. Send me to prison. Astor. Peg. Wordsley. Come in here, please. Bob has seen fit not to confide in me. He will tell me nothing. I've informed him that unless he does, I'll withdraw my letter of resignation and prosecute him as any stranger would. I'll let the law take its course and protect the interests of the state. But I... Bob! Please say something. Tell your father. I... I can't, Peg. Words, Wordsley? Yes, sir. Hold up that letter of resignation and send Bob back where he belongs. Yes, sir. People, this is Robert Clay. The defendant will approach the bar for sentence. Have you any legal cause to show why sentence should not now be pronounced? None, Your Honor. Robert Clay, you have been duly tried by jury and found guilty of the crime of murder in the second degree. You having shown no legal cause why sentence should not be pronounced, I now sentence you for the crime of which you stand convicted. You are remanded to the custody of the sheriff to be by him delivered to the warden of the state penitentiary, there to be confined for the rest of your natural life. I'm sorry, Bob. It's all right, Mother. It's just what I expected. Goodbye. Well, goodbye, Peg. Oh, Bob. Come on, Dad. I got what was coming to me. You did exactly right. by any chance happen to be home about uh, three o'clock this afternoon, would you? I'd like to see you. Something very important. What for? Oh, uh, several things. How about it? I don't know what you're talking about. Of course I won't be home at three. Very well. Much better for me, then. I'll be home at three. Mr. Keene's apartment. I haven't closed it up yet. You'd better come down to see me. You see, I haven't told all that I know. Just who really killed Keene, for instance.
I'll expect you at three. What is it? What were you talking about in court? <laughs> A bit curious, eh? Naturally. My son has been sent to prison. Sad. Your husband's son, you mean. How did you know that? No, oh, that isn't all that I know, Mrs. Clay. Why, well, you didn't think for a moment that that affair you had with Mr. Keene was kept from me, did you? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. Now, let's not beat around the bush. Here's the whole thing in a nutshell. I was here the night that you so nonchalantly put a bullet into the back of Mr. Keene's handsome but rather dumb head. That's a lie. No, it isn't. Now, sit down, and I'll tell you how it happened. I was here when your boy came in and watched from the pantry closet as he let you out the back way. Then I slipped out after you and came up the front. The rest you know. You heard me tell it on the witness stand. Now, how is that for an interesting anecdote? What do you expect to gain? Hmm. What do you suppose? Money. Maybe. You are a fool. How do you expect them to believe such a crazy story? You told a different one on the stand. You perjured yourself. There's a penalty for that. You have no substantiation for the story you just related to me. Oh, haven't I? No. I have all the letters that you wrote to Mr. Keene. If they won't believe my unsupported word, they will certainly believe them, won't they? All right. What do you want me to do? <laughs> That's better. Now we're getting together. How did it, eh? Yes, sir. Thanks to you, Warden. Criminal procedure, eh? You graduated in the law, didn't you? Yes, sir. I have a degree. I'm afraid it won't do me much good in here, though. Well, you never can tell. Stick right at it, and maybe you'll find some technicality that'll take you right out of here. I thought all the technicalities were expurgated, along with lock picking and safe blowing. <laughs> Say, I don't like this one. What's the matter with it? Well, read that. Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Come on. You just gotta buck up. He is alive. Well. He'd have made a fine lawyer, Peg. And a better husband, Danny Clay. young woman. You're spending altogether too much time here trying to buck me up. Oh, nonsense. Why, I'm a social butterfly. I'm even going out amongst them tonight. I think that's what Bob would like. Yes, I think he would. 
Do you find much uh, eyebrow lifting? Mm, some, but it doesn't bother me. <laughs> oh, hello, Peg. Oh, hello, Mrs. Clay. Hello, dear. Are you going out? Why, why, yes. Oh, Rose called. She wants me to go over to the Gainsborough Galleries with her to look over uh, Steve White's paintings. Why, I thought that exhibit closed last Thursday. John, you're getting old. It's next week. Oh, well, perhaps you're right. May I drop you? The car's outside. No, thank you. You're going downtown and I'm going uptown. Goodbye, John. Don't wait up for me. Good night, Daddy Clay. Good night, Peg. Thanks for coming in. What do you mean, thanks? Well, we don't talk about uh, things, except when you're here. Well, probably the subject is too close to Mrs. Clay, too. You know what I mean. Hmm, probably. Well, have a good time tonight out amongst them. I'll try. Good night. Good night. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Here we are, once more in the little old rendezvous. Get the letters, please. No, now wait a minute, don't rush me. Let me get you a scotch and soda. I don't care for anything to drink. Are you getting awfully unsociable all of a sudden? You had one the last time you came. That was the last time. And this is the last time too, eh? Yes. All right. You know, I'm going to miss these little tete-a-tetes. They've been most enjoyable. Drug it, please. Bring me the letters. Let's get it over with. All right, all right. But don't be impetuous. It's gotten you into trouble at odd times. Sit down. Now, don't worry, my dear. You're going to get your precious letters all right. And I'll be good, too. But you must admit that you're a bit of a temptation. So you can hardly blame me for making up to you under the circumstances. No, I suppose not. It's all my own fault. And ladies that kill their sweeties and have their sons go to jail for them 
shouldn't be so particular. You know Bob isn't my son. Yes, I know. But he certainly acted like one, taking the blame and keeping his mouth shut, didn't he? Oh, I suppose so. Get me the letters. All right. Yours to command. Now, there you go. Impetuous as ever. There's a little matter of $5,000 to be attended to first. All right. Here it is. Thanks. Do you mind if I count it? Oh, no. Big pardon, sir. What is it, Charles? Miss Harper on the wire, sir. Oh, thanks. Hello, Peg. Daddy Clay, listen. I've just found out something. Bob didn't kill Jack Keene. What are you talking about, Peggy? What are you up to? Look, come to Washington Square, to Jack Keene's apartment. Hurry, just as fast as you can. Five thousand green dollars. Guaranteed to be legal tender by our great and glorious country. I thank you. Now the letter. Now don't rush. You're going to get yourself into trouble rushing things someday. Suppose I told you that in looking over my accounts, I find that 5000 isn't enough for my needs. We made a bargain. I paid it. I went through a great deal of trouble to get the money. So hand them over, please. You haven't answered my question. Do you really want me to? Uh-huh. If you go back on your bargain... I'd simply take the letters. I've rather a nasty temper when I'm aroused. Here they are. I, I was only fooling. Thanks. I'll count them and make sure they're all here. Oh, uh, Mrs. Allen isn't quite here. She wants you to come up. Oh, thanks. Has anyone come out in the last few minutes? Come out? What do you mean? Any of the tenants of the building. Why, no. Oh, uh, Mr. Wilcox just went out. No one else? No. Thanks. Oh, never mind. I'm waiting for someone. All right, Druggett. They seem to be all here. Light a fire for me. You're going to get rid of them without delay, huh? They've been in existence too long as it is. What is it, Peg? Oh, Daddy Clay, Bob is innocent. It's too bad. You didn't do that some time ago. It would have been much cheaper. Well, better late than never. Yes, sir. What did you want? Esther, what are you doing here? Tell me, what are you doing here? Why, I... What are I, those? I, Give them to me. Oh, please, please. Let me see them. I see. You and Jack Keene, eh? Huh? And because of this, you killed him. I don't know what you mean. Don't try to lie, Esther. Peg was here. She heard you and drug it. She knows the whole truth. And Bob knew it, too. To save you, he took the blame. And we know the truth at last. Before it's too late. What are you going to do? Do? What do you suppose? John, I'm your wife. 
Hmm. For you. For this. I sent my boy, the thing I love best on earth, to prison. Oh, you've got to listen. Listen to what? What can you explain with all we know? Give me those letters. Give them to you? Yes, give them to me. No one's going to see them, you understand? No one's going to see them. Give me that gun. Daddy Clay! She deserved it. If anyone ever deserved it, she did. You remember the testimony that Miss Harper gave, don't you? Yes. She told you it was your wife that killed John Keene, not your son. Yes. It was an answer to a telephone call from Miss Harper that you went to Keene's apartment, wasn't it? Yes. And when you found your wife there, and she refused to give you those letters, you killed her, didn't you? No, I did not. I had no intention of harming her. It was an accident. Now, Miss Harper, from where you stood, could you see what took place in the bedroom? No, sir. And you did see the deceased stagger and fall to the floor? Yes, sir. What did you say when the defendant appeared from behind the curtain, revolver in hand? I said, Daddy Clay, she's dead. What did he say? Come on, answer. He said, if anyone deserved it, she did. What he meant was, that he thought she deserved killing, wasn't it? I object. The prosecution is leading the witness. Objection sustained. That's all. Your witness. No cross-examination. They got the old boy dead to rights. Witnesses, the best motive in the world and everything. Dad, we've got but one chance. That's encouraging. What is it? Let me sum up. You? Take a chance on me, will you? Any time. Go ahead. Thanks. The state rests, Your Honor. The defense rests, Your Honor. How long will you gentlemen require for arguments? The defense is ready to present its case, Your Honor. I can sum up in a few minutes. Very well, you may proceed. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is my first address. I'm just a fledgling lawyer, but a duly accredited member of the bar. And as such, privileged to speak, to plead with you for the life of the defendant, my father. You all know him. You know him as the district attorney of the county, a fearless prosecutor. You know him as a citizen. The political party of which he is a member has named him its prospective candidate for governor. And I know him as a father. Now I'm not going to bore you with the details of my early childhood. Needless to say, it was very happy. School, college, hunting and fishing trips with the defendant. Wherein I learned to know him for the man he is. And he loved me. I was more to him than his modest wealth, his fame, his hopes. Then, ladies and gentlemen, a murder was committed. My father's wife was false to him. She chose another, a man about town. And when he tired of her, she killed him, shot him to death. It so happened I learned of her crime and was able to save her from her just deserts. Oh, I take no credit for assuming her crime. I thought she was my mother. And I knew that the knowledge of it would break the heart of the man I loved. My life was in no danger. 
I knew that the state could not prove premeditation on my part and that the worst that would happen to me would be a prison sentence. But if my mother were brought to trial, it would mean her life. My father prosecuted me. With breaking heart, he demanded of 12 jurors that they condemn me, the thing he loved best in the world. He won and I was condemned. You who have sons may know his feelings as I was led away. Then came the night the world tumbled about him in chaos. He learned the truth. The woman he had cherished was false. She had not only defiled his honor, his home, but she had permitted him to send his own son to prison for life for the things she had done. I don't know whether John Clay killed that woman or not. I don't care. I only know that God reached down from his heaven and wiped from the face of the earth the supreme blot on all honor, truth, and love. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a law that transcends law, and it is up to you to decide whether John Clay shall be punished or not. Thank you. I told you he'd make a fine lawyer. I want to impress upon the witness the seriousness of this case. I want the truth and nothing but the truth. You understand? You realize that this young man's happiness is at stake, don't you? I do. You've known him for a long time, haven't you? Yes, I have. And on numerous occasions you have told him that you loved him, haven't you? I have. And in spite of the fact that you know that his character is not above reproach, you still feel the same way. I do. Very well. The witness is yours. We admit the truth of the testimony is given. There will be no cross-examination. Oh, Dan. <laughs> and now, before the next show starts, let's enjoy an intermission. You'll find our snack bar chock full of good things to eat and drink. Tasty, tempting hot dogs, thirst-quenching soft drinks, fresh, crunchy popcorn, a complete assortment of delicious candy, and a full line of cigarettes. You've plenty of time, so visit the snack bar now. A tasty treat will double your enjoyment of the show. For your convenience, we shall keep you informed of the remaining intermission time, three minutes before the next show starts. time for a tempting snack.
open during the show. are now below the deadline, the financial and diamond district. Here there are more diamonds by the square foot than any part of the world, including the Transvaal. Good afternoon, Captain. Hello, Peter. Oh, hello, Captain Tyler. Hello, Molly. Mr. Draven is expecting me. Thank you. How are you, Mr. Abrams? Oh, good afternoon, Captain. Sit down. Hey. Have a cigar? Well, thank you. What's on your mind? Uh, these diamonds. These and a lot more to come. And, uh, oh, pardon. This is Mr. Everly, Captain Simon. Mr. Everly? I'm glad to know you, Captain. Mr. Everly and I are negotiating a very large consignment of diamonds, and we thought that you should be warned about it. A wise precaution. Are you collecting the consignment here? Yes, they're for my firm in Chicago. But uh, they're not to be shipped for nearly a week. Well, don't worry. We've got a pretty good line on all the boys in town, and not one of them would dare to shove his nose below the deadline. I'll just tell my men to keep their eyes peeled, and if they do see anybody below the deadline that looks suspicious at all, to bring them in for questioning. Oh, by the way, uh, where is your deadline now, Captain? Still Canal Street? Yes. And if any of them come south of that line, it'll be just too bad. Well, so long. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, I know where to get a nice solitaire for you, Molly, as soon as you give Terry Mulvaney the gate. You'll be too old by that time, Captain Simon. Oh, you're never too old. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> yes, sir. All right, good day, Captain. Goodbye. Oh, well, Miss Fitzgerald, would you mind working an hour or two later tonight? Certainly not, Mr. Raven. Then as soon as you're through, bring in your notebook. Hello, Molly McDonald. Terry, dear, I have to work late tonight, so don't wait for me. I'll have supper downtown. You can meet me near the subway entrance around nine. <laughs> sure, darling, I'll be there with me buttons all shine. Right. Good 
Good evening, sister. How about a left? Harry! What's the matter, darling? Oh, just a would-be Casanova. And what's that? Oh, a fellow that thinks that offering a girl a lift is a driver's license. Is that so? I'll take care of him. Oh, don't you worry about a little thing like that. Do you think I'd exchange your homely face for anything in the world? No, wait a minute. What was that crack? It goes for me too, darling. Hello, Annie dear. Well, good evening, Miss Tiverton. How are you this evening? Why do people always think it's polite to ask silly questions? Well, well, look who's here. <laughs> Have you had your supper? Yes, thank you. Hmm. Glass of milk and a sandwich, I suppose, standing up at some lunch counter. Oh, well, this rush will soon be over, and then I'll have my evenings to myself again. Would you like some tea, Terry? Uh -huh. I'm a fixer. <laughs> well, are you still here? I thought it was time for you to be going home instead of coming here visiting. Well, I suppose it is a little late for elderly people, but Molly and me won't mind if you want to go to bed. If you expect me to resent that, you're wrong. Why on earth don't you sit down? You've been on your feet all day, haven't you? I tell you that I have. Good poor dogs. Every time I make them walk, they, they get sore. And when are you going to get this advancement you're after? Well, the exams are in June, and by July you'll see me a full-fledged detective. Then crime will automatically cease, I suppose. Oh, no, not immediately. You see, there's the honeymoon first. Terry Mulvaney, if you don't make Molly the happiest wife in the world, you'll have me to answer to. It won't be for the want of time. Molly needs a rest. That man Abrams works her too hard. I don't know what people want with diamonds anyway. Useless things. And yet, if they can't buy them, they steal them. Oh, no, not much chance these days. Rot. Half the crimes in the world are never solved. Well, here, let me hold it for you. Hmm. Well, at last I found a use for a policeman. Oh, I don't know. Molly found one. <laughs> Did you ever try it? Are you two still bickering? <laughs> let me help you. Well. What are you sewing on now, darling, if I'm permitted to ask? A pillow slip, Mr. Mulvaney, for that red head of yours. You'd think you two were married already. When I was a girl, no young lady would have said such a thing. Did you faint to, or was it sworn? I think you'd better confine yourself to questions of more importance. Have you got your book, Terry? Oh, yes, sir. When an officer takes a prisoner into custody, what is his duty? To search the prisoner for weapons and uh, evidence and conduct him directly to the station using every care to prevent his escape. Good. Under what circumstances is a policeman legally justified in using his pistol? Hmm? What's that correct? Under what circumstances is a policeman legally justified in using his pistol? And let me tell you, Flash, even if she wouldn't give me a tumble, that Fitzgeraldine can have my role any time she gives me the come on. What's she got that the others don't have? A oh boy. She's got everything. Hold on, Spike. We're not mixing pleasure with business. She didn't fall for you. So now we got to find out some other way when Avery is going to ship those diamonds. Rocks fascinate you, don't they? <laughs> How do you think I got the name Diamond Dutch? Chasing after fluffs? Maybe not, but I never saw you pass one up. Right. But when there's a job on hand, I don't play with fire. You never saw me get burned. Well, I'm getting plenty burned right now. Here we are, all set to make the biggest haul that's ever been pulled. And all you can think about is some dame that you've never even seen. But I'm going to see her. Tomorrow, I think. And we better call the whole deal off. When you fall for a new fluff, I know what happens. So do I. But I can also defer the pleasure to an appropriate time. Don't worry, Dutch. I've seen her play a fish for months before she took the hook. All right. But when does Abrams get in the balance of that consignment? That's all I want to know. Why pull this job a day too soon? 
when by waiting another day we could get maybe a hundred grand more. What do you bet I can find out by tomorrow night? Come on, I'll split a grand with you. Five hundred apiece. Okay. That's a bet. You can land that Fitzgerald name. You've got it coming. Mr. Right, young lady. And you are Miss... Uh... Yes, Mr. Abrams, secretary. Can you wait a moment, please? With pleasure. I come to look for a diamond, and behold, I find a pearl. Uh, uh, careful. So many synthetic pearls on the market these days. Ah, but then I'm an excellent judge. Professional, I would think. On the contrary. Amateur in its literal sense. Mr. Abrams, Mr. Ackroyd to see you. Can you go in, please? Sorry I'm so late. I suppose it's about your closing time. Oh, it's never closing time when we have a client. Won't you sit down? You said over the phone you were looking for stone of about uh, five carats. Yes. A yarder. Send in the stones I selected for Mr. Ackroy. Oh, that looks like a very fine stone you have in your ring. May I see it? Yes. I picked that up in uh, Hatton Garden. Why, ah, you know diamonds. <laughs> it's perfect. Can you match it? Well, you can judge for yourself. I use your glass? Certainly. Aren't you going home, Molly? Doesn't look like it, does it? I had a date, too. Woman proposes, but business disposes. <laughs> well, I'll be glad to get home and dispose of that corned beef and cabbage that's waiting for me. These are the best, but neither is as good as mine. I'm afraid you're right, but I shall have more in Thursday, and I think finer ones. Could you call then? I'm not sure, but um, I think I could make it Friday. Well, I'm very sorry, but they'll be gone then. Hmm. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a thousand for that one. Miss Fitzgerald, make out a receipt for Mr. Ackroyd for $1,000. So that's that. Here's your receipt, Mr. Ackroyd. Thank you. I'm sorry to have been the cause of keeping you so late, but uh, perhaps I can drive you home. Well, I am rather late. Then why don't you let Mr. Hatchford take you home? All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, not so bad. Wouldn't you take me on approval for a while? Someone else? There's the proof. Hello, Terry. This is Mr. Ackroyd, Officer Mulvaney. Glad to know you indeed. And so you're the reason she was so anxious to get home. Meaning what? Well, you see, Mr. Abrams and I kept her a little late, and uh, I offered to make amends. Oh, so you're a friend of Mr. Abrams, well, that's different. I'm afraid I don't follow. Oh, Terry thought you were another smart aleck, like the one that tried to pick me up the other night. Well, I uh, might be sorely tempted, but uh, 
I don't think I've tried. I uh, seem to be a better judge of character than you are. Well, uh, good night, Mr. Mulvaney. Good night, Mrs. Jell. Thanks again, Mr. Ackerman. Don't mention it. What's the matter? You don't seem to like the gentleman. I do not. Oh, Terry, you need never be jealous of me. As a matter of fact, I only accepted his offer so that I wouldn't keep you waiting. Well, who is he? All I know is that he just bought a diamond for a thousand dollars. I thought he was another one of those mashes, like the one last night. Uh -uh. I'm not that foolish. <laughs> You're in love with me, ain't you? Uh-huh. Hmm. Yes, Spike? You're right. She had to be seen to be appreciated. Yeah, I thought she'd appeal to your sense of proportion. Yeah. Now I have another object in life. And now a snog interferes with a hundred grand, huh? You'd better dig for 500, Dutch. You too, Spike. Did you find out? I not only got a good look at the office, but I found out that the consignment will be complete on Thursday night. To top it off, I drove the young lady home. That wins the bet, I think, Dutch. <laughs> You're a wonder, Flash. Yeah. Well, it cost me a grand to do it. I bought that one. Only worth 800. Well, I'll get most of it back. Take a look at the girl's writing, Spike. Could you imitate it? So she couldn't tell the difference herself. What's on your mind? She seems to prefer an Irish harness bull to me. Meaning what, he says. Oh, so you're a friend of Mr. Abrams. Well, that's different. Figure I'd like to push the ugly mug of him down his own throat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, forget it. We got to think about this job ahead of us. That's just what I'm doing, Dutch. When you're pulling a big job, it's always safer to have some goat to take the rap. Sure. It satisfies the public and gives the cops a chance to save their faces. Right. And this is where I kill two birds with one stone. Officer Mulvaney will be the goat, and Miss Fitzgerald will be... In uh, circulation again. But how are you going to do all this? It's easy. Just practice on our handwriting, Spike, and we'll send Terry a billy do on Thursday. I'm glad I'm not on duty down here every night. It's too quiet. Yeah, I'd rather be uptown myself. Hello, boys. Well, no pinch tonight, Palmer? Oh, I think the captain's crazy. There's no one below the deadline tonight. Five thousand bucks worth that have to be towed in. Yeah, the best of them cracked up. Give me my old sliver. It's never let me down yet. Fetch wood. Better make the rounds again, boys. Okay, see you in jail. Right. Okay, Flash. See anybody? Pass three balls and they never give us a tumble. Let's get going then. All right. Hey, just a minute, buddy. 
Well, for crying out loud, what are you doing down here? Well, what's the matter with you, Bill? You got the jitters? Who is it? Why, it's Brick Top Mulvaney from 14th Street. Yeah, and don't go be saying anything at the station about seeing me down here or I'll wipe up the floor with you. Oh, you know me, Terry. Yes, I know all of you. So long. So long. Hey, what's the gag? Oh, nothing. We've been ribbing him at the station about being in love. He's got a girl works down here. <laughs> well, we've seen somebody anyway. Yeah, let's shove off. Number 47, Sishfield Necklace. Check. Number 3. Mr. Fitzgerald, call the express company now. Number 54, tray of 15 brooches. Check. Number 4. The line seems to be dead. What? Stick him up. All of you. Good work, Terry. Terry. Shut up. And let that be a lesson to all of you. Keep your hat on your mug. You want that brick top to give you away? Now turn to the wall, all of you. Start now. Move over. Keep them up. Guys, I'm looking for. Put him up. Put him up. Put him up. What's the rib? Cut out the innocent stuff. Now, wait a minute. This is no time for kidding. You've got to help me find the guys that slugged me. I wish we were kidding, Terry, but you're under arrest. Under arrest? Well, what am I under arrest for? Murder and robbery of the Abrams office. Oh, no, wait a minute. The Abrams office? Well, how about Molly? Is she hurt? You ought to know you were there. You can't get away with this. Abrams recognized you and your plug Peters. They all heard the other two call you by name. And even if they hadn't, that rogue and red hair would give you away. We saw you heading for Abrams' office just before the stick-up. Oh, I must have been framed. Say, will you take me back to where they held me? You'll find the rope that was tied me up and the blindfold and the tape that was over my mouth. Wouldn't hurt to take a look. Even if we did, what would that prove? He could have planted them. I was slugged, I tell you. Sure, I was on my way to Abrams. But Molly asked me to call for her. Here, look at me, side pocket. You'll find a note from her. There's nothing there. You killed a guy in cold blood, Mulvaney, and it'll take more than a bluff to get you out of it. Oh, they must have frisked me after they slugged me. Oh, please, will you yeah, take Yeah, we'll take you back to Abrams' office. And Captain Simon's there, and you can tell it to him. Go ahead, Max, put him in. Rooney, put that handkerchief over his face. Now, we've got you, Mulvaney. You might just as well confess. But it couldn't be, Terry. Well, naturally, you wouldn't admit it. But I don't think it'll be very difficult to prove that you were his accomplice. Now, you leave her out of this. Mr. Abrams, is that the man who led the hold-up men? It is. Without a doubt, it is. I've seen Mulvaney many times. I couldn't be mistaken. Mr. Abrams, are you sure that he is the man that shot Peters? Yes, I'm sure he is. I was slugged, I tell you. All right, Bill. Take him away and lock him up. Oh, Terry. Terry. It isn't true, darling. I was framed. And I'm going to prove it. He's just putting on an act. Take him away. I have a few more questions that I want to ask you. Don't let them bully you, Molly, and don't you worry about me.
sorry, Bill, but I, I was framed and I can't prove it in jail. Yeah, two, six, five, three, two. I'll set it right out. Okay. Calling all cars. Attention, all cars. Mulvaney has escaped in a police car. License number 26532. He drove north on Avenue A. Block all roads and bridges leading from the city. He's handcuffed but armed. Bring him in, boys. That's all. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? There's nothing to be scared of, buddy. You do what I tell you. I want you to cut these handcuffs off of me. Yeah, but what'll they do to me for helping a prisoner escape? You're helping an innocent man, and you'll be glad of it one day. Come on, hurry up. And after they're off, you gonna plug me? I'll make a bargain with you. I won't harm a hair on your head if you keep still about this. All right. Calling all cars. Attention, all cars. Mulvaney reported seen on Lincoln Highway speeding west. Use special caution. He's probably listening to these broadcasts, so we can't give location of blockades. That is all. Come on, hurry up. Repeating broadcast 47. Mulvaney reported seen on Lincoln Highway speeding west. Step on it, Dave. We must be right on his tail. Thanks. He just left. He made me cut his handcuffs. He went in that direction. Wait a minute, look at your time, people. Do you belong in these parts? No, oh, this is this What's the next stop? Don't you know what train you're on? Oh, sure. Tipsy train. <laughs> no. You gotta go back to Hopeful Junction to get that. <laughs> Where to, sir? Albany. 585. Change at Pine Plains and Chatham. wired buildings. The man in section 9 answers the description exactly. Take a walk through, but don't let him see you look at him. And if you think he's the guy, we'll stop and send a wire ahead to the sheriff, Pine Plains. Right. Now look here, Mr. Gerald. I'm not as interested in the capture of Mulvaney as our friend the detective is. But I'm an investigator for the insurance company, and my job is to get the diamonds back. Are you going to help me, or are you not? I tell you again, I know nothing. I don't believe Terry had anything to do with it. Wasn't it because you saw him that you fainted? I didn't see him. Terry didn't do it. Then why did you call him by name? I didn't. One of the men called the murderer Terry. I repeated the name in amazement. Never thought it was Terry Mulvaney. Yet you admit you tipped him off. I only told him I wouldn't have to work late after the diamonds were shipped first. Same thing. Are you in the habit of fainting? No. But you did faint at the most convenient time, didn't you? Oh, yes, I did. 
Thanks. Hello? This is Stenton calling by request, Bill. Hi, Diddle Diddle, the captain of the fiddle. What's that? You got him? That's great, okay. You don't know anything, huh? Then let me tell you something. Mulvaney's been caught and he's confessed and he said that you were in on it. I don't believe it. James up, girlie. You'd better cut out the bluffing. You're doing the bluffing. If Terry had been caught, don't you think you would have been overjoyed? Instead, you sat there and watched my reaction. <laughs> you better learn to act. Sorry, I can't say the same thing to you. But I'm very glad to know just how clever you are. Well, they both think they're clever. Mulvaney has as much chance of getting away as the well-known dog with rubber legs has. How's this? Feel certain passenger on number 19 is Mulvaney, wanted for murder. Meet train at Pine Plains. I hope there's a reward out for him. Maybe there is. We'll stop at Clinton and shoot this ahead. Poor devil. Look at his face. What was it, face? Hey, John, we found the body to conduct in the brakeman. Well, who are you? And who asked you to come in? If I waited to be asked, I'd be on the outside most of the time. Oh, I see she's read the news. Are you one of the detectives? No such luck. Death did their work for them. I still have to find the diamonds. But well, you won't find them here. And I hope you'll have the decency to respect the poor girl's grief. I have the decency, ma'am. But I haven't got the time. Perhaps she'll talk now. More than she did last night. Are you ready to talk now? What do you want? You know what they want. The diamond. Can't you leave me alone? Can't you understand anything? Terry didn't do it. And now he can never prove it. He proved that he did do it, you mean? You think that getaway of his was an act of innocence? Not on your life. It wasn't, Mr. I tell you. You expect to find the diamonds behind the pictures or under the carpet? Molly said she lived with her aunt. Are you Miss Tibbet? None of your business. I make a lot of things my business. In fact, I sometimes act like an old woman. Oh, no offense, madam. No offense. If you think you can get me angry that way, you're mistaken. And if you're through, there's the door. 
Who were Mulvaney's Confederates? He had no Confederates. He didn't do it. He didn't. Come on now, Molly. Terry's dead. See those guys that let him down and get all the gravy, do you? I don't know what you mean. You know what I mean. Those fellas have framed him. That's why they called him by his name. You don't want to see them spit Jack while Terry and Cole... Stop it. Don't you think I've suffered enough? Yes, he did. You who killed him. You with your false accusation. You drove him to it. Somewhere the real criminal was laughing at you. Laughing at your stupidity. I'd laugh too. I'd like to laugh. But Terry, the joke's on him too. Think he can pull through? Oh, he'll be all right. I'll probably have to do a little plastic surgery on his face. Then you'll be in your element. Well, it's always interesting to try to improve upon nature. Wonder who the beggar is. There's no identification. On. Well, we'll find out soon. He'll recover consciousness now that I've removed the pressure. Suit. You're telling me? Well, everything still seems to be under control. Sure. The Dicks haven't the ghost of an idea that that was our job. They're still sure it was Mulvaney. But the cops are still watching every fence for the stones. Certainly. Why not? Every time there's a job pulled, the guys make the same mistake. They want to cash in right away. So they peddle the stuff while it's hot, and they're picked up. I tell you, Dutch, we have the right idea. Handle each job like a legitimate business, and don't expect any profits for the first year. And that's why we're still in business, and never even an entry on the blotter against us. Well, those Abram diamonds are staying undercover for a year. Okay, with me. Now I suppose you're going after the dame. Not yet, Dutch. I know women. And I know that Molly Fitzgerald is still thinking of Mulvaney as a martyred hero. Nurse tells me that you're feeling a little better. Do you think that you can answer a few questions? There was no identification in the remains of your clothes, so we don't even know your name. O'Malley. Ted O'Malley. Ted O'Malley. Uh, have you any relatives or friends that we can notify? Uh, by the way, what kind of a nose did you have? I mean, I shall have to build up your nose from practically nothing. Couldn't you get me a photo to go by? I'm afraid he's a little too weak yet, Doctor. Oh, well, I, I'll give him a classical one. Jennings, if I thought I had any brains, I'd blow them out. What's the matter? But wouldn't it be a terrible thing to drill a hole in one skull and find it empty? Am I to gather that you're still thinking of that Mulvaney case? I start up in the middle of the night thinking about it. I'm afraid your vanity is wounded. Wounded? It's mutilated. So much time has passed and not a single clue. And a fortune in diamonds disappears. A strange case, all right. I'm going to see that Fitzgerald girl again. I think she must be bluffing. Where's your winter coat? Oh, I sold it. I won't need it. Well, this is your business, Molly. But I'd like to see anybody try to force me to leave town. You don't seem to understand, Annie. I'm branded as a thief. Nobody will give me a job here. Don't forget you'll always have a home here. Remember that. Oh, that must be the man for my trunk. I'm going to fix you a lunch to eat on the train. 
Mr. Blackwood. May I come in? I certainly. I'm just leaving town. You mean for good? Yes. Oh, I didn't know it was as bad as that. I haven't seen Mr. Abrams again until today, and of course I learned that you were no longer there. I suppose you also learned that I was a thief. Do you remember that I prided myself on being a good judge of character? Yes, but I don't quite... Uh, may I sit down? Of course. I heard about the robbery at the time, but I had no idea that you were supposed to be implicated. I wasn't. You don't have to tell me. That's what I meant when I said I was a judge of character. Thank you. I also gather from Abrams that uh, no one will employ you. What do you expect? Of course they won't. I will. What do you mean? I'm interested in the Alhambra, the restaurant and night spot on 50th. There is a vacancy for a day cashier. You mean you're offering me a job like that? I am? I have the courage of my convictions. How can I ever thank you? By reporting for work at 10 in the morning. Yes, we, we can leave the bandages off now. <laughs> sure, Doc, and that won't make me mad. Uh, no, I suppose it probably won't, but uh, evidently you would like to see what I've done for you. That I would. Well, O'Malley, how have I done? Hey, don't break all my fingers. Well, Doc, that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> and I doubt very much whether I'll ever be able to again. But evidently you, you approve. Tell me, is it as good as the original? Well, Doc, I think it's a bit improvement. And if it wasn't for me head, I wouldn't even know myself. Well, you know, you, you really could dye that and have a little joke with your friends. Huh? Oh, yes. It would be a joke, wouldn't it? Well, I'm really glad that you're pleased. And the railroad company will be, too. You'll probably let them down easier. Uh, what do you mean? Why, the insurance adjuster has been here several different times. They offer to settle with you for $2,000 in cash and all your hospital bills. $2,000? Yes, and you won't have to go to court and give half of it away to some attorney. $2,000? Well, that would come in handy. Why, yes, of course it would. Uh, incidentally, here's uh, the check that the insurance adjuster left and uh, also his form of a release. Uh, you can sign that if you care to. It's entirely up to you. <laughs> Doc, I wonder if I could have that in cash. Why, I, I suppose so. Just endorse the check and I'm quite sure they'll cash it. Come in. Thank you, sir. Won't you sit down? You're the investigator employed by the insurance company on the Abrams robbery. Correct. Well, sir, I'd like to write her wrong. Commendable ambition, but I don't see the point. Well, Mr. Pearson, it's only a hunch, but a faith in human nature. Would you mind telling me who you are and what you are? Well, I'm just a dumb bug. I'm training over here at Artie Nolan's, and I come from Colorado. And I had a brother here on the farce, and he got into a bit of trouble. We were pals from the time we were kids, and I'm sure that he'd never do anyone any harm. Mr. Pearson, that man was Terry Mulvaney. Mulvaney? Yes, Terry Mulvaney. Now I have a bit of money and I'd like to use it to clear his name. Have you seen the police? No. The cops are only looking for convictions. He was wanted for murder. His death closed the case. Now you have no axe to grind or politics to play. That's right. I'm a private individual, responsible only to myself and the insurance company. And your object is to recover the stolen property? Right again. You may be a pub, but you're by no means dumb. Now, your brother told a queer story to the police. But if his story was true, who framed him? And what reason could they have? <laughs> that I don't know, but it gave you and the cops a wrong steer, didn't it? <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. By the way, you happen to know where I can find his gal. I don't know what address, but her name is uh, Fitzgerald. Just a minute. I'll look it up for you. Miss 
Jennings. Get the Mulvaney file. Quick, the fingerprint record. Identical. He's our man. As long as you know the town, I'll show you over to Miss Fitzgerald. Oh, well, that's, that's, oh, that's, that's all right. Only be careful not to shock her. Remember, she thinks you're dead, Terry. How did you know? Because your yarn sounded phony. I watched you closely and decided that your hair might have been dyed. So I proceeded to get your fingerprints in my cigarette case, and they compared exactly with the ones found on the stolen police car. If you think I wanted to be a detective? You're doing all right. We're going to work together on this case. I take it that's what you want. Why, that's more than I expected. Tell me, how did you work this substitution with the dead man? Well, I heard a couple of the Rick and crew say that his face was all gone, so when they went for the stretcher, I... Emptied my pockets into his. Quick thinking, my lad. Yeah, but I didn't think very long. When I come to, I was in the hospital. And the nurse was reading the newspapers to me. In other words, you woke up and found yourself dead. That's about it. Well, you've awakened to plenty of worry. And we've got to solve this case before the police get on to you. <laughs> they won't ever get on to me. Because I really have got a brother, Ed, in Colorado. Does Molly know that? Sure. Why? Then you've got to remain Ed. Even to her. <laughs> oh, I could never fool Molly. <laughs> the doctor didn't change me that much. Well, you must try. You know, brothers sometimes look very much alike. Well, I want Molly to know that I ain't dead. All right. Tell her Terry escaped to your place in Colorado. And you came east to clear up the case. Well, couldn't I? No, no, you can't take that chance with Molly. She might give you away by word or look. And at a time like this, that'd be too much of a risk. So, come on. <laughs> You're a hard man. I saw Pearson outside talking to a guy. Pearson? All the insurance companies lose. Forget him. What'd you find out? Well, we can get rid of a few grand's worth. It's safe enough now. You don't think Pearson means anything? Not a thing. He used to park on Molly's trail, but he's given that up. Well, I still claim you shouldn't have given that name a job here. Why? Well, Fluffs have brought down bigger guys than you, Fred. Oh, forget it. Pour yourself a drink. I just wanted you to meet a friend of mine. This gentleman here has convinced me that Mulvaney was innocent. Terry! No, Ed. Terry told you about me, didn't he? Would you mind if we sat down? Of course not. Yes, Terry did tell me about you, but... You might be his twin. No, is that nice? Here I thought I was much better looking. You talk like him, too. Of course, your hair is darker and your nose is different, but if Terry weren't dead... He's not dead, Molly. He escaped from the train wreck. He's not dead? Are you sure? Have you seen him? Yes. He's at my place in Colorado. Is he well? As well as I am, and I never felt better in my life. Now, if you'll dance with me, I'll tell you all about him. Oh, I'm glad you're having a dance in this jam. I want to tell Auntie. Can we all go home and you can tell me on the way? No, wait a minute, wait a minute. How about your supper? Oh, I'm glad you're happy to eat. Come on, Mr. Pearson. No, you two run along. I'll stay here. Hey, boss. Pearson and that egg we saw him with outside was talking to Molly. She's acting up like a two-year-old.
Now, don't you get scared the next time you see me. Good night, Ed. And you be careful. Careful of what? Oh, you know, a nice young fellow and a pretty girl and a romantic moon. Must I tell you the rest of that? Come on, Mr. Mulvaney. Boss, looks like you've been asleep at the switch. Mr. Ackroyd's kindness, I'd still be out of work. Isn't that right? That's right. Now look, if it's some money that you're needing, my Oh, have. no, I couldn't think of it. I'm doing nicely now. Young man, your heart's in the right place, but I can't say the same for your brain. I'm married. Now, wait a minute. Maybe Miss Tibbet is right. I'm always right. I objected to your brother as a policeman, but no young man in his senses would ever take up prize fighting as a profession. Look now. How about Gene Tunney? He seems to have done all right for himself. As soon as he got any sense, he quit. Just the same, I want you to know that you brought more happiness into this house than has been here for many a day. I like you. <laughs> Thanks. You know, that goes for the both of us, and if I wasn't in love already, I'd be asking you to marry me. Oh, go along with you. You're just another Terry yourself. <laughs> Good night, and God bless you. I guess I'd better be going, too. Oh, no. I want to hear it all over again. Again? Oh, my dear child, I told you in the taxi, and I told you in the park, and I'm just after telling your Aunt Mary here. I know, you're a darling. I didn't mean to say that. Well, what's wrong with calling me a darling? I don't know. Something just came over me. I suppose it's because I'm so grateful to you, Mr. Mulvaney. I thought you promised to call me Ed. What's the matter? I don't know, Ed. I think I've known you forever. <laughs> Just the way I want you to feel. You don't understand. Please go. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? For what? I was going anyway. I suppose you think I'm crazy. I feel crazy. After all these months of anxiety, you suddenly appear and sweep it all away. I want you to know how happy you've made me. And how grateful I am to you. You shouldn't have done that. You misunderstood. I think not. But it isn't fair. You know I'm engaged to Terry, and you said you were in love with somebody else. I said no such thing. You did. You told Aunt Mary. You meant? All fair in love and war. Good night, Molly, dear. Has he gone? Oh, Aunt Mary, what will I do? Oh, what's the matter, Molly? Oh, I know it's terrible, but the boy's mannerism. I thought sure it... Sure of what? He was Terry. Oh, <laughs> don't be crazy. They're almost dead ringers, it's true. But Terry wouldn't dare show his face around here. <laughs> there, there. <laughs> Yes, come here. Sit down, Molly. I want to have a talk with you. Cigarette? No, thank you. You have a good time last night? Yes, I heard some splendid news. Why do you ask? Well, I happened to see you go out with, uh... Mr. Mulvaney. Mulvaney? Yes, he's a pugilist. Oh, a fighter, eh? I never heard of him. He's Terry's brother from Colorado. He's training with Artie Nolan now. So if it isn't one Mulvaney, it's another. Why do you say that? Look, I've been pretty nice to you, haven't I? I've left you alone and never bothered you. 
Waiting until you got that crook Mulvaney out of your mind. Now, don't interrupt. I'll do the talking. I wasn't going to say anything until you got rid of the blues. And now, when I see you're happy for the first time, it's with another guy. Don't I deserve a better deal than that? I'm sorry. I had no idea you felt that way. Listen. You're not as dumb as that. Why do you think I gave you a job here when everybody else thought you were a crook? Mr. Pearson doesn't think so now. Listen, Molly. The cops have been on this case for months now, and there aren't any clues. If you think that he'll ever be proved innocent, you've got another thing coming. Even if he were, what's the matter with me? Don't you think I'm a better catch than an Irish harness bull with a brogue as thick as a shillelagh? Now, me darling, it's time you got wise to yourself and started being nice to the fine gentleman that's been nice to you. Wait a minute! Sorry, Flash. Well, I shall appeal to your reason in a more convenient time. You mean to bust in on the party? But what about the stuff? Dutch has got a deal to unload the whole lot, and the guy's waiting. I think we'd better wait. Molly was just telling me that Pearson is off the Mulvaney angle. What do you mean, off the Mulvaney angle? That's what I want to find out. Send Al up here at once. What? What's the matter? Molly's walked out. That's the best news I've heard today. Shut up. She must believe I'm an awful sap if she thinks I can't keep her from walking out. Well, maybe it'll be more fun this way. Okay, Oscar. Keep Molly's job open. Watch me, boss. Yes, Al. You used to hang around Ali Nolan, didn't you? Sure, that's how I learned to use my mitts. Hmm. Unfortunately, uh, this job calls for brains. However, I'll try you out. I want you to go back there and get to know a pug from Colorado. He's a brother of Terry Mulvaney's. What's he look like? You saw him last night going out with Molly. Oh, I thought there was something familiar about that mud's face. What do I do, spoil his looks? Oh, no, nothing so crude. Just get his confidence and, uh, and when you... Uh... All right, Ed, you're shaping up fine. Now, let's call it a day. <laughs> Thanks, Artie. Say, I haven't seen you around here much before, have I? No, I'm a chauffeur now. Can't get around like I used to. But I like to work out with you whenever I can. Well, that goes double. <laughs> let's make it often, huh? Okay. Well, I have to be on my way as soon as I hit the shower. How do you feel? <laughs> sure, and I'm feeling fine. There's nothing like a good workout in the shower. Yeah, I'm going to get with you again. Or maybe some night when we have the car, we'll go places. Well, I'm not much for that night stuff. Say, Al, who is it you work for? Flash Ackroyd, the guy that owns the Alhambra. Oh, that's funny. I met a gal that works there. She used to be engaged to my brother. And boy, did I fall for her. What's her name? Molly Fitzgerald. You mean she used to work there? Well, what's the matter? Was she fired? She walked out. Didn't you know? Oh, I haven't seen her today. I, I can't see why she should quit. I don't know. Search me. Looks all right to me, boss. Bit of a sap, maybe. Admitted he'd fallen hard for Molly. He said that, did he? Yeah. But what do you care? Just give me the word. Go get him. Bring them up here. Nah, you're talking. I'm telling you, I couldn't be mistaken. No two men could ever whistle exactly like that. Funny, though, that he should be working as a chauffeur. Maybe not as funny as you think. I just got your message, then. Oh, you're not mad at me after all, eh? I mean for... Excuse me? We're kissing your letter. 
Are you going to learn to love me? That's not fair to me or to Terry. I told you before that all's fair in love and war. Repeating it doesn't make it so. Molly, sit down. I want to talk to you. You know, from the first minute I walked into that place last night and laid eyes on you, the heart within me stopped. And then it started to pound like a trip hammer. Well, that sounds something like love, doesn't it? Not necessarily. It could be indigestion. Once a snooper, always a snooper. That's what I'm being paid for. Why did you walk out on Ackroyd? He said that he had an ulterior motive in giving me a job. How did you come to meet him in the first place? He came to buy a diamond from Abram. And that checks. With what? Theory, young man. How long before the robbery was that? Oh, just a few days. Then if he bought a diamond, he got a receipt. Yes, I made it out myself. Better than I expected. Then that would give them a copy of your handwriting. Remember the note from you that Terry told the police about? Yes. Well, that would put Terry just where they wanted him. One of them might have had red hair, or he could have worn a red wig. And if he was able to imitate Terry's brogue... Oh! What's the matter? Ackeroyd. Ackeroyd gave me a perfect imitation of it. Hmm. And that checks. Somehow I think we're getting places. Do you really think so? Yes, I do. And you needn't worry about a job anymore. I can get you back with Abrams any time you want. But you'll soon have Terry back, and then you'll be getting married. Yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's that crack? Do you think Molly would take a cop when she has a chance to get an up-and-coming pugilist like myself? Oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. The poor kid, she don't know whether it's Terry or Ed she loves. Leave it to me. What's the matter, Miss Fitzgerald? Mr. Pearson, you really believe Terry's innocent, don't you? Why, certainly. Why do you ask? Because I... I don't know whether I should tell even you, but... That's Terry. What are you talking about? That's Terry Mulvaney, not his brother Ed. I wondered why I was so attracted to him. I thought it was his voice, but his eyes are the same, too. Go on. It was when he cupped his hand to his ear and said, What's that crack? Then I knew for certain. I tell you, Terry's come back from where I don't know, but I'm afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. Terry didn't come back from the dead. He came back from the hospital. I've known it all along. Then I've been the goat. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. Oh, just a moment. It was all my fault. I insisted. I was afraid that, try as you might, you would give him away. He had no right to make love to me. Well, who had a better right? Nevertheless, you wait. Don't you tell him. Run along, you two. I've got to go down to police headquarters. Will you see me home, Ed? Will I? In a taxi through the park. Ed, there's something I must tell you, and it may relieve your mind. <laughs> well, me darling, you go right ahead and tell me. I've been true to Terry all this time, even though Auntie and everybody said I was a fool. They did? Yes. And it wasn't until he disappeared that I found out what a wretch he really was. Well, that couldn't be so. It's a pack of lies, I tell you. No, the truth, all right. Well, just show me one black eye that would ever say a thing against me, well, against me brother. I can show you a dozen people who bribed him. Girls, you're wrong. Boy, it's lies, I tell you. It's lies. Well, now tell me what you're laughing at. Harry Mulvaney, alias. Brother Ed. Uh, Terry, no, it is, it, uh, uh, nah, Terry, you're lying to me. Oh, Molly, my darling. Oh, Terry, what happened? Why didn't you tell me? I was making me escape on a train and it was wrecked. I changed places with a dead man. Oh, Terry, you poor dear. Oh, I was never so rich in all my life. You must think I'm terrible. But it was mean of you not to tell me. Mr. Pearson wouldn't let me. Yes, I know. He told me. Well, 
Hey, now, wait a minute. This ain't the place I told you to go. Right. But it's the place you're going. Well, what's the racket? No racket at all. A guy just wants to talk to you. Come on, both of you. Anybody muscling in on my territory? Meaning Miss Fitzgerald? You guessed it, Mulvaney. You flatter yourself, don't you? My advice to you is to get out of town tonight. Because if you're here in the morning, you'll be in the morgue, see? As for you, Miss Fitzgerald, you'd better come back to work. If you don't, there'll be a shortage discovered in your accounts. And that, after being mixed up in a diamond robbery, would be uh, just too bad. Just a minute. Throw him out. He gets noisy. Well, you know what to do. But, boss, this guy is in Ed Mulvaney. What do you mean? I heard him in the cab saying that he had changed places with a dead man. His real name is Terry Mulvaney. That it is. What about it? You wanted for murder. What are you doing back in town? Looking for the guy that framed me. Still sticking to that story? Who do you suspect now? Who do you think? Got the car handy, Al? Sure, boss. See them home. That guy knows more than he was telling. Pearson must be onto something. I knew that name would snag us sooner or later. Who oh, snagged? Maybe they don't know a thing. I'm just not taking any chances. The alley's full of cops. What do you think I've been training at Artie Nolan for? <laughs> Everything checks. Give Terry all the credit for recovering those mistakes. Terry, you always wanted to be a detective, didn't you? That I did, sir. Well, the chief says you are. Maybe uh, you could use this. Solitaire. I think they'd much rather have a wedding ring. You can have them both. On the house.
Dr. Reed, where's the staff? I'm the first one here this morning, sir. Mm. Here, you, what are you doing here? Bank sleeping in Mr. Addison's office. Get out of here. Imagine waking up and seeing you first thing in the morning. Uh, what a way to start a day. Bank? Now let me tell you something else. If you don't have some blankets and a pillow put in this office, I want to quit working here. Banks, you're a disgrace to the newspaper profession. It isn't a profession, it's a game. Now run along, because I want to play with you. The same thing after every payday, drunk and disorderly. You know, Hessel, you're not really as bad as you seem. Nobody could be that bad. Here, have a little drink. It might put new life in an old body. That'll cost you your job. Boy. I'll see that you're fired for this paper as soon as Mr. Addison arrives. Ahoy. Listen, Hensel. There are 1,790 newspapers in the United States. And I've only worked on 16 of them. Tomorrow, you'll be free to connect with your 17th. Yeah? Well, if the old man does fire me, I promise to come in your office and kiss you goodbye. But aren't you afraid that he might have you fired? That's a little scheme of mine to get you my job. But you got to promise never to be late. Morning, pals. Hello. Hello, Steve. Get you a little early this morning? No, I was here first, except for Frank Marowell. Boy, is she raining. Well, either that or you've been taking a bath with your clothes on. Where is her Watch your step. Oh. Boy, it's sure raining out today. Uh, that makes the rumor official. Right. Hey, Squint. Wait a minute. I'm paid to go up and down, not wait. Well, you ain't paid so much you have to get technical about it. Here, this is full of java, and don't get any rain in it. Hey, what do I get for running all your errands? Didn't I give you two passes for her first sin last night? Yeah, it was a rotten show. Yeah, that's why I give you the passes. All right, that. Boy, I'm tired out myself. Up half the night with the baby. Who's baby? My wife. There. What a day, what a day. Uh, don't tell me it's raining outside. Even Noah never saw this much rain. Yeah, well, I think I'll drink a little of it for breakfast, and there won't be so much. Morning, Chief. Morning. What a day, what a day. And how? Do you know anything about this Freddy girl and the dope they found in her apartment? Freddy? Oh, Freddy. Here's the story of the Morning Herald by your wife. Looks like she beat you to it. Rose Freddy, queen of the underworld. Stood off the police department last night while she demolished the insides of her apartment at 341 First Street. The arresting officer, Thomas O'Ryan, that she was under the influence of mm, How cute. Where were you while all this was going on? I'm trying to remember. Let me see, I remember... Hearing and then we're going to raid the Freddy gal's apartment. And? So I went to Joe Reno's speakeasy. That geography don't make sense. Well, you see, I had a sneaking hunch that Reno knows more about this narcotic ring in his telly. I remember having about four drinks of Reno's bar varnish, and I remember asking a lot of questions. Then I landed outside on my ear. What's Reno got to do with this Freddy case? Now, that's what I didn't find out. Now, give me a rehash and make it snappy. All right. Say, I wonder if the district attorney knows anything about this racket. I think I'll wake him up and find out. Oh, good morning, Mr. Reno. Well, how are you? How's the restaurant business these days? Well, Hensel, the restaurant business is all right, but I'm thinking of taking my advertising out of the express. One of your drunken reporters, a fellow by the name of Banks, came in my place last night 
and insulted Alderman Jungmeyer by asking him a lot of impertinent questions. He was also very insulting to me when I asked him to leave and made a lot of drunken threats. Oh, we've had several complaints about Banks. I'll see that he's fired at once. That's fine. Thank you. That'll cool Banks off all right. Did Harris fall? No. Yes, I know, Mr. Muller. I'm awfully sorry I woke you up. But you're the district attorney, aren't you? And if you're the district attorney, you ought to know something about these narcotic debts. Or maybe you're trying to hide something. Hey, you want to get an earful of what he's saying to that one? He's yelling like an opera singer. <laughs> Why, Mr. Muller, I have never heard such language coming from a public official. You should be ashamed, Mr. Muller. And let me tell you something else. I once knew a district attorney who was hung because he refused to give information to the newspapers. <laughs> What's that? You'll have me fired. <laughs> I'm afraid you're a little late. There's a couple of bids in ahead of yours. Well, I guess he doesn't know anything. I know something, Bank. You can down the cash here and get your money right now. Are you in again? What's the idea? The idea is that you sell one of our big advertisers. And I've taken the responsibility of discharging that's him at a, once. That's a big responsibility. Now, wait a minute, Hansel. As long as I'm city editor, I'll hire and fire my own staff. There you see, Smarty. He spends all his time fighting. Well, how about General Grant? I'm not warning you, Hansel. I'm telling you. Get out of my department and stay out. Don't hit him in the head, Arch. You'll bust your knuckles. Someday I'll step on him and squash him. You know, what I can't understand is how the cockroach exterminator ever missed that guy last time he was in the building. Well, I'll say one thing for you. You don't make my life a better rosa. Good morning, little loudspeakers of newspaper land. Good morning. Good afternoon. I couldn't find a cab. You mean you couldn't find one to fit you? <laughs> you know, we're still getting out an afternoon newspaper, even if it's raining. Imagine me giving advice to the loved one on a day like this. Now, Vera, you're not going to tell me it's raining outside. No. I sprinkle myself every morning. <laughs> it keeps me fresh. Oh, is that what does it? You won't be so fresh when you find out what Santa Claus left in the hall for you. Holy smoke, not, uh, not the wife. In person. Now, there's something to think about. It is, if I know my women. Ho, 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 he, he, he. Ha, 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 ho, ho. <laughs> Got out. Good morning, dear. Well. Oh, is it raining outside? See, you and I are going to have a little talk. Why, well, certainly, dear. Shall we go inside? I can tell you all I've got to say right here. Gee, that's a swell hat you've got on there. Is that a new one? Steve, let's come to the point. Why, right, what's the matter, dear? What have I done? Where were you last night? Where was I last night? I, uh, well, didn't you get my message? What message? Well, my message. I, I told Hoffman to call you and... Wait a minute, I'll get that guy out here. Never mind, I know where you were. You and Deke Thomas were probably having a drinking bout somewhere. Well, yes, we did have a couple. And Where did drinking get him? There isn't a newspaper in this town that'll hire him back. And you're getting just like him. Well, now, Dick and I were working. We were working on, on that Peretti case. And by the way, dear, that was a swell story you had in the Morning Herald. So you were working on the Peretti case, eh? Uh -huh. Well, you weren't with the raiding party. You weren't at the jail when they brought her in. You must have covered that case by remote control. Well, now, there's more to that case than appears on the surface. You think so, do you? Well, where do you suppose she gets her dope? I suppose you know all about it. No, but I got a pretty good hunch. Oh. You're always having hunches about something. And now it's dope. Dope peddlers hiding under cradles. Mothers crying for it. Fathers yelling about it. With your wild imagination, you'll probably have me mixed up in this thing. All right, all right. But where do you suppose these narcotics get their laughing powder? From China? By carrier pigeon? The trouble with you is you get all your ideas out of a bottle. Don't you suppose that the district attorney and the police department know what's going on? Oh, there are a lot of saps. Well, that isn't what I came here to talk about anyway. Well, I don't see why you should be sore at me. 
I'll tell you why. For two years, I've been trying to make a home for us. And last night, he was coming home to his favorite dish, liver and onions. I'll get Hoffman just a minute. He should have called. his faithful little wife sits like a dumbbell at 11 o'clock entertain yourself with a plate of cold liver. Oh, Marge, I tried to get word to oh, you. If it were the first time, I wouldn't say anything. But it's been going on for two years, and I'm through this time. Oh, now, Marge, you don't mean that. Why not? If I'm going to be a widow, I might as well make it official. But you know this newspaper game just as well as I do. I've got to make a living, ain't I? You're always blaming something besides yourself. You're always making promises and breaking them. And I'm always forgiving you. Oh, last night I thought it all over. I said to myself, what's the use? Steve, I want a divorce. Well, good morning, good morning. Well, I don't suppose you young married people see enough of each other evenings, but you have to be spooning in dark hallways in the morning. Oneil! 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 Say, where's O'Neill? Yes, sir. I want... Oh, how about that story? Where is it? I... Ah. Well, say, Miss Wilson here yet? Miss Wilson? Yes, sir. Miss Wilson? How about, uh, Hoover's speech? Did the Senate ratify that Grimes bill? Say, who covered that Sibley fire? How about Banks? Did he get his story? Wasn't drunk again last night, was he? Well, when did this come in? Just now, sir. Oh. Miss Wilson, Miss Wilson. Yes, sir. Don't yell, don't yell, doggone it. I'm not deaf. Take a note to Margaret. My dear Barkley, hereafter I want the composing room kept open an hour after we go to press. Your men are not allowed to fight. Say, you will get me a proof on that just quick as you can, will you? Yes, sir. Your men are not allowed to climb and have to jump into their clothes and run away every time they hear a bell ring. Well, Marge, I guess you're right. I guess you got it coming to you. There's no other man, is there? No, thanks. I think I'll stick to newspapering for a while. Oh, that's all right. Oh, have you got a good lawyer? What difference does that make? Well, you don't have to get sore. I just happen to know a guy that's pretty good, that's all. There's no rush about that. I just wanted to let you know where I stood. Well, how about grounds? you got to have grounds. What's the matter with non-support? I wouldn't be telling any fibs about that. How about mental cruelty? Mental cruelty, if you like. What's the difference? All right, we'll make it mental crew. Oh, I don't blame you, Marge. I guess I am kind of a bum at that. You're not really a bum. You're just irresponsible. You'd be one of the best newspaper men in this town if you'd only quit drinking. Maybe so. I was talking to Dr. McCoy yesterday. He says drinking is a mental habit because you actually get more stimulation out of tea. Yeah, and then you turn into a Chinaman and open a laundry. Watch this stuff. Oh, say, how about the laundry? I mean, my clothes and things. How am I going to get them? Well, let me know when you come in. I have them all packed for you. Oh, I'd rather not go up. Couldn't you send them to me? Yes, I can do that. I'll have the janitor bring them. Thanks. Goodbye, Steve. So long, kid. The boss wants you. O'Neill? No, Mr. Addison. He's pretty sore about something. Do tell. Hensel's been in there with him. Oh. Well, well, well. Here comes the lion with the lamb haircut. My dear Miss Thumbtacks, my wife does not understand me. What shall I do? Reach for a lucky. You didn't start reaching soon enough. <laughs> hey, copy. You old tattletale. Say, Vance, come in here and the door. I bet it's a raise. That are not founded on facts. Hold on, boys. We're going around the curve. Is there any way we're going to the welfare of the people of this city? This editorial will be headed on the heading of fair question to Mayor Barbara. John, John, yes, he is. 
Oh, what are they trying to do? Freeze me to death in my own office? Well, sir. Just fair. I beg your pardon? Accept it. Say, you have to talk louder. So much noise in here. Where were you last night? I'll bite. Where was I? What? Don't ask riddles. You bet you're on the griddle. You got drunk. You went to Reno's cafe. You insulted all of them in Young Meyer. You threw fakes at Reno when he asked you to leave. Say, what kind of a name you trying to give this paper? You trying to ruin our circulation? Do you want me to answer those all at once, or do you want separate answers? What's that? Oh, what difference does it make? I'm sick of this bum racket anyhow. It isn't even a racket. It's a disease that gets into your blood and rings you out like an old mop. What are newspapers good for anyhow? Two-minute scandal for a lot of dumb Polacks that can't even read English. And what are they good for after that? Something to put under carpets. Plugs for rat holes. Wrapping paper for bootleggers. Bed quilts for bums in the park and, and a lot of other things. So, that's the way you feel about it, is it, you young whippersnapper? That's the way I feel about it, you old flap doodle. Why, thanks, I... I used to think you had something in you, but I see I was mistaken. You're a quitter. You're yellow. And worst of all, you're not even a good newspaper man. Who says I'm not? Throwing mud at the honorable profession of journalism. And why? Just because you fell down on a news story. You can't talk to me like that. I've forgotten more about news than you'll ever know. Sent out on an assignment. And what happens? Drunk and disorderly in a cheap speaking. But where do you suppose news comes from? The old lady's home? Oh, Bob. Your wife's a better newspaper man than you are. Why, you wrinkled old squash. I was after a real story last night, but it's just as well I didn't get it. You wouldn't dare print it if I had. You can't intimidate me. I'll print anything that's founded on fact. You wouldn't know a fact if it walked in here and threw its arms around you. No. I know a good newspaper man when I see one. I'll show you who's a good newspaper man. I'll put a story on your desk someday that'll turn this town upside down. Ah, uh, get out of here before I lose my temper. Oh, I'm newspaper man, huh? Why, what are you talking about? You're an insult to the profession. Yes, I suppose so. Well, you can take this paper. I worked on better papers than this, you know. I don't have to... Why, you can't here. talk to me like that. No, it. I don't you have to talk to you like that. Get out of here. Who's winning? Daniel or the lion? You eat those words, you old buzzard. Get out, you're fired. Don't you come back. Ah. What happened? You ought to quit the newspaper game and publish bedtime stories for weak-minded children, you... What's up? <laughs> Brilliant young reporter thrown out on ear. Wife and family destitute. Fired? I believe that's what I understood him to say. That's the third time this month. Well, maybe I can patch it up again. Well, if you can do it this time, you'll get the first prize in patchwork. O'Neill! Hey, yes, O'Neill! O'Neill! Hello, Big Boy. Hello, Tiny. Hello, Joe. Hello, Bright Eyes. Hello, Flatfoot. Hey, Nick. Say, hey, are you going to write up that Peretti case? There is a rumor to the contrary. I want you to get my name spelled right. It's Ryan, R-Y-A-N. The Herald here spells it O-Ryan, and I'm kind of burned up about it. Oh, what are a couple of O's among friends? Uh, the O-Ryans are a lot of dizzy arms. I'm a cork man myself. Whoopsie salute! It would take a lot of torpedoes to sink you, big girl. <laughs> now, hey, I tell you, compass to my successor, he spells beautifully. Him? Frank. Okay, Flatfoot. Lay off the puppy. Okay, Orion. Ryan. Someday it'll be just too bad. Did you get the gate, Steve? Me, no. The place was just getting too crowded, so I quit to make more room for Vera. Well, it won't take much to fill the hole you'll leave. Right. That's why I recommended Pell for my job. Yeah, well, if I had your job, I'd do more writing and less talking. There, I guess that puts me in my place, huh? Hey, who's got my jackknife? Don't look at me. I gave it back to you. Uh, oh. Can't lose this. This is a wedding present for my loving wife. No, we are losing it. Why don't you fasten the ball and chain to it? Well... Goodbye, little buttercup. I hope you'll miss me. I'll probably have spells. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if you start to waste away, save me the slow motion movie rights, will you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so long, 
everybody. Come on, Bye. 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 A long time before you get another newspaper man like me around here. I <laughs> hope that's true. Yeah, I hate to see okay. him go. He's a good messenger, Bob. Night. It's the last time I'll ever sleep under that Garibaldi statue. Why? Why do pigeons have to build their nests on statues? And why art thou so blue this lovely morning? I've got my troubles. Domestic or professional? Both. Good. Then there's nothing to interfere with our drinking. Oh, I don't blame Margie. I guess I am kind of a tramp. But that old dried-up alligator in there burns me up. Ooh, thou keep the thought pure. He knows I could never quit newspapering, so the old crow cans me twice a month just to rub it in. Journalism is but a faithless stuff. Bum newspaper man, am I? I'll throw a story in his face someday that'll make his ears rattle. Anger does not become thy placid brow. Well, do you blame me for being sore? In another couple of days, I'd have had Reno's mob all wrapped up and delivered. I have a noble idea. Well, let's hear it. If pleasure be thy bent, let us return to the scene of last night's revel. But ain't it a little soon after what happened at Reno's yesterday? Ooh, wreck not the dead yesterday. Wreck only the beautiful tomorrow. Well, I feel like wrecking something. Let's go. Let's away. Sweet Adelaide, my Adelaide. What are you going to do about this guy, Banks? I'm telling him he's nothing to worry about. He's just a harmless drunk. He's smarter than you think he is. He's not so smart. I had him canned this morning. He said you know who he is. Okay. Okay, Pete. You can't shut that guy up by canning him. What good's a newspaper man without a newspaper? Well, we got to think of ourselves, Joe. You ain't the only one in this racket. I'll handle this. You ain't going to let him come in here again, are you? Why not? He amuses me. That's where you fellows are all wrong. As my dear old grandmother used to say to me, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. Yeah? You take my tip and you'll use a fly swatter. Listen, that loud mouth ready to start squawking, we'll all be getting our meals to iron bars. Yeah. So, be right with you. Now, if you were smart little boys, you'd pay more attention to your grandmothers. My bitter friend, Mr. Reno. Oh, he's out picking up the plates you threw at him last night. <laughs> I do hope he isn't upset. Oh, no. He enjoys it. It helps business. Need we delay further, my good man? No, you will have to wait till Joe comes back. Procrastination is the thief of thirst. <laughs> As I was saying to George, I never seen a newspaper guy yet that wasn't a lousy, backbiting, yellow dog at heart. In a short time, the knuckle party was in full progress. I hope that neither you guys are newspaper men. No, indeed. Ex-newspaper men. I'm glad to hear it. I wouldn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Well, don't bother about us. So I says to him, all these newspaper guys, they're just a lot of no-good bums. With no more spine than a jackrabbit. And you couldn't get one of them to fight if you spit in his eye. As I was saying, Deke, 
You take the fine, upstanding type of thug that peddles dope to school children and penny candy. Well, I once knew a newspaper guy that got drunk enough to talk nasty to a real man. There wasn't enough left of him to cremate decently. As I was saying when you were so politely interrupted, it's a shame to hang so many innocent murderers. Rat traps would be much cheaper. Just so. You know, I very recently heard of the sad case of two benevolent and persecuted hopslingers who were punished by being put in a barrel with a skunk. Fortunately, the skunk died. He was probably bored to death by their repartee. Well, well. This is an unexpected pleasure. Well, if it isn't our genial host. See? Next to my respectable restaurant? Of course not. Speakeasies take root and strange. But that isn't why I came to see you. I suppose you wish to discuss your favorite topic? Narcotics? No. So I'm afraid our friendly little war is over. You distressed me. What has happened? I'm celebrating my dismissal from the ancient and honorable institution of muck slinging. Need we delay the celebration further? Oh, I'm sorry. Pete, some of our very best. I thought maybe you'd heard, Joe. I'm surprised. I heard you were such a good newspaper man, too. Hmm. I knew too much. It was beginning to hurt advertising. Oh, it's a pity. You know, you'd make a great publicity man for restaurants and speakeasies. But change the whole center. Woo! Well, that's a very nice offer, Joe, but uh, I'm taking a sea trip to drown the troubles. I'll miss you. Terribly. Yeah, it's too bad to interrupt our little war. We were having such a good time, huh? I believe if you had your way, you'd make a criminal out of me in no time. Yep. In another couple of days, I'd have had the goods on you, Joe. Really? What a pity to lose your job on the threshold of success. That Peretti girl's confession would have been a sensation. What was the name? Peretti. Rose Peretti. You know. Oh, yes. I believe I did read something about that in the paper. <laughs> You're not trying to connect me with that, too. You should have read the confession I got from her this morning. But I handed you a great kick. Have you got it with you? No. I left it on old man Addison's desk. Oh, but don't worry about it, Joe. He won't know what it is if he sees it. He'll probably throw it in the wastebasket. <laughs> it's a shame to throw one of your romances in the wastebasket. Well, it's his own fault. He shouldn't have canned me. Well, I've got to go down and get my passports. Well, how about a little farewell drink with an old enemy? Well, if you don't mind, Joe, I think I'll have some of my own. I can't handle that pre-war stuff of yours. <laughs> well, happy days. I'll send you a postcard from China. Over the river. Aren't you going to help me pack, Dick? I want to take just one sock and a little large bundle, all right. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Well, I, I don't know. like that guy's look. Anyhow, uh, he's better getting out right there. Well, do you know any more smart cracks? Are you going to let him walk out of here after what he said about that Peretti confession? He never got any confession. He was just bluffing. Oh, yeah? Well, I guess they're getting off by that Edison sack. Don't tell me. I can lick my way to a while the bars. Hey, did you notice anything funny? You mean those two bums? You see Reno's face when I mentioned that Peretti confession? Oh, uh, who wants to look at his face? He's worried. He thinks I got a statement from the Peretti girl involving him. Well, haven't you done it? No. But I'm going to get it. I'll break a leg triumph. If you don't bump that guy off pretty soon, I'm going to do it for you. Why be rough? 
when you don't have to. I know. Your grandmother's going to get you into a lot of trouble someday. Supposing this Peretti dame did make a squawk, what then? How can she? I've got it fixed so she can't see anyone at the jail. Suppose they let her out. Then we'll send her on a little trip till this thing blows over. Hello? Hello, Stephen? When? This morning? What time? Well, why didn't you do something about it? You're a fine shyster lawyer. Where did she go? What's up? They let Peretti off this morning. The first case. Where is she now? You find her and keep her quiet. Till I get back. If she's done any squawking, you know what to do. Where are you going? I'm going to call on Miss Bird Addison, just in case. Well, what about this guy, Banks? Get a hold of him. And use your own judgment. Oh, Sharky, meet me in front of the express office. Yes, sir. That guy and his grandmother make me sick. Let's go. What happened? Did the husband shoot the other guy? Of course not. What a horrible idea. He joined in the chorus, and after a hearty lunch of bird seed, they all flew away to never, never land. <laughs> Read it yourself. Miss Wilson! Miss Wilson! Miss! Say, are you still working here? One never knows. From day to day. Never yeah, Why, certainly I want you to be gay. But you're not going to be gay on my time. You're going to type right of there. Why don't you write on it? Say, what, uh, say, what do you think this is? This is a newspaper office, not a summer resort. Doggone it. Say, Miss Wilson, you got my button up and give me a time? I was just going, sir. Hey, well, well, hurry up. What are you trying to do? Stop me to death? Oh, Mr. Anderson. Oh, oh, Mr. Anderson. Well, what do you want? I don't know. What do you want? I'm busy. Have you got a few minutes to spare? No, I haven't. I'm not made of minutes. Well, this is very important. One of our big advertisers is very anxious to meet you. Say, I'm not entertaining advertisers. I'm running know, a newspaper. The first thing I know, you want me to be giving cheese here yes, in the office. Yes, man here. O'Neill. O'Neill. Say, look at here. Bring him in tomorrow or next week or next month or what? next year. Yeah, yeah. I'm busy. Uh, say, what's the matter with this paper? Why were you late with that Mahoney story? Well, sir, we're a little short-handed today. Short-winded? Who's short-winded? I said we're short-handed. Oh. Oh. Banks, eh? I don't suppose we can run a paper without Banks, is that it? Call me an old flap doodle, did he? Well, he can't run me. I want him kept out of this office. I've already given orders, sir. Orders? You don't have to give any orders. I'll give the orders around here. He can't scare me. When I get too old to fight my own battles, I'll roll over and die, dog. Got it? No, I don't think you can hold me. Lovely disposition. Well, that's it. Did you arrange it? Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. He, he's, he's very anxious to meet you. Well, that's fine. Shall we go right in? Oh, uh, uh, uh just a few minutes. You see, uh, you see, uh, he's rather hard to get at. Oh, I see. Well, I thought that being a big advertiser and... Oh, uh, of course, of course. He, he's very anxious to meet you, but, uh, I think someday next week it'll be better. Well, I'm unusually anxious to meet him today. I don't get down this way often. Oh, I understand perfectly. I'll go in and see him again in a few minutes. Now, uh, in the meantime, let us talk over your new advertising campaign, huh? Oh, yes. Now, yes. as I understand it, you want a, a full page on, on fat. Yes, yes, to be sure. That's fine. Now, the heading will read, Reno's Restaurant Incorporated. All the food that's fit to eat. Now we can run this in bold type and close in a very nice border. 
Of course, you'll want a border, won't you? Yes, of course. We should have a border. Get this out right away, and I'll see the old man as to whether he wants a two or three column spread. Right on. Hello, Margie. Hello, Art. Thanks, Snappy. May I have that Webster wire as soon as it comes in? Okay. Well, <laughs> moving in? Well, no, not exactly. Is, is Steve here? Steve, why didn't you hear what happened? Happened? I hope nothing's happened to Steve. Well, not as serious as that. He's just quit the newspaper business again for a change. The paper cut, you see. You know, you're a genius at this sort of thing, Mr. Hensel. Well, you know, I, I've been at this a very long time. Excuse me. Hello. Hensel speaking. The press room. Say, what's the idea of ringing me on an outside phone? What have we got our office phone for? Hello. Hello. Well, they'd call me on an outside wire. That is odd, isn't it? Well, the office phone must be out of order. Oh, just run your eye over that. I'll be back in a few minutes. Certainly. Don't hurry. Oh, I've got lots of time. see your side of it. Naturally, it looks very much to me as though Steve didn't care anymore. Don't never look that way to you. Sure. I think you're doing the right thing. You don't think maybe I was a little hasty? Not at all. I think you're a glutton for punishment. I wouldn't hurt Steve for the world. Do you know where I can find him? Hmm. He moves around too fast for me. You might as well try to find the lost car. <laughs> Steve! What the? Oh, hello, Marge. I didn't expect to see you here. I came because I... I brought the suitcase. Oh, thanks. Is that all? So is that fossilized old baboon in his office? Now, don't go in there, Steve. Wait till you cool off. I want to see this baby while I'm red hot. Steve, you've been drinking. Please be careful. Well, what's that to you? We're all washed up, aren't we? Now, Steve, don't be a sap. Give me a chance. Hey, who's doing you know all this yelling out here? So, doggone you, you're back again, are you? Any happy return? Please. You're, uh, you're drunk. Uh, you'll think I'm drunk by the time I get through with you. Get into that office. So, I'm a bum reporter, am I? You can't scare me. I'm a rotten newspaper man, am I? You can't work here anymore. Who wants to work in this dump? I got a story here that's going to turn this town upside down. Ah, uh, you haven't got any story. You're drunk again. Yeah, punch drunk. I met a couple of Reno's men outside. Say, you can think of more alibis than any sauce I ever met. Yeah, well, what do you think about this, doggone you? What is it? It's a confession from Rose Peretti. A confession? A confession? Where'd you get it? How, who wrote this? Where, who said this? Well, what do you know? Now, uh, there's a story there that'll make your hair curl. It involves Reno and his whole rotten gang. And it doesn't stop there, either. Oh, what a story, what a story. Thanks, all of you had it in here. Wait till I publish this. You're not going to publish it. Oh, now, Banks, don't talk like that. Uh, I'm not working for you anymore. You fired me. Say, give me that confession, doggone you, before I lose my temper. You try and get it. I scooped the whole town on this story on my own time. And I'm going to have it published, too. But not on your punk sheet. I'm going to sell this to a decent newspaper. Yeah. Steve, wait a minute. Say, look here. Look, wait a minute. I'm going to give you a $10 raise. I'll make an order out on the cashier right now. Make it 25 <laughs> Say, doggone you, you ruined me. I'm not made of money. All right, I'll see you later. I'm running right over to the Herald office. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't go. Don't go. I, I'll give in. But it's a doggone outrage. There. That's right. my confession. I suppose I'm still a bum newspaper man? Who said you were? You did, but you're going to take it back right now. You're the best newspaper man in this town. Ah. The trouble with me is I talk too darn much. <laughs> now, give me that confession. Well, it's all right this time, but don't oh. you ever let it happen again. No, here, Steve, go out and get yourself a clean shirt. You look like a bum. All right. And hurry on back. We've got a lot of work to do. Say, I think I'll go out this other way. Those thugs of Reno's might still feel playful. Hey, another thing. Don't you get drunk. No, not too drunk. If you come back here drunk, you're fired. Hello. 
Uh, yes, uh, uh, confession of uh, Freddy girl exposes big dope ring. Uh, uh, hey, Steve! Say, what's the, what's the district attorney's number? Hempstead 3000. All right, get out of here. Hello, Hempstead 3000. Yes, hurry, hurry. Hello. Hello, hello. Well, are they still at it? He's been in there a long time. Do you think everything's all right? Well, they've quit yelling at each other. That's something. I never saw Steve so violent. And I feel maybe that I'm responsible. Oh, he'll be all right as soon as he gets it out of his system. They're too quiet all of a sudden, it's with me. Supposing you just put your head in the door, huh? Not me, lady. Not me. I know those birds too well to interfere in their family quarrels. <laughs> they have these fights about twice a week just to prove they're not effeminate. But they always wind up in each other's arms singing Mother McCree. <laughs> Even so, I can't help worrying about Steve. He's such a kid. You know, Margie, I think you were miscast. You should have been his mother. Back so soon? Well, I've been all over this building trying to find out who called me on the phone. Nobody seems to know anything about it. Probably someone just kidding. Well, if I find out who it was, I'll teach my lesson. I won't have any jokers about this office. Well, you got any ideas? Say, I wonder... I don't understand. A strange thing happened. This fellow Banks is quite a practical joker, isn't he? He's worse than that. Why? Oh, no reason. I just thought perhaps he might have called you on the phone. I saw him come out of Addison's office just before you returned. Well, I can't imagine him being in there. I assure you he was fired this morning. They were having a violent argument, and Banks used a lot of cuss words. It was very threatening, but he's that way with everybody. In fact, he threatened me again when he came out of the office. Well, I'm going to put a stop to Oh, this. don't bother. I realize he'd been drinking. Well, he must be kept out of here. I want to just what Banks said to you. Oh, some other time. It's nothing. Let's go over the copy. I, uh, I just remember an appointment. Mm, as you like. I want you to know how I feel. I understand perfectly. Now about the border. He doesn't look very happy. He's probably had his name spelled wrong again. There's somebody in this joint that thinks they're funny. It's a funny business, big boy. Right down, folks. <laughs> Listen, Irish. If you don't keep them principal pushes of yours under control, I'm going to start something. What's the matter? Look at that. Is that funny? What do you call that? It's concrete. <laughs> Shut up. This knife came from one of those windows and hit me right on the conk. Did it bend the blade? Did she do it? Not me. I always get my man. Someday. Now listen, Iris. I'm a cop. I ain't no target. Let me see that knife. That's funny to see Steve's knife. Hmm. So that's how it was, eh? Where is he? He's inside. But he wouldn't throw a knife at you, Ryan. No, it probably jumped out the window. Well, I'll wait for him. And you'd better get prepared to be a widow. Fun is fun and all that. Just kidding and calling me names is bad enough. But when it comes to throwing knives at officers, that ain't going to be funny this season. You know, I've been on this force for 25 years. He's gone all right. The gas didn't mean he's dead. 
He's dead, all right. Somebody send for the coroner. Hurry up, one of you boys, yeah. quick. Yeah, this looks serious. This ain't no place for you, Mrs. Banks. He's gone, all right, boys. Well, what are you all standing around here for? You know, we've got a newspaper to get out. Let's have a story. Huffman. Come on, civic activity. Right away. You take his home line. Write it up well. Take the newspaper end of it, you. Come on here. Let's get to work. Anybody think you were sleeping up here? Come on now. Well, I don't understand is how this gas blew up with them windows thrown. Neither do I. Wait a minute. Come here, Ryan. Why? This wasn't an accident. The old man has been murdered. Murdered? That tube has been cut. What makes you think he was murdered? He's been cut all right, clean through, and with a, with a knife. He wasn't cut with a knife. It's, why, it's all rotten. It, it must have come loose. So that's where the knife came from. Sorry, Mrs. Banks, but I've got to do my duty. He didn't do it! Police headquarters. Brace up, kid. Hello, Joe. Ryan. Hey, get a hold of Steve Banks. Newspaper reporter. There, all the boys know him. Don't let him get away. He's wanted for murder. Oh, he didn't do it. I tell you, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Oh, this is terrible. He's been murdered. Murdered? Do they suspect anyone? Thanks, of course. He cut the gas tube. They're looking for him now. Hello. Hello. Get me Mr. Morey. Hello, Sergeant. What's up? Say, don't let anyone leave this building until the coroner gets here. Okay, Sergeant. Watch that door. Out here, huh? Call me as soon as you get him. Yes. Really, Mr. Hensel, I can't afford to get mixed up in this. I suppose it's all right if I leave? Certainly. No doubt they'll want your testimony at the trial. I can always be reached. Let me see, uh, the elevators are down this way? Yeah, but you ain't gonna use them. Why not? Nobody leaves the building until further orders. I'm vouch for him, officer. Vouch your head off, nobody leaves the building. I understand. Just a matter of form. Quick, shove and I'll give you a good suck in the nose. Ah, oh, shut up. Here he is, Sarge. I caught him sneaking out of a barber shop. Hey, Flatfoot. And I gotta get his hair cut in this town without having his spine yanked loose by one of your big beef wrestlers? The next haircut you get won't cost you a cent. Well, what's the idea of all the bulls? Well, what's happened, Art? What's up? Oh, not Margie. Nothing's happened. Quick, darling. Quit kidding. Let me in on this. Oh, you don't remember nothing, eh? I suppose it's that bum booze you've been drinking. Maybe this will refresh your memory. The old man. He ain't dead, is he? He's dead, all right. Well, I only left him just a little while ago. Well, that's the way he wanted to go, with his boots on. Why did you kill him? He wasn't murdered, was he? Oh, I don't want to croak the old man. Well, you don't think I did it, do you? Are you going to complain? Don't talk, Steve. They don't know a thing. Margie. You don't think so, too? Margie. Margie! You couldn't hurt anybody, Steve. You couldn't hurt a fly and mean it. Well, I guess it don't look very good for me, huh? I'd like to talk to you alone. 
All right, get inside. Stick around and watch this door, and you take care of all those other doors. Okay, okay Sarge. Sarge. Hey, quit that racket. How can I have work? Have you gone through his desk? Maybe he's got some guns or something around here. Oh, shut up and go back to the door. Right over there. Oh, here's someone now. Where's the uh, officer in charge here? He's inside. Are you from the district attorney's office? Well, the district attorney couldn't cover himself. Felt is my name. Fourth deputy. Yes, Mr. Felt. Well, how long ago was the body discovered? Half an hour. That's strange. Why, Edison telephoned the office a half hour ago. Said he had an important message for the district attorney. Did you discover the body? Me? Why, no. I... Who did? The secretary. And where is he? She's here. She's fainted. Fainted? Well, hold her. There's a gentleman in my office has some very important testimony. Well, hold him. Has the coroner arrived yet? Well, here he is now. Oh, uh, I'm in charge here. The body is just in sight. Good. I'll get a look. All right. Oh, are you, uh, Officer Moran? Ryan, who are you? Phelps, the district attorney's office. This is a very important case. You better send for the district attorney. I'm in charge here. Oh. Have you any uh, suspects? Ken, is he under arrest? Not yet. I've been doing a little investigating. Well, I'll do the investigation. He's got to be charged with something, ain't he? He's charged with the murder of Mr. Anderson. I'll do the charging. Detain him as a material witness. You're detained. So I hear. Guard him carefully and see that no one leaves this building. Oh, shut up. Please, won't you let me help you? You keep out of this. You'll get me in trouble. Maybe you are in trouble. Don't you have a terrible plan. What do you care? You're all through with me. You don't understand, Sue. I only want to help you. Because, well, don't you understand, Sue? I love you. You mean that? No one must talk to the prisoner. The prisoner must be held in communicado. In where? He mustn't talk to anyone. Oh, be seated, madam. You're not to leave the building. Okay, okay. Let me handle it. Exactly. He died of asphyxiation. The death tube was cut with a pair of scissors. Any other evidence? There's a knife coming through out the window. Hmm. Death tube was cut with this knife. Is this your knife? Yes, it is, but... Never mind. Just one thing I'd like to know. Anything you say may be used against you. Who was in that room with the old man after I left it? You were the last to leave that office bank, so you know it. We have a witness here to prove it. A witness? A witness. Bring the witness in. Thank you, charge with his ethnic crime. Are you ready to make a statement? He hasn't done anything. What? Well, I may make a statement later. Thanks to warn you, the evidence is against you. You're notorious for getting into drunken brawls and abusing people while under the influence of intoxicating beverages. Now, we're having a trial right here, or is this just a rehearsal? You were discharged by the dead man this morning. Came back here to his office, seeking revenge. You threatened him. There was a struggle. The old man was struck to the floor, and as he lay there, gasping for breath, you cut the gas tube with a pen knife, Threw the knife out of the window and attempted to escape. Stop. So, you have any right to talk to him. Am I you? warn you? I'm not afraid of you. You have no right to accuse him of something he didn't do. The gas tube was cut all right. I guess I ought to know. I cut it myself. Margie, she didn't do anything of the kind. She's saying that to protect me. Just a minute. He's irresponsible, Mr. Phelps. Don't pay any attention to him. I know what I did. Keep out of this, Margie. I know what I'm doing. Why, Ed? Why did you cut that gas tube? I'll tell you why. I saw right away that Mr. Addison had died of heart failure or something. I reached down and shoved the gas to me because, because I thought it would make a sensational story for my paper. Well, she's not telling the truth. I am. I know what I did. Mrs. Banks, I'm told you as an accessory after the fact. No. The deceased did not die of asphyxiation. He died of a blow on the head. Hmm. Hold that for evidence. It may have fingerprints on it. Yes, it's so. Right in here, please. That's all I wanted to know. There's your witness, Mr. Phelps. Would you mind stepping this way a minute? Certainly not. Well, well, Joe, I knew you'd been here, but I thought you'd made your getaway. Yes, I warn you, this is a serious matter for you. It was serious until the master mind dropped in. Why, uh, this isn't the first time he's abused, Mr. Reno. No, and it won't be the last. Mr. Phelps, I'm ready to make you a statement, but I want to write it out in my own way. Watch him. I don't want any tricks. 
Don't start anything. Not much. Mr. Uh, Reno, where did you first come in contact with the prisoner? I'd rather not say. Well, go ahead and tell him, Joe. It'll hand him all a good laugh. Quiet. Quiet. It's your duty, Mr. Reno, as a citizen. And what a citizen. Quiet. Go on. I first met this person when he came in my restaurant. Speak easy, Joe. He was always drunk and always abusive. And some of my customers had come to consider him mentally unbalanced. That's the first true thing you've said so far. Mm, that's important. You, uh, you say the prisoner showed signs of insanity? Well, I have to be nuts to eat in Reno's restaurant. Keep the, keep the prisoner quiet. Shut up. Sure. Did I cut the gas pipe first, Joe, or after? Quiet. Go on. Well, this afternoon I called on my friend, Mr. Hensel, to discuss some advertising. That's right. Through the door of Addison's office, I heard Banks threaten Mr. Addison. This was followed by sounds of a scuffle. Soon Banks emerged from the office, threw something out of the hall window, and hurriedly left the building. Wait a minute. Was Hensel in the office of the At a girl, Margie. I am conducting this investigation. Were you at Were, uh, were you in the office at the time? Why, no, I... You uh, probably got a phone call. Did you get a telephone call? Joe, I'm surprised at you. That telephone gag's got whiskers. I'm asking the question. Uh, did you get a telephone call? Well, yes. I was called into the press room. And while you were out of your office, Reno slipped across the hall and murdered the old man in cold blood. I don't mind, Mr. Phelps. Is that all you wish of me? Uh, yes, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Phelps. That'll be all. Thank you. Now let that guy get away. He won't stop till he reaches Siberia. You can always reach me at this address, Mr. Phelps. Better stick around, Mr. Reno. I'm conducting this investigation, Sergeant. You may go, Mr. Reno. He can go if he likes, but I won't be responsible if my cuts get a little rough with him. I'll stay, Mr. Phelps. If it pleases the officer. Are you trying to make a fool of me in front of all these people? I should say not. You're doing pretty well all by yourself. What? I demand his arrest for the murder of Mr. Addison. Mr. Phelps, I said I was ready to make a statement, and here it is. Here, I get this on the press and ready to roll. If we ever got scooped on a murder in our own office, the old man will never forgive us. What's on that paper? I'll tell you what's on it. It's the story of a rotten gang of dope peddlers headed by Joe Reno that's had this town by the throat for months. That's a strong statement. Preposterous. I don't mind. I've been working on Joe for a long while. The old man and I were going to spring it in today's edition. We had a confession from Rose Peretti spilling Reno's beans. Reno wanted that confession, and he murdered the old man to get it. That tale's the fabrication of a lunatic. What facts have you to support these charges? Where is this confession? It was on Addison's desk, but Reno destroyed it, of course. But the pretty gal will be here any minute now. Maybe Joe would like to hear the story from her own lips. Wait a minute. I've got bad news. Rose Peretti was found dead half an hour ago. <laughs> Oh. You covered that too, did you, Joe? You're smarter than I thought you were. What? Who is this Peretti girl? Don't you read the papers? She was one of Joe's narcotic customers. If this wasn't so tragic, it'd be amusing. Just a minute, just a minute. Who sent for this woman? We did. Why? It's a serious thing to keep important evidence from the district attorney's office. I try to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. Reno, I'd like to ask you one question. Did you know this Peretti girl? If you have any doubt about my character, Mr. Phelps, I'd be very happy if you'd look into my record. Spring it, Jake. Here's a record of Mr. Reno that you might like to hear. When Ryan and I went into Watterson's office, the dictaphone was still running. Maybe there's something on that record that Joe would like to hear. This has gone quite far enough. I refuse to listen to any further accusations. Uh, excuse me, I... I'm sorry I lost my temper. You bad boy, now you see what you've done? Of course, there was nothing on the record. Of course not. That one was a blank. We thought you might get clumsy, Joe, so we saved the real record till last. What is this all about? You'll know soon enough. There's a whole lot on here that will be of interest to a jury. Joe, bring me that UP loudspeaker. This one is good. Loudspeaker now. What have you done, Dick? I don't know. Steve, how do you spell asphyxiation? How do I know? Go get a dictionary. Well, you don't need to get sore about it. Uh, now then, Mr. Phelps, see if you can recognize this voice.
Are you satisfied, Mr. Phelps? Boy, there's nothing incriminating here. Ryan, I demand that you arrest me. Wait a minute. Listen. Get out of here. Close that door. What do you mean coming into my office like this? I mean business. Give me that paper. Get out of here. Give me that confession. Get out of here before I... There's something to yell about. With the compliments of Joe Reno. Joe Reno? Why, that's ridiculous. That isn't my voice. <laughs> You're not going to frame me. Hey, hey, no, 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 get away. Come and get me. You won't get far. Let me see about that. But before I go, I'm going to perforate a certain lousy reporter. Hey, look out. I can't go. Why? Maybe you hurt. Well, I don't know. Do you see any holes? Oh, I was so frightened. I never heard so many right. harps before. No, All no, right, no. you'll have to break my arm. My goodness, he was on his way to Sunday school. Take him away, Bill. Well, so long, old playmate. I'll see you in the electric chair. You're a smart boy. My grandmother would have liked you. You never can tell. Well, over the river. Skip the gutter. Come on, let's go. Come on, get him on. Steve, you're wonderful. Not bad at that. You've been a great help to me in this case. I, I suspected you. First, I knew a smart man like you would see through the whole thing. You? No. I'll probably have to have you transfer. Don't take it so serious. It was good practice, wasn't it? Listen, give me a front test spread on that. Sure. Change your story around, suit the facts, and make it snap. Come on, Say, will you quit digging up new facts? I haven't had any lunch. I'll send you in a bale of hay. Oh. City desk. Market bank thinking. Hold on to that Edison story. Wait till you hear this one. And listen, I want you to spell my name right. If you don't, I'm going to make you eat all them extras one at a time. Okay, Flatfoot. Someday. Reno. Reno. Joe Reno. R-E-N-O. Reno. Thanks. I'm sorry I misunderstood you. Anything I can do for you? Yes. Uh, here. Get this raise put through before I lose it. Sergeant, anything else I can do for you? Yes, but I wouldn't ask you to do anything like that. <laughs> Always kidding. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Be you know, I don't feel so good. I think I'll have a little shot. Haven't got time. See you later. Necessary. Have a little shot yourself. Why, well, Steve, it's Steve. I can take it and leave it alone. Gee, Steve, that's marvelous. It wasn't bad after the first couple of times. Dick, I, uh, I may not be able to join you. There's a big plate of liver and onions left over from last night. I'm waiting. I'm not a bad cook, really. Uh, I you coming? You get out of here. What are you trying to do, break up a man's home? Home? Home. Oh. pleasure.
Steve? Right, Box. Call me back. Good morning, Leroy. What's this bilge I hear about your selling a novel? What novel? Oh, every reporter has a novel in his trunk. Yeah, from the ones I've read, there's a good place for them. I thought you'd be pleased. I am pleased. I congratulate you. Only I hate to see you waste your time writing tripe. Tripe? Look, Laura, you're a newspaper woman and a good one. As for novels... Now, wait a minute, Steve. That's the way you feel about it. As of right now, I'm not a newspaper woman. What's that? I'm through. Oh, now, just a second, Lorelei. You can't do that. And why not? I have another novel in work and... Look, Lorelei, if it's a raise you want, $10 a week. No. $20? No, Steve, I'm through. Very hey, well, if your mind's made up, you'll have to give me two weeks' notice. Okay. Two weeks. Steve, I... Oh, <laughs> good morning, Lorelei. Good morning, Mr. Peabody. I uh, hear you sold your novel. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Peabody. Great girl, Lorelei. She's made a fine police reporter, hasn't she? She certainly has, no sure, mister. Uh, that is the newspaper, oh, mister. Uh, mister? Yeah, she's given me two weeks' notice. But you're not going to let her leave, are you? Not if I can help it. Good. Uh, by the way, Steve, uh, did you ever meet my niece, Susan Peabody? No, I don't believe so. I brought her here from California a year ago, been putting her through a journalism course at State College. Now she wants to quit school and uh, take a job on the paper. I have a full staff, Mr. Peabody. Oh, just a minute. After all, Steve, I own this paper, and... Uh, According to the terms of our contract, all hiring is in my hands. I don't need a cub reporter. I'm not running a finishing school in journalism. And if your niece wants a job on a newspaper, let her try the Chronicle. I was hoping you'd see it that way. Well, I'd much rather she stayed in college. Well, why don't you tell us, so? though? Well, it's uh, hard for me to say no to one of the family. I'd rather you did it. She's waiting outside. <laughs> If there's anything I'm good at around a newspaper, it's saying no. You'll need to be good, Steve. Susan's quite aggressive. I'm afraid her folks haven't been too strict with her. She needs discipline. Come in, dear. Steve, my niece, Susan Peabody. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Peabody? How do you do, Mr. Wilson? I'll leave you two to talk things over. Well, it's nice to see you. Uh, sit down, sit down, please. Thank you. So, you want to be a newspaper woman, hmm? There's nothing I'd rather do. Well, the journalism course at State is excellent. But it's so slow and so expensive. I hate being a burden on Uncle Amos. I want to earn my own way, and I want to earn it working on a newspaper. A very commendable ambition, Miss Peabody. But I wonder if you know that there's more to being a reporter than sticking a press card in your hat and going to all the better fires. <laughs> you sound like Uncle Amos. Now, listen, Mr. Wilson. If I'm going to work for you, we should have no secrets. I'm in a terrible jam. Oh? For the past six months, I've been working on the Lindbury Eagle. Cub reporter, $16 a week. Lindbury, it's a pretty tough town. Is it? I really wouldn't know. I only worked on campus news. But I cut so many classes, I flunked out of college. Oh, that's bad. Does your uncle know? Not yet. And if you'll give me a job, I won't have to tell him. Please, Mr. Wilson. I simply can't let him find out what's happened. He'd be so disappointed and so happy. Steve, hurt. what goes? Lorelei says she's quitting in two weeks. Laurel, I quitting? <laughs> Don't take any bets on her, Fletcher. Oh, come in, Fletch. Come in. Uh, you want to meet your new police reporter? Hey, are you bail bond peddler? What do you think? You suppose those Chronicle boys don't want me in the press room? Hello, Louie. What's new? The dicks say Herrick's ready to sing on the bank caper. Better check with the D.A. Oh, thanks, Louie. Okay, babe, no charge. See, Steve? Uh-huh. You pleased about your novel? Of course he was pleased, like you'd be pleased at losing a pot on Four Kings. You didn't quarrel with them, did you? No, I didn't quarrel. I quit. Quit? I thought you and Steve were sort of... Don't exaggerate, Wally. Well, if you're really quitting, that's the best news I've heard since the mayor tripped over that cornerstone and broke his leg. You couldn't mean you haven't enjoyed working with me. Oh, we haven't got anything against you, Goldilocks. It's that we don't want a dame on police. Any dame. Dames upset our style. You know, this press room used to be a nice, rough, dirty dump until you moved in, Lorelei. Now it's... Well, it's like a tea room. Only we ain't got any tea. Is any tea, hop? No tea, Wally. When are you gonna quit? Two weeks. You'll never make it. Nobody ever quit the newspaper, right? 
Cody Johnson tried to quit. <laughs> and look what happened to him. Somebody stole his watch. Remember? I remember. Hey, somebody stole my watch. Oh, that Louis Sneed, that thieving rat. I'll chew him up and spit him off the 14th floor. Oh, by the way, call your office. Steve's been trying to get you. Thanks. You know, all I, with you gone, things aren't going to be the same around the old press room. Steve Wilson, please. You mean you miss me? Mm-hmm. Like I'd miss the toothache. Steve Lorelei. I've just sent over your replacement. So soon? Two weeks is little enough time to land a police beat, so please cooperate, will you? I'll be glad to. Just a gag, he says. Okay, so a sock on the jaw. Just a gag. <laughs> well, why the sour face, Goldilocks? Won't the auditor okay your swindle sheet? Steve's sending over a new police reporter, and I'm supposed to break him in. Use the face a nice homey touch, don't you think? Yes, like a gutter. Well, I hope he plays poker. <laughs> Bad poker, that is. Well, we'll find out. Oh, yeah, and phone the janitor, Harvey. Tell him to bring back our customer door. Mr. Wilson sent me over to tell the police. How do you do, Miss Peabody? Amos Peabody is my uncle. Miss Peabody, I want you to meet Wally Blake and Harvey Cushman of the Chronicle. Hello. How do you do, Susan? <laughs> as fine a pair of jackals as ever stood a cub reporter's throat. Oh, now you don't want to pay any attention to Lorelei, Miss Peabody. Or oh, a couple of worms, sure, but uh, as long as you don't try to step on us, I. Uh... That's box three. I'll show you how to find the fire. Well, well, Jake Sebastian, ain't you off the reservation? How are things in Lindbury? Sucker still playing poker? Go get lost, will you? Sure, you know any good places to get lost in? Okay, okay. Thank you. What could you learn on a rag like that? Oh, you'd be surprised. The Eagle Orphan is only a block from the Winners Club. Oh, one of those poker joints. Hello, Moore. Lorelai Kilburn. Anything? 21. Hold the suspect. No make on the license. No, that's just the police radio. Pay no attention to it. So you play poker. Harvey? Susan, I had a woman beaten up in drunken brawl. She may die in a floater at the morgue. Someone might think they paid us to work in this job. Louis, this is Susan Peabody, our new police reporter. Susan Louis Sneed. He happens to like you. Louis is the best news source in the city hall. Pleased to meet you. Did you say Peabody? Miracle owns the Illustrated Press. What do we do about this, Laura? Better get upstairs, boys. The DA dug up a hot lead of that boil murder. Wait a minute, boys. Susan's going with you. How come? One of Steve Wilson's brilliant plays, Leading with a Queen. Rewrite, please. Thinks I'll get jealous and change my mind about quitting. Hello, McCabe. I'll have a couple of yarns for the last run. Uh, Mabel Steely, 24 of 519 Jameson Place. Jameson Place. Removed to the emergency with cuts, bruises, and lacerations. Husband John B. Steely held in the city jail, both drunk. No, no identification on the body. That's all, McCabe. Hmm. Interesting. What in the world are you talking about? Am I talking again? Do you ever stop? I want to play a couple of hands of cards. You know I haven't got time to play cards. I got a hunch it might be a good idea for you to start practicing. Here's my five. I'm in. I'll call. Full house. King's on the roof. No. Oh. 
Your deal, McGonagall. 42, tenth and oak, a man down. Ambulance, 14. Run. Well, little poker? It ain't post office, Doc. We just thought we'd kill a little time. Time ain't all you kill, sister. Deal me out, boys. How have you been doing your first day on the beach? How's she been doing, he asked. <laughs> Haven't had a bit of trouble. Everybody's been wonderful to me. That's good. Well, I go home? Mm-hmm. Funny, I thought she was having dinner with me. Well, I guess she misunderstood. 88, no make on the license. Uh, you haven't had dinner yet, have you? No, and I'm starving. Well, let's go. Isn't this a bit irregular, the managing editor taking the cub reporter out to dinner? This Peabody, as far as I'm concerned, you're not a cub reporter. You're the boss's favorite niece. <laughs> and a deal like that, how can I lose? You get her in a poker game, Doc, you'll find out how you can lose. <laughs> 47, no make. Profit, eh? Roger. Good? Mm, wonderful. I was crazy about that sub I yawning. Where'd you learn to play poker? Winners Club. One of those poker joints in Lindbury? Mm-hmm. It's quite a racket they've built up. Too bad, too. They shouldn't allow those clubs so close to College Green. Too many kids get the poker fever and spend so much time going to inside straight they flunk out of college. Good. No thanks, I don't smoke. It's really a shame. Those dives should be locked up. Well, there's a bill in the legislature now bars private gambling clubs within 10 miles of a university. However, it's buried in committee. Suppose we got it out. We? How? A crusade in the Illustrated Press. Pictures, editorial, sob stories. Uncle Amos, you know, just loves a crusade. Yeah, don't I know. Well... Don't you like crusades? When they're news. I'm old-fashioned, Susan. I've always believed a newspaper should publish news. Wouldn't it be news if we closed up those gambling clubs? Trouble is, people who want to gamble will find a way. Clubs are no clubs. Listen, Mr. Wilson. Have you ever been in one of those joints? Mm -hmm. Then do me a favor. Go out to the winner's club with me tonight. Get into a game and watch the people. And then decide if they shouldn't be closed up. All right, I will. Baby, this is my lucky night. Come on, Marcus. Wait a minute, big shot. You didn't pay for those cigarettes. Go buy yourself a mink coat, baby. No, life was never easy for Mother and me, even before Dad died. California's supposed to be the land of sunshine and gold. Well, you can't eat the sunshine, and the gold never seemed to stick to Dad's fingers. You see, he was the black sheep of the family. The one who wouldn't keep his nose to the grindstone. <laughs> I bet I'd have liked him. Oh, I'm sure you would. Everybody liked Dad. Everybody but Uncle Amos. Uncle Amos never had anything to do with him. I never even saw my uncle until I came to Big Town. He was just a legend. A legend about a mean, grasping old millionaire. <laughs> was I surprised when I met him for the first time? Oh, Peabody's all right. Why, he's a darling. Look at all he's done for me. Brought me east, paid my tuition. Rented me an apartment in College Green. Gave me an allowance. Well, there's the winner's club. please. That'll be a dollar for each chair. All right. Yep. Yep. Paper stakes, Mac. Sure. Okay, Chuck. She's at table 14 with that guy off the Illustrated Press. Good. Mark, come in here. What's she been doing all day? She left her apartment in College Green at 9, drove her crate into Big Town, and went to the press. She was at the... 
Mark sent in O'Hara. Oh, huh? Come on right up. She was at the press an hour, then she went to the city hall. Stayed there until 7.30 tonight. She got into a poker game, the press room. Ah, uh, she would. You want me, Mr. LaRue? There's a peasant at table 14 I want you to take care of. Check. So? At 7.30, Wilson took her to dinner at the Green Lantern. They left the lantern at 9 and came on out here. All right, you know what to do. I'll wait for you here. I'm out. I'll stay. I'm in. Five more. Cool. I'll see it. I'm in. All right. Let's go in and think you had it. I've had enough. Good evening. I believe it's your deal. Come here often? Every night. How are you doing? It's my third stack. Guess it's not my night. Huh? <laughs> I'll have a new deal if you don't mind. Next time, deal off the top of the deck. I don't take that from nobody. You were dealing bottoms and I saw you. Why, you lying piker, you? Uh, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. What is this? Let go, let go. Stick around. Deal the cards. What's going on? Let back it, back it. Let go! Let go! Hold it, Monk. Why not? Get him on his feet. I'll handle this. Uh. Unconscious on the 9th Street Causeway. What happened? Oh, I got out of line in someone else's territory. The Winners Club, one of those poker joints in Limbury. What a day in cheating and. Where's Susan? Susan? Is that who you were out with? You didn't waste any time, did you? Never mind the sarcasm. What time is it? One o'clock. Call home with see if you got in all right. What's the phone number? I don't know. Look it up in the book, uh, College Green. Nurse, where's the phone? In the hall. First turn to the left. Thank you. Oh, nurse, where's my coat? On the chair. But if you want to play safe, you'll stay in that bed the rest of the night. Thanks. Get me another cup of coffee, will you, please? What'd she say? There was no answer. Those two mugs. That big dame working for the house. Oh, my, I was framed. Taking Peabody's knees to that clip joint, what did you expect? Fan fan, an awkward corsage on the house. Here. Thanks. Taking her my eye, she took me. She's been living there practically for months. She didn't learn poker and journalism 7B, you know. What time did you say it was? I think it's time you called the police. Okay, let's go. Yes, Sergeant. 81, Vermont and Gary, a woman down. Yeah. I see. Thanks. Well, the Dicks went out to the witness club with a couple of Lindbury bulls. She wasn't there. Train they never saw her before. Didn't know when she went, where, or how. What happened to her car? Some woman phoned in a stolen car report at 11.42 p.m. Mm -hmm. No, my guess is no. All units. Keep alert for a woman age 20, red hair, 5 feet 2, weight 115 pounds, believed to be in the hands of kidnappers. They're not using her name. No, I asked them to keep it on the secret file. No use building up a scandal if she's all right. Shouldn't we phone Mr. Peabody? 
We've got to tell him, Steve. If it is a snatch, he'll have to pay the ransom. Stop talking like that. Ah! Rat! Try the number again, will you? Oh, why don't you try? Can't you see I'm so jittery I can't dial? She's home. For a girl who's supposed to be at work at 9 a.m., that little number keeps late hours. Oh, I'll quit it. Do you want to take me home now, or do you want to wait here and talk to her? No, I'll wait. She, poor kid. She may have been out looking for me. Maybe she's worried. You hope. No, I'll lay off, will you? What'd you say your number was? Now he can dial. RB1 4692. She was there just a minute ago. Do you suppose she has a party line and the other party's using it? With Peabody's influence, would she use a party line? When you got that busy signal before, you just dial the wrong number, that's all. Well, what now? Louie, don't you ever sleep? Not if I can help it. Looks bad for the kid, huh? What kid? You don't have to play dumb chum. Dumb chum. <laughs> I'm a poet, huh? I thought you had those dicks in your pocket. Don't blame the dicks. They didn't tip me off. I got other sources. You don't have to worry anyhow. I wouldn't give it to the Chronicle. Press for Wilson speaking. Yeah. You'll check the wheel for prints, won't you? Thanks, I. They find her jalopy? Where? In a vacant lot outside of Big Town. Well, that's bad. Snatch, all right. You think so, Louie? Cinch. Come morning, that winner's club mob will put the pressure on Peabody. Wonder what the little filly will bring on the hook. Well, if I run into any angles, I'll pass them on. Wait a minute, Louie. Come here, come here. Sit down, sit down. Louie, you pick up more dirt around here than 17 street cleaners. Okay, suppose the girl has been snatched. We're gonna need an intermediary. Huh? Go between, Louie. Go between what? I'll quit stalling, you know what I mean, and you're elected. Hey, look, Laurel, I don't let him do this. Louie, before we can put that girl in circulation, we've got to know the score, and you're the only one who can find it out. Please, if you think for one second we've that I... We've been good friends, Louie. Why, why, we've been batting around the city hall for a long time now. It's been me for you and you for me. You wouldn't let me down now, would you, Louie? Oh, baby, you're killing me. Oh, now. come on, Louie. Well... Okay, but I'll see what I can do. Attaboy, Junior. Come on, I'll get going. Well, no use stalling any longer. I'll have to call Peabody. Press room, Lord. I killed them. Thanks. No prints on the steering wheel. Well, that wouldn't be Susan. Well, that cinches it. I'll have to call. I missed it. I never should have given her that apartment in College Green. If she hadn't been living by herself, going around with those college kids, she'd never have heard of the Winners Club. I made a mistake bringing her here in the first place. Oh, you're only trying to be kind. Yes, but look what I've done to her. The poor child. They won't hurt her. They'll only shake you down. You better start worrying about yourself. What do you think I care about myself? To have her back right now, I'd gladly pay. Yeah, very well, I'll wait. It's Louis Sneed. Steve? We ought to get a squad of cops, go out to the winner's club, and round up the whole mob. We've been over that before, Mr. Peabody. We have no evidence. We can't even call in the FBI until the kidnapping has actually been established. Yeah, Louie. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right, I got it. Thanks, Junior. Louie's made contact with someone who's in touch with the mob. What do they want me to do? They want you in the southwest corner of 5th and Grand at 10 o'clock this morning. You must be alone. I just have time to make No, it. no, wait a minute. You're not going to pay off, are you? Well, I might. Why? It's the wrong way to handle a snatch. Why, if that mob shakes you down without any trouble... Steve, my niece is in danger. If I have to pay, I'll pay. I want that girl back unharmed. Miss Whitley, call the detective bureau. Tell Captain Murphy to have two of his best men meet me right away at 5th and Grand. Northeast corner. Got it? Yes, Mr. Wilson.
second desk on the right, Mr. Peabody. Nice of you to come, Mr. Peabody. I'm Charles LaRue, managing director of the Winners Club. How much do you want? Now, about that stock. It's a block of 50,000 shares of common stock in the Winners Club. Par value, $1 per share. I'll sell it par. The stock is already made out in your name, Mr. Peabody. Make the check out to me, Charles LaRue. I see. You'd be very slow if you didn't. I think you'll find this an excellent investment. Of course, the stock has never paid a dividend. Maybe it never will. But every investment has intangibles, values which can't be reckoned with dollars and cents. Quiet. Good morning, Mr. LaRue. Good morning. Deposit this to my account, please. There you go. Here's your stock, Mr. Peabody. You'll find it a very good investment. All right, boys, take him along. What's all this about? You'll find out at headquarters. What's that? Stock in the Winners Club. $50,000 worth. I just bought it. Not good, Mr. Peabody. Not good. Come on, Harding, what's the rap? Did you talk to Cashier? He told me the money had been legally deposited in LaRue's account. For the last time, Harding, I demand that I be allowed to phone my attorney. He has a point there, Mr. Peabody, of course. However, take him down and book him on an open charge. Then bring him back. What the corporation commissioner have to say? The Winners Club is a legitimate corporation. LaRue had a legal right to sell that stock. The commissioner said if you want your money back, you'll have to go to court. I don't care about getting the money back. I want Susan back. Harding speaking. For you, Wilson. Hey. Yeah? What goes, Steve? Oh, I see. How long will you be up there? I'll call you. Louis, they have a man in the DA's office by the name of LaRue. He just shook Peabody down for $50,000. Chuck LaRue. I was afraid of that. Goldilocks, this whole caper smells. And that babe with the innocent look. What does Steve Wilson want to go taking her out for when him and you... Maybe he only did it to make me jealous, huh, Louis? Maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't. But Goldilocks, if he's given you the runaround... Louie, you're just a sweet sentimentalist. Well, this whole caper smells. Forget it, Louie. If anything goes wrong, no one will blame you. I know, but... Darling, I'm terribly sorry I'm late, but my car was stolen last night, and I had to spend the night with a girlfriend. Girlfriend? Yes, Mona Lawrence. And we got to talking over coffee, and time just slipped by, and... Include me out of this. Steve wants you to call him right away. Oh, is he all right? You know, there was some trouble last so night. So I heard. I'll get Steve on the phone for you. Gee, I suppose he's mad at me. Oh, dear. I wonder if he'll fire me. No, I don't think he'll fire you. He'll probably murder you. Steve Wilson, please. Hello, Steve. Oh, I'm all right. I spent the night with a girlfriend. Well, never mind that. I'm in the DA's office on the 14th floor. Get up here right away. Now, bring Lorelei with you. He wants us both to come up to the DA's office right away. He says it. Never mind what he says. Come on. Fourteen, please. Okay, Susan, start talking. About Steve? Oh, I think he's wonderful. You didn't mind about his taking me out last night, did you? Why should I mind? Well, I thought maybe there was an understanding between you two. Your well, understanding wouldn't... between me and Steve is that I'm quitting 13 days from today. 
Susan, would you be interested in knowing that your night with Mona Lawrence cost Mr. Peabody $50,000? How? Never mind. Well, I don't see why I did it was wrong. There was some trouble at the women's club and Steve disappeared. I waited a while and decided to go home. My car was missing, so I called the police and told them it was stolen. And then I took a bus and went to Mama's. Weren't you at all worried about what happened to Steve? Of course I was. I kept calling his house, and finally I called the office, and the operator told me he'd come in and gone out on a story. I presume you know my niece. Sorry, I've never had the pleasure. On the contrary, Mr. LaRue, you cashed a check for me once, remember? I've cashed checks for so many people. That's all, LaRue. You're free. Now, wait a minute. This man just swindled me out of $50,000. You're not going to let him get away with it. I didn't swindle you out of anything. You bought some stock in my club. Sure I did. But that was on the assumption that he had my niece. You led me I to don't believe... I where you got that idea, Mr. Peabody. I never mentioned your niece. Well, right, now look here. This is nothing but an open and shut case of fraud, and I'm going Take to see Take it easy, it. Mr. Peabody. I'm sure your investment is going to pay off. Are you through with me? Anytime you want to get a check cash, drop in. Now, young lady, just exactly what happened last night? Wait a minute, LaRue. That was a very clever trick. But don't get the idea we're through with you. That's just part payment on last night's account. Down. And I spent most of the time telling her about my new job. So, there it is. You should have phoned the office this morning instead of sitting around chatting with your friends. I never seem to do anything right. It wasn't your fault. Forget it. It was my fault, and I'll never forget it. I've caused you nothing but trouble and expense ever since I came here. I'm going to give up and go back to California. You're doing nothing of the kind. You wanted to be a reporter? Very well, we'll make you a reporter. I'll get back to the press room and go to work. Oh, Uncle Amos, you're a darling. Coming, Lorelei? Well, all I'm staying here. You're on your own, Susan. Oh, Susan. No one knows anything about this business, so don't talk to Wally or Harvey. Of course not. What was the idea of stopping me with LaRue? LaRue wasn't as smart as he thought when he sold you that stock. We're going to use it to close up the Winners Club, yes, and every other club in Lindbergh. That's a worthy ambition, Mr. Wilson, and not an easy thing to do. Of course, there's that bill before the legislature. Very committee. We'll dig it out of committee. Will you cooperate, Harding? Absolutely. Good. We'll use a full-page spread with pictures. Lots of pictures. We'll put on a good old-fashioned muckraking expose. And what's more, AP, I'll get your money back. Lord, I killed them, Sergeant. Anything? Thank you. Everything's quiet. Are you sure you won't need me any longer? You've had a hard day. Go home and rest. It's so kind of you, Lord. I do appreciate it. Forget it. Good night. Good night, Lord. Good night, boy. Good night, beautiful. Take it easy, Shin. Hiya, Scoop. What's breaking? Same to you, sister. Hey, you guys, that Hawkins story. The dicks are holding out on you. The dame sang two hours ago. I had a hunch they'd try to pull a fast one on us. Come on, Wally. I'm giving them the runaround. The dame's still clammed up. They'll murder you. Let me worry about that. You know, I've been thinking. And? Little Miss Innocence ain't on the level. I racked with Steve. Please, Louie, I don't want to hear any more about her or... Don't try to kid me, Goldilocks. You're carrying a torch like the Statue of Liberty. I didn't think it showed. Well, it does. Are you going to be a sap and let that piece of no-good fluff break you two apart? I'm sure Steve knows what he wants. Well, it ain't what he wants. And most of all, it ain't what you want. And between the both of us, we're going to straighten them out about her. She's palsy-walsy with more wrong G's than a, than a bail bond broker. What am I saying? You know Jake Sebastian? Should I? Top man at Chuck LaRue's mob. Yesterday, right here in the city hall, I seen him talking to her. So? So. Take that shake down. Say that Chuck LaRue had Steve framed. Say he had Susan's car stolen. Say he had her trailed out to her girlfriend's house. 
Say that he knew she'd be out of circulation until morning. What I want to know is... How he'd know she wouldn't check in here until after 10 this morning. Ah, so you've been thinking about it too, huh? Naturally. Okay, do something. What should I do? Should I be bothered because her uncle is shaken down for $50,000? Should I care if Steve Wilson is making a fool of himself over the girl? Don't give me that Goldilocks. You care all right and plenty. All right, I care. So do I. I was a go-between on that deal, you know. I was double-crossed, too. Okay, Louie. I might do a little checking. Okay, kid. You go into your dance and I'll go into mine. And tomorrow we'll compare notes, right? Right. When we get through with her, they'll be putting her face where it belongs, on, on iodine bottles. Hello, Limber Eagle. City desk, please. Hello, Hanks. Lorelai Kilburn. Fine. I want to check up on one of your new cub reporters, Susan Peabody. No. She claims she worked for you. Oh, I see. Thanks. Not more than half a column, Joe. We're tight now. And when we break that winners' club story in the final... Okay, then kill it. I'll be ready any time. Be with you in five minutes. Hello, Jimmy. Lorelei? Are you in on this winners' club thing? Lorelei's covering a political meeting tonight. Republicrats United. <laughs> Very important. Ah, you lucky girl. Steve, I hate to mention this, but I've been doing some checking on your new reporter and... Very interesting, Goldilocks, but I can't go into it now. I'm going out to the winners' club. We're going out to the winners' club. To play this thing right, you need some human interest angles. Very well. I'm your girl. Uh-uh, that's out. This job is too dangerous. If it's dangerous for me, it's twice as dangerous for you. I'm going. You're not. I am. You're not going to the Winners Club tonight. Not too loud. Not with Monk and Marcus breathing down his neck. He was right, Chuck. They're here. Good. Bring them in. After the trouble you caused last night, Wilson, you and your friends aren't welcome here. Do you want to get out peacefully? We're not leaving the room. Oh, no? Keep out of this, Monk. You too, Marcus. Remember I told Mr. Peabody his investment would pay off? Well, he's assigned the stock to me. Only a piece of this joint, I have a legal right to enter it at any time. So, if you still want to put us out, hop to it. What do you say, LaRue? Come on, Laura. Successful evening. We got some nice pictures. Give us a good spread, Wilson. Bad publicity is better than no publicity. An aphorism, Mr. LaRue, which I hope to disprove. Come on, Lorelei. Partners. Come on, O'Brien.
I never expected it to be that easy. No, we're not home yet, Goldilocks. Listen, driver, your cab is in the garage and the guy that stole it is in jail. They didn't beat you up, did they? Good. I'll send in a bill. I'll okay anything within reason. How are they? They're pretty good. I'll have some more when they're washed. Anything familiar about that girl? What's on your mind? That suit. The Bonton shop. There are hundreds like it in Big Town. Uh-uh. It's an original. It came from Paisley's and it costs plenty. You can't fool a woman. What you're trying to tell me is that the girl is Susan Peabody. What you're not trying to tell me is how Susan can afford an original Paisley on the allowance that Peabody gives her. Do you know how much he gives her? No, but I know Peabody. So you know Peabody. So I know that suit and the girl that's wearing it. What's it prove? Plenty. Only suddenly you've gone stone blind. Well, Laura, you must love limbs. You climb out on so many. Very well, Steve, you asked for it. Here it is. I checked with the phone company. Susan has a one-party line. When I got that busy signal last night, Susan was home in her apartment. You dialed the wrong number. Okay, pass that one. The girl never worked for the Lindbury Eagle. Well, don't all would-be reporters lie about their experience? We'll skip that one, too. Now, see if you can knock this one out of the lock. She never stayed with Mona Lawrence last night. Mona Lawrence hardly knows her and hasn't seen her for weeks. So she told a fib. A fib? Steve, she's not only a liar, she's pure poison. Are you going to write that story on the witness club, or shall I give it to a rewrite man? You like that girl. Susan has a one-party line. You skip that one. She did work on the Lindbury Eagle. She did stay with Mona Lawrence last night. Does she think we're, we've been asleep? We've known all that since noon. If we hadn't been so busy, we'd have been able to do something about it. Well, we're not too busy now. Hey, this is pretty good. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's fine. Excuse me a minute, darling. Don't go. Yes? Oh, hello. Oh, no. No, you didn't get me out of bed. I was wondering, mind if I drop around for a while? Why not? Fine. I'll be over in 20 minutes. Bye. Bye, darling. You were sweet to bring me home. What's the matter? No more of that. Why not? Let's stay healthy. Your boyfriend's beginning to get wise. He ever finds out about us. So you're scared. Look, I know him when he's jealous. He'll blow his top. Oh, so I'm getting the brush off. Don't get sore. I know a brush off when I get one. And I won't forget it, not for a minute. Now get out. That's the way you feel, sure. Good night, baby. Oh, shut up. <laughs>
nice of you to come and see me. Nice of you to let me. Well, of course, the little place you have here. I like it. I planned to stay at the sorority house, but Uncle Amos insisted that I take an apartment. Now I'm glad I did. Yeah, sorority sort of a uh, cramper girl style. If you know what I mean. I'd be pretty dumb if I didn't. How'd you make out the Winners Club story? Fine. When that blast hits the Capitol, it'll be all over but nailing on the padlock. Did you get some good pictures? Now, don't tell me. I was there. Oh. I wanted to see the fun, so I went out. And your cameraman started making wild shots, and I had to duck. I was afraid that Uncle Amos might be peeved if he knew I was there again. Uncle Amos is already peeved. I know. I'm sorry. Sorry? Sure, sure. Are you also sorry you lied to me about working on the Lindbergh Eagle? You don't hold that against me, do you? No, but you shouldn't have lied to me about uh, staying with Mona Lawrence. All right, now, tell me the truth. What really happened last night? Well, when I found out my car had been stolen, I called up my boyfriend and had him come out and pick me up. We drove around for a long time, and then about 2.30, I came back here. I needed a coat. It was a cold night, remember? Mm-hmm. How long did you stay? Well, just a few minutes. Then we went out again to a few late spots. What did you call while you were here? Well, I didn't call anyone. But my boyfriend did. Just who is this boyfriend you're talking about? He's just a boy. College boy? Of course. He, uh, wouldn't be connected with that LaRue mob, would he? Oh, heavens no. He's just an unsophisticated kid. He gets mad whenever he finds out I've been gambling. He's told me again and again I should stay away from those places. Well, if he's that concerned, he must think an awful lot of you. He does. He's frightfully jealous of oh. me. I wonder if... <laughs> If he should happen to come by tonight, would you mind going down the fire escape? <laughs> yes, I could just picture myself. It wouldn't be the first time, would it? Would uh, that be your boyfriend? He bores me. It uh, could be for me, you know. I suppose you told everyone in the office you were coming here. No, no, just uh, Fletcher. Hello? Mr. Mullet, Mr. Fletcher. Thanks. Yeah, Fletcher. Uh-huh. All right, Tom, I'll be right along. All right. Your uncle's leaving for the Capitol in half an hour. He wants to see me before he goes. Sorry, I have to rush off. When Uncle Hamlet talks with the herring, the train seals bark. Tell me, Steve, you also balance the ball on your nose. Now, stop pouting. It was sweet of you to come and see me. Smart private eye, so well, they hired you. Huh? Some shamus. What kind of a case are you on? To get the goods on this two time of tomato, her old man will pay off. Well, keep your nose clean. Hello, Junior. Hi, boy. No, no, look. I, what are you doing here? Hey, take it easy. That's my gun. Come on, give. What are you hanging around here for? I'm checking up on that Peabody dame. Who's paying you, Lorelei? Oh, come now. Don't be a cad. Let's keep her name out of this. And if you want to know something, you ought to be ashamed what you're doing to that girl. All right, Louie. Have fun. But I suppose you know you're playing with dynamite. What do you think you're playing with, marbles? Uh-uh. Dice. Loaded dice. Well, I'll be seeing you. Hello, baby. Early, darling. Business was slow. Jake got you home all right. I'm here. You're not jealous of Jake, are you? I'm jealous of everybody. Chuck, quit. Haven't I a right to be? After all, you're my wife. Then it's about time you started treating me like a wife. What are you talking about? Jake. It wasn't his idea to trail me around all day yesterday. Oh, baby, you're just a kid. That was a big deal. 
And to be sure it was set up right before I sat into it. You picked a fine guy to follow me. At the Green Lantern, he was so obvious, he almost tipped the play. I still don't see what was necessary. You can't blame me for trying to protect myself. I only blame you for not trusting me. Does that look like I don't trust you? Is it all here? It's all there. 50,000 bucks. If I don't get any ideas, half of it's mine. No, darling. All of it is ours. Okay, Uncle Amos, penny-pinching old skinflint. Now, what do you think of your favorite niece? A millionaire, and he puts me up in a place like this. He buys me a car, a second-hand roadster. He gives me a fur coat, rabbit, and jackrabbit at that. I get an allowance, 30 bucks a week. And you know how he lives? I can guess. You know how he dresses his daughter? Mink, no less, okay? Starting tomorrow, I wear mink. You don't want to crowd your luck, baby. Maybe I do want to crowd my luck. When you have the cards, you play them, don't you? Okay, so we've got the cards. And we've only started. We've got 50,000 bucks. Pretty soon we take him for another 50,000, and after that... What's the matter, Chuck? Quit dreaming, Susan. We got 50 G's, and we were lucky. Have a smoke and cool off. You know very well I don't smoke. Who's been up here? Who was up here? Jake. Jake, huh? My good friend Jake. So that's why you put on a fancy outfit. That's not true. I put this on for you. Jake only stayed a few minutes. Long enough to smoke a couple of cigarettes, huh? And long enough to make a couple of passes at me. Which you brushed off, of course. Yes. That I'd have to see. I've been watching you two. Darling. Shut up. I've kept you waiting, Mr. Peabody. I had a little business. Look what the Chronicle's running. Amos Peabody, publisher of the Illustrated Press, has bought a block of common stock in the Winners Club. It was revealed today. The Winners Club is one of several private gambling clubs now operating in Lindbury. That changes everything. Why? In the light of that story, our blast against the gambling clubs is not an expose. It's a publicity stunt to build business for the Winners Club. Well, it certainly looked like that, all right. And what does that make me? Appearing before the legislature and asking them to pass a law closing a club in which I own an interest. Well, they'll say that's a publicity stunt, too. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Run the whole story of the shakedown exactly as it happened. However, that means dragging Susan into it. Steve, I'm afraid she's already in it. Well, I'll have Laurel. I'll write the story right away. When you get back from the Capitol, we'll see what we can do about your $50,000. We'll see what we can do about Susan. Your taxi's waiting, Mr. Peabody. Well, good luck with the legislature. Thanks. All right there. Yeah. Set him in, will you? All right. What do you want, Steve? The Chronicle's running a story on Peabody's buying that stock. So we've got to run the story on the shakedown. The straight, unbiased, unvarnished story of what happened. Will you write it? No, tonight? Naturally. We can't use it as a follow-up. It'll look too phony. Wait a minute. Steve Wilson. Wilson, this is Chuck LaRue. I understand you're running your big story on the Winners Club tomorrow morning. Now look, Wilson, why don't you talk it over with me? I realize all that, Wilson, but what have you got to lose? Well, boss, here we are. Ordinarily, I'd be glad to come to your office. To be perfectly frank, Wilson, and I don't dare stick my face in the big town until some of this heat is off. No, I'm not at the club. I'm in College Green. Wilson doesn't know where you live, does he? The address is 595 Oak Street, apartment 402. I've got it. I'll be right over. Did you hire Louis to watch Susan's apartment? I certainly did not. What's he doing there? How would I know? Where are you going? Susan's. Why the heating? It's cold night. You're humorously. 
Look, Steve, you're only sticking your neck out for what? For Peabody's dough, they're 50,000 bucks. Don't give me that. You don't care about Peabody's mm. dough. You have your mind on Chuck LaRue. So he beat you up last night and showed you up today. Why not forget it? Forget it? Are you kidding? Now get on that story. Send Fletcher in here. Fletcher, Steve wants you. You want me, Steve? Yeah, Fletcher, here's the play. The rule wants to see me. He just phoned from Susan's apartment. Here's the address. Susan's, eh? Well, I'm not surprised. Neither am I. Now, look. If you don't hear from me in 40 minutes... I'll be out there with a the carload of cars. No, that's no good. We've got nothing on the rule yet. Get a couple of the boys from circulation. I know just the pair. And stand by for a call. I'll be waiting. Not yet, Goldilocks. Now, listen, kid. Put down a fin for me on Wee Willy Winky in the third at Hialeah. A fin on Wee Willy Winky in the third at... <laughs> no, no. Now look, Steve just went upstairs. You better hurry out here right away, Lorelei. There's something cooking and I'm afraid it's too hot for me to handle. Okay, I'll be waiting for you in the lobby. Up five. You're five? And up you five, boss. Are you nuts? <laughs> Take my money. <laughs> I'll stay. How many? Two. One card. You? I'll play these. Dealer takes three. In the kitchen. Come in, Wilson. How are you? Fine, thanks. I believe you've met the boys, Monk, Marcus, and Jake Sebastian. Sure, hi, boys. Hi, Wilson. Little game you having? Yeah, Postman's Holiday. Mind if we finish his hand? No, oh, go ahead. Well, cozy little case you've got here. I like it. Jake, you open. Uh, 20. 20 more. There's still time to kill that story, isn't there, Wilson? Plenty of time. I'm saving it for our final. You guys are awful brave, betting into a pant hand. I'll call. And 50 better. What are you so proud of? 50 more. You sure you don't want to change your mind about it? The story? Can't. It's enough to me. It's up to Peabody. The persuasion you were looking for, you should have invited him here. You'll do. Yes, I think you'll do very well. What do you say, Monk? It's a hundred to you. I'll call. I mean, what do you got? Four deuces. Deal, Jake. Look, LaRue, if there's something on your mind, let's have it. Don't worry, I got plenty on my mind. You want a drink? No, thanks. What will people say when they find out the managing editor of the Illustrated Press owns a piece of the Winners Club? When they read the paper in the morning, they'll find out just how the whole shakedown was engineered. And they'll say that LaRue and his mom ought to be run out of the state. Why don't you sit in here? <laughs> no, thanks. Too rich for my blood. Table stakes, as much as little as you like. Okay. Send his life. What do you have? I think $100. Good deal, Wilson. Oh, no, it's Sebastian's deal. Go ahead, Jake. Jake doesn't like the deal. He doesn't even like to play poker. Jake just likes to play with dames, don't you, Jake? Yeah, Jake is a great boy with the babes. He can make more passes than a leather neck with a pair of crooked dice. <laughs> he has a particular yen for other guys' wives. You got a wife, Mr. Wilson? No. Nope. You're lucky. I mean, with Jake around. What are you kidding, that Chuck? Just kidding, Jake, old boy. Just kidding. You won't need a ride around here, Wilson. It isn't that kind of game. Just a big, happy family, huh? Okay. You crossed me up very neatly, Wilson, running that shakedown yarn. I'm surprised Peabody want to get his knees mixed up in a sordid story like that. You don't know Peabody. He's a tough old guy. I wonder if he's tough enough to take what I'm going to dish him. Baby, come in here. Mr. 
Mr. Wilson, meet Mrs. LaRue. I've already met Mrs. LaRue. Found her very charming. She's charming, all right, but not very smart. No? Who planned this caper? Who dragged Wilson out to the winners' club and set the deal? You did, dear. Well, what do you mean, I'm not smart? Sit down, baby. Deal her in. Nobody minds? Six hands. Nice game. Yeah, the set is shy, though. That's better. for five. What do you mean I'm not smart? Put it on the line. I'll stay. Would a smart girl knowing me very well play around with my best friend? You staying? Yeah, I mean. Me too. Look, LaRue, I don't know what you and your marital problems have to do with my running that story. Cut. One. One card. Two cards. Look at it this way, Wilson. How would Amos Peabody like for it to be known that this kid here, this green pea from the West, came into town and made a sucker out of her uncle? He won't know anything about it till the paper hits the streets. You'll know it if you tell him right now. Peabody left town ten minutes ago for the state capitol. Get a bill through the legislature, that'll close you up. Then you're the only person in town who can kill the story. Right. Wrong. Check. 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 Bet 10. You don't seem to understand, Wilson. There's a story breaking right here that'll back your winner's club story right out of the newspaper. Mark, Mark, it's on your way. You got your stories. Hey, what goes? Sure. Sit down. Marcus, why don't you tell the cops? You and me and Monk was playing poker here with Jake and this guy, Wilson, and the dame. I mean your wife. Yeah, then we got a call from the club. Trouble with a couple of the peasants. And me and you and Monk hopped in a car and hightailed it out to Lindbury. Leaving? Jake and this guy, Wilson, and the dame. I mean your wife here alone in the apartment together. Okay, on your way. Pull the car around in the alley and wait. I'll be down the fire escape. Scram! Okay, Wilson. Okay, what are you doing? Half that dough is mine, and if you... Shut up, you two-timing tramp. Half that dough is mine, I tell you, and if you think you're going to powder with it... Yeah, the money's half yours, all right, but where you're going, baby, it won't do you any good. You can't phone the cops, Lorelei. If there's nothing wrong up there, that mob will sue your paper for a million bucks. Come along with me. But, Louie... Come along, Goldilocks. Leave everything to Louie. Wilson, 
Steve Wilson. Six, three oh four. Are you sure you know where you're going? Sure, I cased this joint all night. Come on. Twenty seven, five nine five Oak Street, apartment four oh two, a shooting. Should the police believe I killed these people? You've been playing around with my wife. So had Jake. When the boys and I left you here, you and Jake must have got into an argument over Susan. You evidently blew your top. I trust this gun is registered in your name. It is. But you can't have a suicide without powder burn. Let me take care of the powder burn. Around it. Well, here's Peabody 50,000. Steve, she's still alive. Oh, too bad. Look, Kelly, I'm not interested in clinical details. Will she live? Okay, Kelly, keep in touch. Well, here we are. Where's Fletcher? He's swearing out a complaint against Monk and Marcus. Kidnapping, conspiracy, accessory before the fact. Hey, they left one out, parking in front of a fire hydrant. Yeah, they booked him on that, too. Hey, better. <laughs> well, what do you think of it? A beautiful blast, huh? Will it turn the trick? Will it turn the trick? I guarantee that within 30 days, every poker club will be closed up tighter than a Puritan's lips. How, Susan? Kelly just phoned from the general hospital. They've given her a transfusion. They say she'll live. Good. Hey, them mugs will need bond. Thanks for everything, Louie. Okay, Junior, no charge. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we call it a night? Oh, now, Louie, see. Now, there's the character. He's brash, he's sharp as a tack. He's hepped all the angles. You know, I think Louis would make a pretty fine police reporter. But still, I guess I already have a pretty fine police reporter. Laurel, I... You're not really going to leave me, are you? Well, I... Are you? Oh, Steve, you big lug. Hey, this building's on fire. Call me when the walls get hot. And now, before the next show starts, let's enjoy an intermission. You'll find our snack bar chock full of good things to eat and drink. Tasty, tempting hot dogs, thirst-quenching soft drinks, fresh, crunchy popcorn, a complete assortment of delicious candy, and a full line of cigarettes. You've plenty of time, so visit the snack bar now. A tasty treat will double your enjoyment of the show. For your convenience, we shall keep you informed of the remaining intermission time, three minutes before the next show starts. You still have time for a tempting snack.
snack bar will remain open during the show. I say, Reynolds, what's this I hear about the Army being interested in this project you're lobbying for? Well, it's not for publication, but they're planning to build an ammunition dump near the dam. I thought they were spending all that money just to help out a handful of bombers. <laughs> <laughs> and when I mentioned to the committee that more than 50,000 troops were stationed within a mile of the depot, they immediately increased the appropriation by a half a million dollars. 50,000 troops. 50,000 troops. Well, don't forget, Mr. Hanlon. All of our shipyards are not located on the coast. I don't think I understand. Well, now, believe it or not, we have four shipways on the lakes. They're turning out an average of a ship a month. That explains a lot of things. With your influence in Washington, why don't you get a bill passed to increase the old age pension for Glamour Girls? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, listen here, girlie. We're not following this precarious occupation for, uh, love. <laughs> what our friend is trying to say is that you ought to organize, start a revolving fund, and you'll be able to speak the language that he understands. <laughs> right? <laughs> now that you mention it, it is an ideal location for an air base. The enemy could never spot it in the air, and it's out of the range of the naval gun. It's very perfect. Come on. Coffee is served for now. Oh, oh coffee. Well, 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 come on. Wait for me, Blondie. ask me, I would say this has been a most successful day. Well, it has for me. Now I can postpone that strike until the project has eaten up more of the appropriation. <laughs> but, gentlemen, since war has been declared, we've learned one lesson. We must proceed cautiously. I think we should make plans to slip into some neutral country before the Intelligence Bureau gets after us. Perhaps when the war hysteria dies down, they will become more lax. These Americans are like children. They forget quickly the fire that burnt their fingers. <laughs> well, now, sir, you've actually found a very efficient method of prosecuting our war of nerves. No, no, no. I'm not going to accept all credit. These gentlemen have insisted that we could destroy more ammunition plants before we have to leave. Yeah. Last operation of yours, carried out with such finesse, beautiful.
You want me racing, sir? No, thank you. I may be detained here for some time. Oh, uh, are you going back to Cleveland tonight, Kenny? No, I'm staying over for a couple of days. Fine. You stop into my office tomorrow morning. A gentleman patient to see you, sir. Patient? I see patients only at my office during the day. Ask him to go elsewhere. I explained you seldom saw a patient at your home. What's his name? Mr. Cologne, or rather, Monsieur. I never heard of him. Seems very urgent, sir. Insists it's a matter of life and death. Why don't you see him and get it over? Oh, very well. Be back in a moment. Oh, Doctor? Mm -hmm. Don't forget your bedside manners. Oh, no. We all see Dr. Sanders? That's right. But I'm not in the habit of receiving patients in my home, especially at night. I have come a long way to see you. Plenty of other good doctors. I'm a very sick man. Sit down, please. appear to be in any danger of dying. You are quite wrong. All men are in danger of dying. The important question is when. Who are you? Just why did you come here? Wallace, how are things with you in Detroit? Fine. I'm faced with a strike that may tie up my whole plan. Ten thousand men. That's too bad. <laughs> yes, because I'll have to close one of my factories waiting for parts. Trouble is, uh, you boys should hire me as a lawyer. Then you could really wreck your business. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to him. <laughs> with that, Van Dyke, my plant might be able to use you over in Pittsburgh to throw a few monkey wrenches into the legal machinery. You must be mistaken. I don't know what you're talking about. That's strange. I was sure you would remember me. Your voice seems familiar. But I'm positive I've never seen your face before. In that you are but half right. You did see me before. Now you changed since then. Yes, as you have. Nature! Hey, doctor! No, no, please! Please, I don't deserve this! Sounded like a banshee. Just a momentary upset. Nothing serious. Sorry we intruded. Are you sure everything's all right? Yes, quite. Gentlemen, please accept my apologies. I, I shall be detained longer than I anticipated. But in that case, I think we can go. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. The doctor knows what he's doing. So do I. His patient looks crazy to me. Weird sort of fellow at that. Like a European. Seems to me I've seen him before. Well, let's go. Come on. All very straight. Oh, yeah. Can't we drop you someplace, Kearney? No, thank you. I have a cab. Be sure that your servant understands the instructions I have given you. Dr. Saunders wants you. You may prepare the guest room for Monsieur Canon. He'll be with us for some time to come. Very well, sir.
What are you doing in my cab? I thought perhaps you're going in my direction. Well, I'm not going in your direction. Mr. Kearney, are you quite sure you know in what direction you're really going? Why, of course I know. Incidentally, how did you learn my name? Did you thought I called you Toko Nitobi? The taxi camera identified the body. Said that he picked him up in front of Dr. Saunders' place. Then all we have to do is grab this Dr. Saunders and ask him what he knows. Sure, and put him on his guard, and then where are we? Uh, no. This is one time that we've got to watch our steps. Uh, what do you want me to do? Suppose you drop in on the dock and see what you can find out without letting him know that we suspect the place. We have a report that a niece lives there. You might work through her. Don't tell me. Let me guess. She's 50, flat-footed, and fat, with buck teeth, and probably wears glasses. No, no, look, Sherlock. This is your first case, and we don't want you to come it up, see? We don't expect you to marry the girl. Just see what you can find out, huh? Okay, Chief, I can dream, can't I? You kid. Hello. You're Stevens, aren't you? I'm Alice Saunders. How do you do, Miss Alice? Won't you step in, please? Thank you. It's good to be back. Where's Uncle? He's not very well this morning. He's still in bed. I wouldn't disturb him just yet. So sorry. Is it anything serious? Well, I don't know, Miss. He took ill last night after the dinner party. Oh, dear. Everything looks just the same. Anything new? Only myself, I'm afraid, miss. <laughs> yes? Uh, Miss Saunders was expecting me. Dick Martin. Yes. Come in, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Miss Saunders, would you see you, Mr. Martin? How do you do? I'm from the department. I'd like to see your father, Dr. Saunders. He's my uncle. He isn't feeling well. Is there something I could do? Why, yes. Uh, your uncle gave a dinner party here last night. Do you know who his guests were? I just arrived myself. Maybe Stevens could tell you. Stevens, was there a man by the name of Kearney here last night? Yes, sir. You know anything about him? No. If you could tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help. Well, you see, the police found the body of Kearney last night. He was either murdered or committed suicide. Oh, how awful. And if I could see your uncle, it might clear the matters up. I'll try to see him. Stevens, where's the dining room? In there, sir. Uncle Bill? Mm hmm? Uncle Bill, it's Alice. I just got in. Oh, what is it, dear? Uncle Bill, let me in. I'm back. Oh, Alice, dear, forgive me. But I was dozing. Stephen said you didn't feel well. No, nothing serious. Nerves, that's all. I've decided to remain in my room for a long rest. But I'm so glad you're back, dear. Can't I come in for a moment? I have so much to tell you. 
It's been so many years since I've seen you. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Isn't there something I can do for you? Are you a new servant? Not exactly. Rather, a very old friend of your uncle's, Monsieur Colomb. I'm Alice, his niece. Greetings. You're very sweet. And a beautiful young woman. You'll excuse me. What's your first name? Uh, Richard, but uh, you can call me Dick. Oh, Dick, this is Monsieur Cologne. He's an old friend of Uncle Bill's, Dick Martin. How do you do? It's a pleasure. Were you here at the dinner party last night? No. I came late. Uh, do you uh, know a Mr. Kearney? Kearney? I'm afraid not. Is there something wrong? Just a slight case of murder. It's too bad. Can I help in any way? Nope. Excuse me. Isn't yeah, I'd hate to meet him in a dark alley. Oh, I don't know. Make it a moonlight night in a park bench. It might be exciting. Oh, yeah? What's this first name business? Well, uh, I didn't know him any better than you did. How long has he lived here? I don't know that either. How about yourself? It's been years. Listen, do I see the uncle or don't I? He must be terribly ill. He wouldn't even see me. Funny business. Aren't you scared living here like this? You better come along with me. I think I can take care of myself. What's your name? Alice. Okay, Alice. I'll see you later. something about our guest. Well, there's not much I know. When he came here last evening, I thought he was simply another patient of your uncle's. He's an interesting man. Yes. Very. Not very well this morning, sir. He's still in bed. He'll see me. Tell him it's Wallace. Yes, sir. Will you please wait? Can't see you. 
Stone. medical history of a sick person possibly interest an industrialist from Detroit. You're the man who came here last night. As a patient, Mr. Wallace, as a patient. Funny noise. Is this room below mine? Yes, miss. Then it came from here. Is there something wrong? I heard a strange noise, like a body falling. Oh, I was stumbling. I was awkward. Yes, but there were gurgling sounds. Oh, I was humming. Is my voice as bad as that? Humming. Have you known my uncle very long? Uh, time passed so swiftly, it's hard to say. I think I first met him abroad. Some kind of international meeting, I believe. Are we going to have the pleasure of your company very long? It depends on circumstances. You sound like a man of destiny. One must not flirt with one's destiny. With the world and the condition it is today, aren't we all flirting with destiny? I suppose I finished my book upstairs. Oh, no, please. I didn't mean to disturb you. Excuse me. What is the time? Nine add three plus nine. And you tell me. Two one, three one, four one. Okay. Listen, Ryder. Have you seen the headlines? I certainly have. I never knew Curly had heart trouble. He didn't. He was only 34, sound as a dollar. And that Japanese dagger, what about that? One of us ought to go immediately back to Washington. I tried to get Dr. Saunders on the phone, but he's sick, according to the butler. Wallace is still registered at his hotel, but he's out. Maybe we can catch him before he returns to Detroit. Both of us should go back. I'll grab the first plane out of Pittsburgh here and meet you in front of Wallace's hotel. Good. See you then. Morning now, Mr. Ryder. Here's the letter. Perhaps should have been thrown in the basket, but it seemed rather strange. Why? It's a plastic surgery ad, but it mentions no name. That'll be all, Miss Hanson.
Yes, Mr. Ryder. Get me Amos Hanlon in New York, the Exchange Bank. Mr. Hanlon, Mr. Ryder calling long distance from Pittsburgh. Hanlon speaking. I think I saw him walk to the elevator a few moments ago. You may telephone his room if you please. Thank you. Mr. Wallace's room. Yes. Wallace, is that you? Who is it? Ryder. What time is it, Wallace? Nine, add three plus nine, and you tell me. Two, one, three, one, four, one. Van Dyke is with me. We've got to see you right away. Come up to my room. Obviously, he isn't here. I'm going to try again to get Saunders. I want Dr. Saunders. National 6516. I want to talk to Dr. Saunders. I'm very sorry, but Dr. Saunders is still confined to his room. Don't bother. I just want to make sure he was there.
someone in my room. Oh! What is the matter with you? There was a horrible something in my room. Are you quite sure it wasn't a nightmare? Oh, well, it most certainly wasn't. There was no one in your room, miss. I couldn't find a trace. Shall I look outside? Yes, please do. No one. You see? You think my eyes are playing tricks on me? When a young woman's nerves commence to give way, it is time she sought refuge in a strong man's arms. I just ran into yours. Mine might be dangerous. You're a strange man. I've been trying to make you out. Quite right. Curiosity killed a cat. Oh. Don't misunderstand. I'm not worth bothering your pretty head about. What if I think differently? Then I would say that you're a silly young creature. Why did we leave the cab down the street and walk? Just a precaution. I still think we should notify the police. After all, we can prove we're Americans. We just can't afford to risk the publicity. I want to see the doctor immediately. I'm very sorry, sir. Still, I'll go to his room. Perhaps I'd better speak to him first. Hey. Which is his room? I won't need you. me in. I've got to talk to you. Go ahead and talk. I'm not seeing anyone. You know, of course, about Kearney. He's dead. Yes, I know. Well, so is Wallace. Van Dyke and I found him in his hotel room. The point is, Van Dyke is breaking. Lost his nerve. Wants to seek protection with the police. There's only one protection against a weakling rider. Take the outside door to my cellar. I needn't tell you more. Saunders is going to meet us in the cellar. He wants to talk to us. I thought he was ill, confined to his room. Only a subterfuge. feeling this is a trap. Where are the lights? Right now. Why isn't Saunders here? The important thing, you're here. You turn weakling, Van Dyke. We can't afford to take any chances with you. Accommodating, Mr. Ryder. Thank you. 
in the basement. A what? A body. Right by the cellar stairs. I stumbled over it. Yeah, let's take a look. It was right here. It isn't there now? Alice, there's nothing to be frightened of. Well, I don't like it. Come on. I know I stumbled over something. Maybe I'm going daffy. Well, here's something else that's darn queer. This man Wallace was another guest of your uncle's. Well, that makes two of them. Oh, well, this is terrible. Stevens, where have you been? In the dining room, sir. You haven't been in the cellar, have you? No. You seen this? Oh, that's incredible. And we were both at that dinner, too. Alice, I'm going upstairs and talk to your uncle if I have to break that door in. It might be better if I spoke to Dr. Saunders. I might have more influence. Monsieur Cologne, I stumbled over a body in the cellar. It's still there? No, it disappeared. Perhaps it is your nerves again. There's nothing wrong with Miss Saunders' nerves. Of course not. Come on, Alice. A body in the cellar? Oh. I'm very tired, dear. Please don't disturb me. Dr. Saunders, two of your friends who were here last night are dead. That's most unfortunate. Heart failure, probably. I know, Uncle, but there's someone dead down in our cellar. Alice, I'm afraid your imagination is running away with you. No, it isn't. Alice, I insist you allow no disturbance to be made. My own condition won't stand it. Matters are quite all right in the house. But, Uncle... Please obey me, Alice. Very well. That door always been locked since you've been here? Yes. Well, haven't you even seen him? No, I haven't. Who takes care of him, feeds him? Stevens or Monsieur Cologne. That's a fine pair. I don't like either one. I'm going to take you out of here. It's too dangerous. I'm not frightened. I'll be all right. Nothing happens. You take and call me here. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, young man. Good night, monsieur.
and it was right here I found the body of Mr. Kearney. And just about this time. No hard failure this time. It's murder. Jap daggers. Mm, judging by their clothes, they were no tramps either. Well, get busy, officer. Get on the phone. Right. All right. But Stevens the butler has disappeared. Do you have any idea where he could have gone? No, he just hasn't come back. Okay, Alice, watch your step and I'll be over as soon as I can. That's a lot of bunk, I tell you. Miss Saunders says the butler's disappeared. Well, this is one time I refuse to suspect the butler in the case. There's no doubt those men found at the Jap embassy were murdered, but what do you make of those two daggers in their hands? Well, it adds up to only one thing. The man who did the job was also responsible for the Kearney and Wallace murders. Who was the fifth guest at Saunders' house that evening? Hanlon, the banker. Oh, I think I see what you're driving at. It may only be a hunch, but if we take Hanlon to Dr. Saunders, we may force the real murderer out into the open. Suppose you grab a plane, Dick, and have a little talk with this Hanlon. Point out to him the danger that he's in and see if you can get him to come to Washington with you. Yes? Mr. Hanlon, a special delivery letter for you. And since the envelope has a black border, I thought you would want it immediately. Bring it in. Will you marry me? What for? So I can beat you up. It's the only way I can get you out of here. Say, is the uh, butler shown up yet? No, he's probably frightened and quit his job. Alice, you were right. There was a body in the cellar last night. You know that? I'm positive of it. Only there were two bodies. They were found on the steps of the Japanese embassy with a dagger clutch in each hand. And they weren't killed there. Their bodies were dumped there. Why should you think they came from here? There were two more of your uncle's dinner guests who were here that night. Mr. Martin, I found this note in the dining room it's from the butler. It's Stevens. He's gone to see a sick friend. A brand new alibi, eh? You recognize the handwriting? No. Yes, I recognize it. You would. You doubt me? I'm not accusing anyone, Cologne. All I know is that four men are dead under mysterious circumstances after leaving this house. <laughs> Possible coincidence, but most unfortunate. Yes. There's only one guest left alive, Hanlon. Uh, let us hope that Mr. Hanlon escapes the fate of the others. Yeah. Get your hat, Alice. As long as Monsieur Cologne is here, I feel perfectly safe. So care. So long. A nice fellow. I hope you'll be happy. Goodbye. You're leaving? Yes, I must. It's most unfortunate, but your uncle will understand. Well, will we see you again? Who knows in this crazy world?
All right, come on, Colon. Well, that gentleman is my considered decision. This institution will not lend its support to any company, even in this emergency, which permits itself to be forced into bankruptcy because of the demand of its employees. What is it? There's a gentleman here to see you. No, I'm too busy. I think you should see this man immediately, Mr. Hamlin. Very well. Uh, there, gentlemen, you see what a slave even a banker can be to his secretary. Uh, we'll continue this talk after lunch. Adam? Yes? I'm Dick Martin. Uh, sit down, Mr. Martin. I don't have to tell you, Mr. Hanlon, but in the past 48 hours, four of your friends have died. Well, I'm not exactly illiterate, you know. I can read the newspapers. I gather you're not frightened either. A busy man has very little time to indulge in feminine emotions. Uh, just what do you want? I'm here in your interest, Mr. Hanlon, and possibly the interest of this country. In the present emergency, we can't afford to lose any of the much-needed business leaders. And do you think my life is in danger? I'm almost certain of it. Here's something I received in the morning mail. I hadn't intended to speak of it. Do you have any idea who the murderer or murderers might be? I do not. If I had, I would inform the police. Of course. As a good American, Mr. Hanlon, possibly you will be willing to cooperate with our department in trapping the criminals. Uh, just what have you in your mind? Well, we're reasonably certain that these killings have occurred in or near Dr. Saunders' home in Washington. I see, and you want me to act as a decoy or bait. Oh, is that it? Of course, there will be danger. Well, I'm not afraid of danger. I'd like very much to meet this murderer. Even more than you. Good. We'll take the first plane back to Washington. May I use that phone? Thank you. Chief, you cover the inside of the house. Be sure you keep your eye on handling. Okay. I'll take the outside. In there, Hanlon. All right, let's have a look at upstairs. You're not going to leave me here alone. He'll be here with you. This is Cologne's room. You mean it was? And this is Saunders. All right, Saunders, come on out of we're coming in. Thought you said this was always locked. It always has been. Uh, any other rooms? No. Servants' quarters, anything like that? One small one downstairs. Yeah. Listen, Chief. Oh, don't talk to me. You've messed up everything as it is. Take it easy, Stevens. Over there on the couch. Sit up. No, 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 no. I, I'm all right. Who is this? Stevens, the missing butler. What happened to you? You were slugged and tied up in that basement. You didn't happen to do that to yourself, did you? Why, no, sir. I... Stevens, did you write this? No. Cologne again. Or uh, Dr. Sanders, who also disappeared. Saunders missing? Yeah. What do you know about that? Why, nothing, sir. Who fed him? Well, I did. What illness was he suffering from? Well, I don't know, sir. 
When I brought him his food, he always spoke from an ante room or a dark corner. You couldn't have possibly have sneaked in there just once and fed him, could you? Oh, well, I... Yeah, you fell down on the job. Who, Miss Saunders? Oh, Miss Saunders, my eyes. She's my best girl. Your best girl? My best girl operator. Or was. So you're a flatfoot, eh? How well did you know Saunders? Well, I knew him slightly in a business way. Did you know that he was supposed to have mysteriously disappeared from a ship in the Orient ten years ago? Why, that's ridiculous. Something new, Chief? No, this is something old. See, the real Miss Saunders came to my office. She's been living abroad for the last ten years on the legacy. When she saw this picture of her uncle in the paper, she figured something was wrong. Well, I figured if somebody was posing as her uncle, I could put well, some... this has nothing to do with me. I'm leaving. Oh, sit down. You are by 12 o'clock. Better get him a drink. I'll get it. as soon as the surgery is prepared. Uh, uh, this is Dr. Nakuchi. He will assist you. This way, Herr Doctor. Thank you.
folks. The transformation is complete. Our faith in your ability was well founded, honorable doctor. We owe you and your cure uh, our undying gratitude for what you have done for us. Anything I can do to hasten the establishment of our new order and to destroy the archaic democracies is an honor and a privilege. Uh, uh, you, you accompany these men and they will see that you are fittingly rewarded. Thank you. Doctor, what's the meaning of this? I'm a member of the party. The Führer will hear of this. That's just what we're going to prevent. It's a little trick we learned from you Nazis. Leave no evidence behind. Let no sentimentality stand in your way. Since you're the only one who knows our real identity, this is merely a precaution to make sure that no one else finds them out. All right. Sorry, we have to ask you to share these quarters with someone else. But he won't be with us for long, Herr Doctor. You will pay for this, you apes. You swine. The Führer will wipe you off the face of the earth. Get out of here, huh? He evidently made good his escape to America and set out to kill us one by one. Why didn't you kill him like the others? Oh, I was necessary to the completion of his plan. Instead, he inoculated me with an insidious serum which quickly transformed me into this horrid monster you see before you. <laughs> and you must go on living.
thought I'd like to borrow 500 till I ring the bell. I'm afraid the bell isn't going to ring. Not in that well, anyway. No, oh, Riley, I don't want to discourage you. I think you're throwing good money after bad. But I... Now, don't get me wrong, Dan. I'll give you 500 on your own safe. I won't give you the money to make any more hole in that well. It's absolutely NG. All you independent operators need protection against yourselves. Listen, Mr. Anderson. That's one of the finest pieces of property in the country. And if I don't bring her right in over the crown, I've drilled my last well. That's how good I think it is. Difference of opinion makes horse racing. I'd rather bet my 500 on a horse. My man, you've only got 30 days left, then your lease falls back on us. You've been at it for two years now, and you haven't struck anything yet. Well, that doesn't mean I... I hate to see a friend of mine go wrong. Now, oh, it isn't a question of the 500, Dan. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a thousand, so long as you don't throw it away on that empty hole. And, providing you vacate the premises, as of tomorrow. Anderson, I have wrung a lot of oil out of the earth for other people. But this one is for me. Not so much for me as for my son. I've got 30 days. And I'm going to keep on digging, even if I have to do it with my teeth. For your teeth, I hope they stand up under it. Putting out your Christmas presents kind of early, aren't you, J.C.? What do you mean? Well, you practically laid the guy down, tried to force the grand in his kick. Got to stop O'Reilly from drilling another inch. Oh, why worry about him? Let him drill till he hits China if he wants to. When did I start worrying about anyone else? All right, have I got to draw a picture for you, you big lummox? I sold the man the lease two years ago because I thought it was a trick. Now my geologist tells me... The so-called boob is liable to hit the richest well in the history of the field. Any day now. No fool. And the contract calls for an additional ten years lease if he strikes oil. Now, can you get that through the thing you use for a head? Oh. If he can't drill, he can't strike oil. Can he? Discovery of the Neanderthalian man marked the last link in the relationship between the ape and the man. Now then, children, so great was their development over the ape that they were able, by the first display of reasoning power, to fashion tools and implements with which they wrested a livelihood from the soil. So you see, it really marked the first stages in the progress of man's thought. Soon after that, there was a further development of man. It came about by the manner in which they solved the housing problem. They began to find caves to live in, instead of sleeping in the open, a very definite departure from the habits of animals. There was yet to come a most important break in the relationship of the Neanderthalian man to the animal world. They began to stand upright like the present-day man. Perfect! man your size. Oh, well, I was only trying to help. Yes, I know. You were trying to kill him, you big... Clifford, are you sure no bones are broken? No, I'm all right. Big sissy like him can't hurt me. Never mind, helpful Harry. You've done enough. Not Harry. Henry. Henry Langford. Well, uh, now that you've gone this far, you can drive us back to the school. 
With pleasure. A thousand dollars. Me working like a slave for two years, investing all that money, and he offers me a thousand dollars. I'd like to have laughed in his face. I wouldn't trust that guy any further than I could throw an elephant by the tail. When Mr. Anderson starts giving you something, you'd better look out. You got something he wants. If we can just hold on for a couple of weeks, we'd be so darn rich we won't need to wash dishes. We'll just eat and chuck them out the window. The Murphys do that now. They got paper dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we're going to use for money. But, but who did it? And, and why? Did you get a look at him, Joe? No, Mr. O'Reilly, I didn't. They knocked me silly and... I... Then when I come to, they had their back to me. Better have Dr. Marsh look at that. Okay. from Anderson and, and call it a day. Nothing personal about it, Tom. I hate to foreclose on a friend, but that's how business is. Why, hello, Dan. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you. <clears throat> come in, come in. Come in. Does, uh, does that offer still go? Anytime you say the word. Well, now is as good a time as ever. Now you're talking sense. Uh, tell Collins to make out a check for a thousand dollars to Dan O. Uh, O'Reilly. That, 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 uh, Dan O'Reilly. Yes. Hey, Pop, if you ain't done it, don't do it. This is Mr. Lankford. He wants to talk to you. Aren't you going to wait for the check? No, we don't want your check. Come on, Pop. You know, I made the uh, geological survey on the Big Dalton Gusher. I find the same line formation in your cortex. You really think we have a chance to bring her in? Oh, definitely. I think if we use a slip hook, we'll be able to fish up that broken equipment okay. Well, Mr. O'Reilly, I haven't got much money, but uh, I'm willing to back up judgment with it. What are you, son? Shake, Clyde. It's a deal. Hey, snowflake. Get on this backup car, will you? Yeah, Come on, hurry right. up. Right. I mean today, here. Let's have that hard rock fit. Okay, come it up. Oh, no, you don't. You're going back to school where you belong. Oh, heck, Hank, I want to help you here. Can I help? Uh, yes, you can. 
Will you do me a favor? Sure, anything. What do you want me to do? Promise? Sure, I promise. Come on over here. No, I've been thinking. Your teacher tells me you're behind your study. And uh, I thought it'd be sort of a good idea to ask her to help you catch up in your back lesson. You know, in the evenings at her home. What? Go to school at night? Yeah. I don't see what good that'd do you. And it sure wouldn't do me any good. Oh, you want to back out on your promise, eh? No, I'm not backing out, but I thought you wanted me to help you with a rig. But, oh, go to school, God. That won't be tough. And I'll call for you in the car. Hey, you're not kind of falling for this, Miss Cynthia, are you? You stuck on her last time, pal. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Will you go to school? Hey, wait a minute. Okay, you win. All right. As an illustration, we'll do it again with the apples. Now, Jack has three apples, and his friend Henry has none. Apples are eight cents a pound, and Henry has two cents. Now, what happened to that third apple? I'm sure I saw it a moment ago. It now seems that Jack has two apples and Henry has one. Now you've gone and ruined my problem, you old apple snitcher. Well, if you're that hungry, I'll make you a cup of tea. Thanks, teacher. Thanks, pal. That problem had me dizzy. Don't mention it. How about a little music? Mm, well. Say, yeah, that's a good tune. Well. Mm. Why do prunes have wrinkles? Is it cause they worry so? My teacher ought to know. She knows everything. Does a fish get thirsty? Playing in the sea below. My teacher ought to know. She knows everything. She knows the alphabet from A to Z. And that why do folks like walking when the moon is hanging low? My teacher ought to know. She knows everything. One more course and the landlord will break my lease. <laughs> no, no, clear the things off the table. Second, please. Well, you help yourself. Okay. Beautiful piece of work, Cynthia. Yes, it's over 80 years old. Did you make it yourself? <laughs> Just a little something I whipped up when I crossed with Columbus. <laughs> <Flatter>. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I did fine. Tomorrow night, we'll go over your history. Tomorrow night? Oh, heck, why don't you let Hank come along? It was his idea in the first place. Just because he wants to see you, I've got to come over here and sit for hours and repeat. If Jack's got three apples, and Henry has none, what do I care about Jack? And what do I care about Henry? I, I, I don't know where the boy got you an idea. Go on, tell her what you told me. Well, go ahead. Don't be a coward. Don't shut your mouth. I'll wrap my ten fingers around your esophagus. He's nuts about you. That's what he's... Are he's nuts you? about you. Oh, Miss Tail, she's beautiful. She's wonderful. Miss Tail, she's gorgeous. 
she's divine. When a man wins her, he really wins something. I guess he thought you were a raffle. Hey, oh, let me oh, hey, oh, come on. Let me tell you. Hey, no. Yeah, I love you. I love you. Joking, I hope I do. Compatibility. Oh, I don't know, but well, you know, when a husband and wife and they both like dark meat, there isn't enough to go around. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you can laugh if you wanna, but I'm gonna find out all those things before I marry a girl. I said I wouldn't be too hard on the lady. The girl we're in love should adjust herself. Oh. <laughs> you take it, dear. Thanks. Adjusting yourself, huh? My meter showed that I placed 800 barrels during last week, and Langford helped me check my meter. Oh, yeah? Well, Anderson pays off by his meter. And that read 425. There's something wrong with yours. Langford tested my oil, and you only pay me on the basis of a 34 gram. That means 15 cents left for the barrel. What do we care about, Lane? We make our own sense. We want this. Mr. Langford told me. Oh, so Mr. Langford told you, huh? All right, boys, shut it down. I understand you're an expert geologist. Thank you. You've been giving your services free to the independent operator. Why don't you get smart and make a little money out of it? I could use a good geologist. I'm afraid you can't pay me enough money. Good day, sir. Uh, just a minute. Let me give you a little sound advice, young fellow. Knowledge improperly used is a dangerous weapon. Did you ever get cut with your own knife? Don't try any of your pretty speeches on me, Mr. Anderson. I see what you're driving at. I'm not afraid of you or your gorillas. Now, you just tend to your knitting and stop playing boogeyman with me.
down about 4,000 feet. And we're still cutting some pretty tough rocks. Well, what about we... Riley and Langford? They'll be in a second. A couple of beers, will you, Charlie? Oh, I'll get down. Down. Oh, going. Oh, oh, Harry, still pouring? Yeah. I think I guess we're all here. Okay, let's get going. Oh. Gang, let's cram out of here. That ought to get me hit to stay out of town. You mean to tell me this happened just giving a man a match? Wasn't what I gave him, it's what he gave me. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. Oh, don't stop. It didn't hurt, really. Beginning to like those guys that slug me. See, Mr. Anderson, we're putting it right up to you before we go any further. Well, boy, I didn't realize that my employees were practicing all sorts of abuses on people that I've been raised with. People that started with me in the oil business. I'm glad you've called this to my attention. And I assure you I'll do everything I can to put it right with you. I'm positively amazed. Stevens, you'll have to account to me for this. Well, now listen. Don't what? talk back to me. I'll see you later. And you can tell the rest of the boys for me that from now on, J.C. Anderson is back in his overalls where he belongs. Well, thank you, Miss Anderson. Thank you. That's fine. Well, That's fine. Fine. Boys, bad after all. I'm glad you came in. Come in any time. Doors wide open always, boys. Oh, Was that on the level? At my weight, I'm the best promiser in the country. You've got to be a little more careful from now on until I can get a couple of these troublemakers out of the way. Uh, you just tell me who's got... Oh, don't get excited. More important things to be done. Oh, you mean that O'Reilly guy, huh? Yes. Well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Oh, hey, I'll go up for the this time. Okay. Hi, Bob. Hello, son. Too much? 
thing to say about anyone. Even Anderson, especially when you can't prove it. Prove what? Hank, what on earth are you talking about? Cynthia, I found traces of corrosive acid on that cable. I'm convinced that Dan O'Reilly was murdered. Why, Hank, that's incredible. If I could only prove it. Well, why would he want to kill Mr. O'Reilly? Why? Why are there men like Anderson? Oh, I'd like to pull him apart and see what makes him tick. You mustn't say things like that. If what you say is true, anything might happen. Hank, you must promise me that you'll be careful, please. Now, don't worry, Cynthia. Nothing's going to happen. But, Hank, I still can't understand. Why? Oil, Cynthia. Plenty of oil.
Mills. Yep. I guess you'll be coming in any time now, huh? Hey, Bob, they're down to oil fair now. I can't wait any longer. I want you to bring young O'Reilly to me tonight alone. Yeah, but what about this guy Langley? Yeah. I want you to tell Alex and the boys that there must be no slip up tonight. They must go through, you understand. Well, good night, dear. See you tomorrow. Good night. all night. Nobody's seen him. Gosh, I'm worried. I'll go over and see Mr. Clemens. Uh, do that, will you, Miss Jackson? I have to get back to the well right away. All right, children. School's dismissed. Ready? Miss Clemens. 
Hank Larry has disappeared. Meet me at the wooden ring at 7 o'clock. Joe, come on. Meet me at the wooden ring at 7 o'clock. Hank's disappeared. Hello, oh, Tom. Want to see at the wooden ring at 7 o'clock. Black has disappeared. And when Whittle Wed Whiting Good came in the house, she said, Grandma, what great eyes you have. The better to see you, my child. And Grandma, what great sweets you have. The better to eat you, my child. Can you imagine that dirty rat? Right? Man, I took my dirt on the chip. Well, that was my shit. I'd knock that guy off. So Whittle Wed Whiting Good came closer and closer and sat on the bed. Hey, ain't you sleeping yet? Now don't worry, boss. He's as safe with Homer as he would be if he had the whole National Guard with him. I ain't right safe, fine. Hello? Yes? Yes, speaking. Oh, 
catch, will you?
do you like military school, Clifford? Oh, Hank, will you please call me Fishtail just once? <laughs> Abbiamo il più grande numero di guidatori che abbia mai partecipato in questa storica corsa. Come al solito, guidatori da tutte le parti del mondo sono già sottoscritti. Ma la sorpresa più grande sarà l'entrata della giovane guidatrice americana, la Boneta di Rossa. Come al solito... around the track in a reckless fashion. 
rather difficult to tell definitely who is leading at the moment. Drivers are continually passing and repassing each other. However, I shall have the official positions for you shortly. The big surprise of the race, however, is the, uh, the, uh, Blonde Comet. She's that American driver, you know. He's driving almost as well as the men. In fact, at the last checkup, I believe she was fourth. Or was it fifth? Well, no matter. The race is still being run. is bowling along at a tremendous speed. He's still in 12th place. Did you call me? Bring me a half-inch soccer wrench, will you? Half-inch soccer wrench. Coming right up. Hey, you know something? That blonde comet. Boy, if she's as good as she looks, there's going to be some spin-dizzy drivers around here this time next week. Oh, well, she isn't that good. Yeah? Well, she's good enough to drive in them foreign races. Yeah, but she wasn't good enough to win any of them. Yeah, well, just the same. If you ask me... I didn't ask you. Well, right has she got to be in this racket anyway? It's no game for a woman. It's tough enough for a man. If I was her old man, I'd spank her good. Yeah. Well, he'd have to catch her first. And boy, oh boy, you're going to have to do the same thing when she gets on that track. Well, <laughs> you better keep out of my way, that's all. Oh, boy, I wish she'd get in my way. Car or no car. What a sweetheart. Come on, come on. Keep your mind on the race. Here, tighten up those nuts. Okay, Doc says he's got better than an even chance now. How did he look? Pretty terrible. He is white as a ghost before the transfusion. I was white as a ghost after. <laughs> <laughs> how much blood did you give it? I don't know. When I woke up, it was all over. Well, then how do you feel? I feel a little wobbly in the legs. Doc wanted me to stay around and rest a while, but I told him I got a lot of work to do on my car before the race. So I better get to work and get this thing straightened up. <laughs> That's a laugh. What's a laugh? A sweet like Jensen with a couple of quarts of old southern blood in him. <laughs> yeah, it'd be funny if he came out of the hospital with a Texas drawl. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Oh, uh, Swede wished us both good luck in the race. Said he's sorry he wouldn't be in there throwing dust in her eyes. Look, Texas, you don't think you have a chance in that hunk of iron, do you? Well, it's have to fall apart in the first ten laps and put you where Swede is, or maybe worse. Why don't you get smart and forget it before it's too late? What's the matter? You afraid I'm going to beat you? No, no, not with that meat record. I wouldn't be too sure about that. I hit 111 up at Muir Rock the other day. I'm almost a sense to qualify. And if you don't, it'll be the best thing that ever happened to you. Why do you say that? Well, look, you haven't had any experience. It's your first race, isn't it? Yeah. You'll find it's plenty dangerous, even for men who've been in it for years. It's a lot different from riding bucking broncos, you know. Now you're talking like my old man. He used to say, take a cowboy off his heart, he's a pretty helpless galoot. Then he never was far enough out of the state to kick the Texas mud off his boots. Just the same, he must have been a pretty smart old man. Yeah, he was. But I'm going to prove he was wrong about that helpless galoot business. 
Well, see, I can't argue out of risking your neck, so good luck, kid, but be careful. Thanks. And if there's anything I can do to help you with that, uh, that. Just give me a yell. Okay, Jim. Two miles, nothing ahead of you. Go to it. Further is it to Los Angeles, Miss Beverly? We're in Los Angeles now, Jenny. We passed the city limit sign four hours ago. Oh. Well, looks like we go over the hill. Nothing like having your own private racetrack. All the nerve. she go? Pretty good. I didn't have her all the way down, though. I think I'll try her again. Okay, let's go. See that sign? Yes, I saw it. What of it? Well, what are you doing in here? This is a public highway, isn't it? Yes. Well, that's what I'm using it for. Well, I should think you'd have more brains than to be coming. Oh. Now, if you'll be good enough to move that yard dog out of the way, I'd like to get going. you again at Ascot. You think you'll qualify? Why, I'll run you out of gas, sister. Oh, you'll have a lot of dust in your eye.
a blonde comet. Boy, what a sweetheart. What are you looking at? The, the, the queen's tent. Why don't you get a load of that mate of hers? What a sweetheart. Come on, snap out of it. Give me a screwdriver. Yeah, yeah. screwdriver. Yeah, yeah. Get me a bottle of cough, will you, Jenny? Sure, Miss Beverly. Hot, ain't it? Yeah, yeah. How about that screwdriver? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is hot, isn't it? How about a cold drink? I said, how about a cold drink? Okay, give me a bottle of pop. Come on, right up. Hot, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Two ice cold drinks, please. Make it four, buddy. Come on, a little service. What did you say? Uh, four bottles of pop, please. Okay. <clears throat> My name's Curly. Curly Watson. Curly? Oh, well, when I was a kid, I had curls down to here. The name stuck, but the, the hair didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name, Toots? Yenny. Yenny? No, not Yenny. Yenny. Yenny Jorgensen is Swedish, you know. Oh, Jenny Jorgensen. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Jenny Jorgensen. Uh, to Talar du Svenska? Yeah, naturalist. Hela min familj är svenska. Jag var född i Sverige. Jag är den som kan tala engelska. Tror du jag talar gott engelska? Jag tänker mig att bra om deras land här. Det skulle vara riktigt tacksam. Jag ska sända till familj. Ja. Mr. Please, uh, have you got that pot ready, sir? Here it is. Oh, thank you very much. Forty cents. Yes, sir. Oh, this, this, this is on me, Toots. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Curley. Oh, that's all right, Toots. Hey, uh, what are you doing after the race? Huh? I say, what are you doing after the race? Uh, well, here's your uh, drinks. Thanks. I met you the day before yesterday on the road, remember? Oh, yeah. I'm with Jimmy Flynn, car number 75. <laughs> Boy, did you burn him up. <laughs> Was he mad? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> oh, I guess I better be going. Uh, so long, Toots. So long, Miss Comet. Uh, uh, Beverly. <laughs> told you I'd tell you, didn't I? Yes, you told me that two or three months ago. But I haven't been tempting yet. All right, you'll get it. I'd better, or you won't get any more tires, or anything else for that matter. Oh, you're gonna get tough, eh? Yes, with a mug like you. I don't see what you're doing in this race anyway. If I was on the commission, I'd have ruled you off a long ago. You're a disgrace to the game. You're no good. You're a dirty chiseler and a liar. And your dirty fighting is a menace to everyone else in the race. Where I come from, Mr. Vim's fighting worse. Why don't you mind your own business? If you were a young guy, why I... Don't give me that. Don't let my age stop you. Anytime you want to start anything, go ahead. And you're yellow, too, on top of that. Boy, that's telling him, Barney. Well, he had it coming. Did you qualify, son? Yes, sir. Good. Say, uh, 
I need a couple of new plugs. Well, they're right in the bottom right-hand drawer there. Help yourself. Thank you. Say, Tex, I don't like the looks of those two rear tires of yours. You better put on some new rubber. Can't afford it. Well, they're, they're sharp and dangerous. You don't want to break your neck, do you? No, but they'll have to do. Say, young fella, take two of those new tires there and put them on. I'd rather lose the price of two new tires to see you lose your life. That's mighty nice of you, Barney. Thanks. Oh, forget it. How's the new carburetor, Jim? Fine, Barney. It cuts my gas consumption about 40 percent. Well, don't cut down the speed, too, does it, Jim? No, not at all. Well, you know, I got a good pal in Washington who's in on the defense setup. If you like, I'll put a plug in for you. You know, Uncle Sam is going to need a lot of carburetors, and the less gas they use, the better. That'll be great, Barney. Well, can't promise anything, but uh, it's nothing like trying. You know, the old guy with the whiskers, if you got, if you, if you got something he needs, why, well, he's a good customer. <laughs> Attention, all drivers. Assemble at starting line for final instructions. All drivers, please. That's all. Give my helmet, Jenny. Good luck, Jim. Thanks, man. Oh, Miss Beverly, your gloves. Thanks. Most of you men have driven this course here before and realize how tough it is. Today, this I track is tougher than ever because of the rain last night. Place. It would be I'll dangerous to attempt a speed Are record here, so I know many of you will oh, try to win the winning points today Steve, in the form of scores. But you do so at a tremendous good. risk. Oh. Follow the rules. We've met before. Yes, twice. Good luck. How do you do? Hello. I reckon a lot of us are just going to be trailing you around today. I mean, that is, on the track. <laughs> I don't know. This is my first experience on a dirt track. You boys will probably drive rings around me. <laughs> Said she over modestly and not meaning a word of it. As is the custom on all tracks today, this race will be conducted under the rules and regulations of the three A's. Today's race, ladies and gentlemen, should be a real thriller. For here on this mile track are assembled some of the country's leading drivers, and the first time on any American track, a woman driver, the Blonde Comet, who will attempt to match speed with veteran drivers whose races number in the hundreds. It takes a lot of nerve, but advanced information from abroad indicates this little lady knows all the answers when it comes to race driving. You can look for thrills and spills galore before this race is over as it is next to the last tune-up race before the big track in Indianapolis. Get on. 
the upper right hand turn and another. The skins are coming fast and furious. I promised you a day of drills and spills the Lord, and it looks like you're going to get them. Wow. Just sit in this oil can. See? Just like I said, this is a real place to watch a race. Well, they won't come up in my lot, will they? Oh, no, they never come up here. Oh. Try that on Jim. Jim is running through the fence. Just a... 
boot. in the carburetor, Jim. Thanks very much. That's for Texas. You know, Jenny, I think I could learn to like that guy. Hello, Barney. This is Jim Flynn. Say, uh, we're trying to get together enough money to ship poor old Texas body back home. How much can I put you down for? Yeah. Huh? Oh, we need 300 all told. Put me down for 25, Jim. Oh, that's all right. The least we can do for the poor kid. Yeah, I'll be over. Uh, thanks, Barney. Goodbye. 25 more. How much have we got now? Let's see, uh, 170, 50, and 25, 195, 50. Let's see, that's, uh, four and a half. That makes 200 even. Uh, thanks, Curly. Say, what's Charlie Howard's number, do you know? I don't know, but I think you can get him at the Hollywood Garage. You know the number? Hollywood 1127. I won't be long, Kenny. Mr. Oldfield? That's me. I'm Beverly Blake. Oh, yes. You drove a great race yesterday. <laughs> Thanks. You've driven a couple of great races yourself, according to my dad. He told me to be sure and look you up and give you his regards. Remember Cannonball Blake? I sure do. Is he your father? Well, unless my mother's been kidding me all these years, he is. Old Cannonball Blake. He, he drove some great races, too. I guess you must be a chip off the old block. How is he and where is he? Oh, he's fine. He's been in the tire business for the last 10 years. He puts out that Trojan tire. Is that so? Yes, that's why I'm racing. The big companies have all the good drivers signed up, so I'm doing what I can to get him some publicity. Well, I guess you're doing a good job of it, if uh, your last race was any example of it. I was just lucky. It takes more than luck to beat boys like Jimmy Finn, young lady. He's good. Yes, he is. Where's he from? Right here. He was born in Pomona. Used to be a grease monkey around my garage. He's got plenty up here. You know, he's got a new carburetor that we're going to make a lot of money out of someday. Oh, that's fine. Well, I guess he's a nice fellow, underneath all his gruffness, sometimes. What do you mean? Well, let him tell you all about it. Well, I must get along. It was so nice to meet you. <laughs> Give my best to old Cannonball, won't you? I certainly will. Oh, uh, by the way, I hear they're taking up a collection for that Texas boy. Yeah. Well, why leave me out? No one told me about it. Well, Jim's taking care of that. You can find him down to his garage on the corner of Ventura and Sunny Slope. Well, fine. I'll stop by. Well, here, take this along and give, give it to Jim from me. A 
I'll be glad. Save me a trip. I'll be glad to, Mr. Olsen. Well, goodbye. So long. Bye. Hi, boys. Hello, Charlie. Uh, here's 1250, Jim, from the boys at the Hollywood Garage. Uh, Thanks. Maybe stand now. 200, 212 mm, 250. Is everybody in? Yeah, just about. Jeez, and we're shy uh, 87.50. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Well, that boosts us to 230. That's the best I can do. Take care of him, will you, Curly? Okay. Well, so long, Jim. So long, Charlie. Tell the boys thanks. Okay. Hello, Miss Comet. I mean, Miss uh, 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 Beverly. Hello. Hiya, Toots. Hello. Uh, fill her up and check the oil and give me some water. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thanks very much, Miss Blake. That's all right. It's a privilege. I know it's a little late, but I'd, uh, I'd like to congratulate you on the race. Thanks. I guess if you hadn't had to make that stop at the pit, it would have been a different story. Oh, uh, I don't know. Well, I guess that's it, Miss Beverly. What do I owe you? 180. Another five. Are you going to the Oakland race? Sure, are you? That's where I'm headed for. Well, I'll be seeing you there, then. Give my dust in your eye. Yeah, the same to you. <laughs> Two, five. So long. So long. So long, Miss Beverly. So long, Annie. See you. Boy, oh boy, what a sweetheart. You know, Curly, I think I could learn to like that gal. And today's race, like many of its predecessors, here is 500 times around the mile track. A distance of 500 miles to the winner, a net purse of $10,000. Plus enough points to head for the big pond, Indianapolis. There are 33 starters here today, some new names and some old favorites. One of the added attractions is the beautiful and daring driver, the blonde Thomas, who last week set a new record in the Ascot race. Now it's about time for the cars to take position. The fastest qualifiers have been assigned positions nearest the pole car, which is the white coupe used by the officials. I take one more lap around the track and the cars will be all set. The pole car will drop out near the fifth and the race will start. The blonde Thomas is just getting set close to the pole, and it's a matter of seconds. Yes, yes, they're off.
bowler like a charm. That Brown Common must think she changed the bowler lightning.
the turn over the fence. The top curve and at a speed of 109 feet in the first half. Stuart make out. He didn't. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Nice going, Groucho. Oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, by the way, I believe this belongs to you. <laughs> <laughs> that makes us even. Yep. Looks like our little private field's going to carry over to Indianapolis. You going to Indianapolis? Why, sure. This race gives me enough points to get in. Oh, by the way, Mr. Oldfield, Dad wired and said he'd meet me there. He said he'd hoped he'd see you. Well, I'll have to look him up this year. Will I be seeing you, too? Yes, yes. Uh, just take a good look at the first car that passes. That'll be me. You hope? <laughs> <laughs> Down tight, down tight, boys. It was loose last time. Jim, I got word from that pal of mine in Washington. He said Indianapolis Race would cinch our new carburetor deal if you finish the money. Well, that's a big order, Bernie, but we'll be in there pitching anyway. Well, I'll see you tonight, Jim. Be sure to have that cup filled up with something besides beer. Okay, Bernie. So long, Jim. So long. Say, you're not uh, serious about entering the Indianapolis race, are you? Not serious? Of course I am. Why? Well, it's a pretty tough race. Too tough for a girl. It isn't like these tracks out here, you know. Besides, you'll be up against some crack drivers. You know, 500 miles is a terrible grind even for a man. Yes, I know all that. But I've got a job to do. Job? Yes. I thought you went in for this racing business just for the fun of it. <laughs> I'm not that crazy. Look, did you ever hear of the Trojan Tire? No, can't say they have. Well, neither of millions of other people. Well, it's my job to see that they do. My dad makes them, I use them, my racing advertises them. Savvy? Yeah? Well, I think your dad ought to have his head examined for letting you do it. You do, eh? Yes, I do. What kind of a guy is he, anyway? Well, for one thing, he was a better race driver than you will ever be. For another, he didn't want me to do it. It was my own idea. And now I'll thank you to mind your own business. Uh, did, did you find an address book? Uh... Hello, Barney, you old lead foot. <laughs> Why, hello, cannonball. <laughs> hello, Beverly. Hello, Barney. When did you get in? Just this morning. Sit down. 
Well, Barney, you haven't changed a bit, even to the famous old cigar. You know, I don't believe I ever saw him without it. <laughs> well, you haven't changed a whole lot yourself, except for that snow up there on your top of your dome. <laughs> well, I got that in the tire business. Well, you know, I was mixed up in the tire business myself for a while. Have something? No, thank you. I'll have a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee and uh, warm that up a bit while you're at it. You know, there's been a lot of changes around here since you and I hit those old bricks. That was a long time ago. 1919. 1916. That was before your time, young lady. Well, slightly. <laughs> that was the year that Sweet Borg and Art Barr got killed. Yeah, Chuck Briggs and Lou Sher rolled over three times without even getting a scratch. <laughs> that was the worst pileup I ever saw. I was clear across the track in sixth place when Sweet Borg, coming out of the far turn, started to skip. Wound up crossways the track. Chuck Briggs and Lou Sher were right behind. Too close to miss him. They all piled up. The track was fairly lit with wrecks. When it was all over, guard of Chuck Briggs and Lou Sherrill didn't pop out of their car like a couple of scared rabbits. Well, it was almost a miracle. Lou Sherrill told me later that in those few seconds, he thought of every mean thing he'd ever done to anybody. Well, that's all ancient history now, Barney. What are you doing now? Well, Jimmy Flynn and I have got a new carburetor we're trying to put over. How's it going? Well, he used it at uh, Ascot in Oakland, and it was okay. So and if he makes good with it tomorrow, everything will be all set. We might even get some government orders. Well, that's swell. And it all depends on Jim tomorrow? Just about. Well, that's a long chance. It, it seems to me that you would have tried to get it in two or three of the other cars, just in case. We did, but nobody would go for it. Is it really good? Well, Jim says that's the only thing that beat you up at Oakland. Well, maybe I should protect myself tomorrow. What do you mean? Well, if I have one in my car, then we'll be even. Besides, you'll have two chances to prove it instead of one, won't you? All right, I think Jim would go for that. Uh, well, if you don't mind, let's leave him out of it. Let's keep this just between us. Oh, well, if you feel that way, I have two of them up in my room at the hotel. Fine, we can put them on this afternoon. It's a great, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did I forget anything? I... How about the adjustment on the carburetor? The adjustment on the carburetor? Yes, I'm sure. I hope I... Oh, Barney, if I forgot. Did, did I lock that pet clock in the... Did you lock that needle now, but... Oh, oh Barney, me... yeah. Barney, you're worrying me to death if that thing comes off. Oh, Barney. Usually quiet race. 250 miles have been completed. Positions are Bob Crandall first, Blonde Comet second, Ted Bell third, Jim Flynn fourth, Atkinson fifth, and the other cars are slowly moving into promise. This has been a slow race up to now, and it's doubtful if the time for the distance will equal that of last year. But it's hard to tell at this time. Nice, nice rumble to her. 
Maybe it's my imagination. It ain't us. That's a bad spill. There goes the first spill of the day. It's car number 13. It really took it that time. That's a tough spot. The upper right end turn. Car number 23 going into the pit. Looks like he blew a tire coming around the straightaway. Never mind the tire. When you told me about the mixture for that gas, did I? Yes, yes, I did, I did. Looks like I made a four par in the race today when I said the time of the race was slow and that unusual quietness prevailed around here today. That was Bob Crandall who crashed, the second crash of the day. After leading 50 laps, Crandall snapped an axle tearing his wheel out of gear. It looks pretty tough. The cars are observing the danger signal and maintaining their position until the track is cleaned of all debris. That puts the blonde comet in the lead. And I noticed the speed has increased in the last 33 laps. It's amazing that the last 240 laps should have increased to a point that if it's maintained, the record can be set here today. There are 10 more laps to go. The positions are Ron Comet first by four laps, Dick Langdon second by three laps, Jim Prim third by two laps, Ham Cooley fourth, and the rest of the field too far out to be accounted for. Darling, what's the trouble? I'm glad it's, it's too much. I can't go on. Never mind, dear, never mind. Get you, Quick, let him finish. My car. Go on, hurry. Take care of it, Jenny. Go <laughs> on, yeah. oh, Jim. Where's Jim? Right there. Hey, Jim, come here. Oh, she wants you to finish the race with her car. Huh? Yeah, come on, come on. Come on, Jim. Come on, Jim, let's get going. <laughs> Tell him and Gargle, Jim. Come on, get in. All right. Cover off. That's it. There's the blonde Comet's car coming out again. But she's out of the wheel. It looks like... Just a minute, I'll check up. It's Jim Flynn substituting for the blonde Comet. It's an unusual procedure to substitute a driver from an opposing car. I'll get the official track rolling before the race is over. Flynn is hitting up a good speed, trying to overtake Langdon, who's a half a lap ahead. The blonde Comet lost four and a half laps, and there's still four to go, and it's anybody's race.
upon us, Night Owls. Our journey through the dark concludes. Thank you for embracing the night with us. If you reveled in the adventure, then subscribe and support us to ensure the magic of the night never fades. Join us, and let's keep the nocturnal madness thriving together. Welcome to the Cult Mania Show, where every shadow tells a story, and every night is a new adventure. Farewell until the night beckons once more.